Good morning, folks. Welcome to Baltimore, where it's warm and cozy. <laughs> and uh, as you might have guessed, I'm uh, Bank Mutian. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> and uh, ladies and gentlemen, as seen on M Plus Support and M Plus Discussion, Linda Mutian. <laughs> right. But rarely seen in public. <laughs> rarely seen in public, that's right. Right. So do you want to OK. Talk? Well, basically, let me talk a little bit about how we're going to run the day. I think everybody knows you're not allowed to have any food or drink or anything in this hall, or we'll be banished forever. So <laughs> please comply. And um, so we run our day starting at 8.30 to 5 today. Tomorrow it'll be 8.30 to 4, because our plane time changed, and we have to get to the airport. So today we'll have. Uh, a break at 10 and at 3, and then lunch from 12 to 1.30. Tomorrow we'll have a break at 10, and we'll take a shorter lunch, 12 to 1, and then have a break at 2.30. Each segment is about one and a half hours. We have four segments per day. We ask that you hold your questions during these segments. If you have a question, just jot it down on a piece of paper. If it hasn't been answered, by the end, then we take questions and answers at the end of each of the four segments. And you can also ask us questions during the breaks or before lunch or when we come back from lunch the only, and afterwards, although we do have to leave the room promptly at 5 because of cleaning issues, but we can take questions outside. Tomorrow, though, at the end of the day, we won't be able to take questions because we'll be trying to get to the airport. So Except that's basically how it runs. Uh, there's restrooms out here and upstairs beyond the cafeteria. And can you think of anything else? And also restrooms around the corner there and around the corner here. Oh, I didn't know that. So lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So let's see. Um, uh, I hope you have had a good night's sleep, because we're going to go uh, at high speed. Uh, not too high speed, but we're going to cover a lot of interesting topics. And I know you travel from far away. I, let's see, uh, is there anybody who uh, beats the record of uh, Magnus Hockeberg, who's coming from Gothenburg, Sweden? Anybody from further away than that? Oh, that should do it. <laughs> that should do it. That's a fine jet lag. <laughs> so let's see, how many of you actually are using M Plus at this point? Oh, lots of people. OK, so we can leave then. All right. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you get started. All right. So we'll, uh, it's, it's good to have you here because this, as we said uh, on the website and on the uh, email we sent, this uh, constitutes the beginning of yet another eight topic sequence. So we teach uh, twice a year and the eight topic sequence takes four occasions. And uh, you're wise to come for the first occasion because a lot of what we say today will be referred to uh, in subsequent days, subsequent topics. So, uh, you know, it's no fun to come to topic eight and hear, well, you should have been here for topic one through seven, and we covered all of that. So here you have a chance to really hear it from the beginning. And uh, although we've gone through this before here, and although it exists on video here, free videos that you can watch on the web, we do change it up a little bit every time, trying to modernize it. And certainly that's true this time around. We have some new features, particularly talking about the, uh, the exploratory structural equation modeling topic, which we'll cover tomorrow afternoon. But it really gives a good background uh, for the subsequent days. Um, particularly tomorrow is going to be uh, quite necessary, or very useful at least, for um, uh, topics that will come much later in terms of latent class analysis. So I'll try to, um, we have a lot of material to cover, a lot of material to cover, and we'll try to um, choose judiciously among these uh, slides. We're not going to cover all of them, but we want you to have all of them available to you as reference material. So we're going to hop, skip, and jump a little bit through here. And um, we, obviously, this topic today, for instance, we deal with continuous observed variables and uh, continuous outcomes, as we say. And that's a topic, if you talk about EFA, CFA, and structural equation modeling, that's something that can take a whole quarter or semester course at a university. So clearly, this, what we're, we can give here is an overview, an overview, a roadmap for you to know 
where you can learn about these topics more in detail somewhere else. And an overview which tells you how we look at things from the perspective of the uh, general latent variable modeling framework of M+. So with that in mind, um, you should not think that um, you master everything ha after having gone through these two days, but you will have seen some interesting uh, ideas uh, and getting some uh, ideas about how M plus can be used to tackle those. Let me actually start. We have a long day and an interesting day today, and lots of interesting topics. But let me start here with uh, why we're doing this in the first place how we got into this, just very briefly. Uh, this started with a, an SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research contract from NIAAA, the Alcohol Institute within NIH, National Institute of Health, uh, so that Linda could uh, start offices and uh, hire three programmers. And um, the idea behind an SBIR mechanism, as some of you may know, is to uh, uh, marry uh, academe academic uh, efforts with business efforts. So I'm academics and Linda is business. And uh, it came together quite nicely here with M+. There was an opportunity for um, integrating <laughs> methods that we felt were um, inefficiently disseminated. Many good methods from biostatistics and psychometrics that sit in journals that you may never read, like this journal I'll tell you about a little bit later on, structural equation modeling. And uh, Fragmented presentation of methods, technical descriptions in many different journals, many different pieces of limited software that statisticians write, say, in R for their own uh, example, but not very user-friendly and certainly not very general for general uses. And we'll take a look at the framework in a second. With a very easy to use uh, language, nerd-free language, that is, I was not involved at all, Linda created the language. Very powerful, so you find in M plus many quite unique analysis possibilities. And it started in November 1998, uh, well actually it started before that, but the first release was in November 1998. And November 2008, the current version 5.2 came out, which actually uh, was updated in May this year. So you should use 5.21 if you want to use the latest M plus. And uh, we really encourage you to, uh, to get the latest M plus to avoid um, slow or, or to avoid various kinds of little glitches. Keep with the latest development. And version 6 is in the works. That doesn't mean you have to wait and purchase M plus until version 6 comes out because there are these nice um, arrangements where you can just download a new version if you have a current uh, contract license. Oh, well, then I will tell you that more exactly later on. Anyway, the M plus team is quite small and therefore it moves forward very quickly. Very uh, flexible team is us and then our programmers, Tui Nguyen and Tihomer Asparohov, our statistical programmer. And then uh, on the business side, Michelle Kahn and Jean. So here is how we look at the uh, framework of M plus. We, um, try to cover a lot of different topics uh, under one umbrella, and that's possible because of the uh, idea of using latent variables. So on the left screen, you have many statistical concepts that are captured by latent variables, and on the right, many different models that use latent variables. And we are going to focus on today measurement error matters fa and factors, the top two uh, left bullets here, corresponding to factor analysis and structural equation models. But we should be aware of how that then ties in with a bigger picture uh, of um, what statisticians, for instance, call random effects. Random effects is another type of uh, latent variable. It's, a, it's just like factors, it's a continuous latent variable, which we'll, we'll see will be useful in growth curve models, for instance. And that we will talk about in March next year. And the idea of latent variables carries into uh, survival analysis, where we talk about frailties, and genetic analysis, where we talk about liabilities, and multi-level analysis, where we have different components of variation, corresponding to multi-level modeling topic that we'll talk about when we get to topics seven and eight at the end of the series. And then if you have missing data on a continuous observed variable, well then that variable becomes a continuous latent variable, at least latent for some people, for those that have missingness. 
Later on, tomorrow, then we're going to talk about categorical variables. We're going to talk about categorical observed variables, uh, which will then prepare us for later topics where we talk about categorical latent variables, latent classes, and finite mixtures, as it's called in, in that area. We're going to talk about latent class models and mixture models of both uh, factor analytic kinds and of uh, growth, ki growth mixture modeling kinds. So it's a very rich set of topics that we're going to uh, travel through. And I want, we, we're going to strive for having this uh, general picture in our mind all the time as we go forward and see any specific model as a special case of that general picture. And here's a general picture. It is um, the style of uh, model description that we follow throughout the uh, presentation and also in the user's guide. Uh, observed variables are in uh, squares or rectangles, uh, background variables or covariates x, and dependent variables uh, y, or when they are not continuous, we call them u. And you have that written down at the bottom here, slide seven. And then in circles, the latent variables, continuous latent variables represented by F as in factors, categorical latent variables represented by C as in categorical variables, and then all kinds of relationships, measurement relationships between the factors and the observed variables, and structural relationships between the latent variables. And that's a very rich framework then, and uh, it actually, it's a framework that brings together uh, many different developments in psychometrics particularly, which used to uh, work in two separate worlds. There used to be the world of those who did modeling within ellipse A and those who did modeling within ellipse B. So ellipse A has the uh, continuous observed variables and continuous latent variables. So factor analysis, structural equation modeling, and even growth modeling takes place within ellipse A. Whereas in ellipse B, you have typically categorical outcomes, categorical latent variables, and you talk about latent class models. So for instance, factor analysts and latent class analysts pretty much never spoke to each other um, until uh, in more recent years. And we certainly have tried to um, integrate these two worlds because I think together they provide a very powerful uh, uh, set of uh, modeling options. So it's the integration of these different developments that we think is so important. Now, this is also then generalized to uh, multi-level analysis. You have, uh, say, within school variation and between school variation. Uh, you have then student variation on the within, and you have variation in these variables also on the school level. So this is a two-level model here. So all of these relationships that we show up here uh, can exist on two different levels. Uh, and then that means then that you can have random intercepts and random slopes in these models. And it's not just random slopes for observed covariates as you see in standard multi-level regression programs, but you also have uh, random slopes for uh, any variable, uh, like a latent variable. So it's quite general framework once again. Now, uh, we're quite excited about that. This is how excited we are. And um, uh, it, we look forward to you exploring more possibilities within that framework because it's very true that uh, applications so far, although they have started to become more and more advanced using more and more pieces of M+, they're still only scratching the uh, surface of what can be uh, achieved in the program. So the program is really uh, a whole set of different programs. So when people talk about M+, as a... Uh, structural equation modeling program, we get a little bit offended because that's such a small part of it. So we think of M plus as really several programs in one. It's a very good EFA, exploratory fact analysis program. I think it's unique now in its capabilities and uh, we'll talk more about that. Structural equation modeling is uniquely strong in that area. And it also does item response theory analysis, IRT modeling latent class analysis, latent transition analysis, survival analysis, both, both discrete time survival and continuous time survival, and growth modeling, multi-level analysis of different kinds. Complex survey data analysis, it does quite well as well. 
uh, rivaling uh, programs like Sudan, but then allowing latent variables. Monte Carlo simulations for method studies can be done quite uh, well in M plus as well. And all of this is fully integrated in the general latent variable framework. So for instance, if you're interested in uh, Cox survival regression, survival analysis, continuous time survival analysis, you can do that in combination with latent variables, be they continuous or categorical latent variables. And if you want to do item response theory analysis, you can do that in conjunction with latent class analysis. You can have item response mixture analysis, which is getting quite popular among educational um, item analysts, et cetera. So it isn't just one piece uh, on top of another. They're all fully integrated. And that's the, uh, the difficulty in having developed M plus. That is the biggest difficulty that we uh, uh, conquered. So um, here's the overview then of the courses uh, as they go forward from now on. We are here today, August 20th, and um, you know what's going to happen. And tomorrow we continue with talking about pretty much the same things, but with the categorical and other non-normal types of outcomes, dependent variables. And then we come back, hopefully, in March and talk about topic three and topic four, which has to do with growth modeling. So longitudinal data analysis, uh, introductory and intermediate, and then more advanced growth modeling, including survival analysis and missing data analysis. Missing data analysis, um, a growing topic, which has a lot of interesting angles to it, particularly when you combine it with, with uh, latent variables. And when you try to go beyond the standard MAR, assumption and to non-ignorable missing data models, which you can do quite easily in M plus. And then topic five, a year from now coming back, is what we plan to do, categorical latent variables. So talking about mixture modeling, first with cross-sectional data and then with longitudinal data the next day. And then finishing up with topic seven, multi-level modeling of cross-sectional data and uh, multi-level modeling of longitudinal data, where in these topics, those two days, we bring together everything that we learned earlier, including the mixture stuff in topic five and six, and <coughs> certainly the growth part here, and certainly what we learned in topics one and two, <coughs> such as multiple group analysis up here, and uh, uh, models that have uh, count and categorical outcomes that we learned here. And actually, we just uh, taught in Berlin uh, these four topics, we had two topics, uh, and then uh, sightseeing right here, and then two more topics. <laughs> and these two topics uh, are the, actually the uh, only ones that haven't been videoed so far. Well, they have been videoed now in Berlin, and they will soon be up on, uh, the, uh, uh, on our website. Uh, let's see, these two topics uh, were, were recorded here in March. And they will be up on our website within, uh, I think, within one week, if, it, if they're not up already. We'll, we'll link to where they are located this weekend. So eventually, you will have all of these topics on video that you can watch at home with your handouts and, um, and listening to that. And some people say that that's been useful. I haven't watched it myself, <laughs> but I uh, can't do that. And I think with that, I'm going to stop talking for a while and hand over to Linda. OK. So um, oh, thanks. So we're going to uh, have, we have several slides at the beginning of the, let me stand over here so I don't have the lights in my eye. Anyway, we have several slides on regression analysis that, to start out the day. And we're not going to go over all of those. Basically, what M plus, the M plus modeling framework is a set of simultaneous regression equations, as you saw with what Bank just showed. And they're estimated simultaneously. And today, everything we talk about is based on linear regression. Now, tomorrow, we're going to bring in probit log regression, logistic regression, and other multinomial logistic, et cetera. But today, everything we're talking about is based on linear regression. And we assume that all of you have had a course in linear regression and are familiar with it. So we're just going to look at a couple of slides. And then um, let me get the slides up. And if things aren't familiar, 
to you on these two slides. And we have references at the end of the regression analysis section that you can look at. OK, so basically, everything on the right screen here should be fairly familiar to you. So we have the, regress the linear regression equation, y sub i equals alpha plus beta 1 x 1 sub i plus beta 2 x 2 sub i plus epsilon sub i. So the important facts are that the relationship between y and the x's is linear. So it's linear regression. The um, epsilon is not related to the x's. So the correlation between epsilon and any of the covariates or predictors is 0. The mean of the residuals is zero. The mean of epsilon is zero. And the variance of epsilon is constant for every value of x. So if you look at the, error, the errors at each value of x, they will have the same variance. And that is referred to as homoscedasticity, as you're probably all familiar with from uh, linear regression classes you've taken. Now here we're looking at something that's gonna, that we're going to see often. So we want to look at the conditional expectation function for y given x1 equals 0 and y given x1 equals 1. So that's the two conditional expectation functions that we have listed here. So when x1 is equal to 0, it's equal to alpha plus beta 2x2. And when x1 is equal to 1, the function is equal to alpha plus beta 1 times 1, so just beta 1 plus beta 2 x2. So in, when x is equal to 0, beta 1 falls out of the equation. And when x is equal to 1, it's equal to beta 1. And alpha plus beta 1 is actually the intercept for that equation. So if you look at the bottom screen, you can see that we have y on the y-axis here, so, and x2 is on the x-axis. And the top line represents x1 equals 1. Let's say this would be females, possibly. The other line, x1 equals 0, maybe males. You can see down here that for x1 equals 0, the intercept is alpha. So you can see that. And for x1 equals 1, the intercept is alpha plus beta 1. So the point here being that with a dummy x variable or covariate or predictor, however you want to refer to it, when there is a change from 0 to 1, it's just a, it just is a shift in the intercept. So with a dummy covariate, and let's remind ourselves of one more thing about regression analysis, that there are two kinds of covariates. They can either be a binary variable, 0, 1, or a continuous variable. And in both cases, their scale does not matter in the estimation of the model. They're treated as though they're continuous variables. So with the binary, it's just simply a shift from 0 to 1. So it's an intercept shift. And then we know that for the continuous, for a one unit change in the regression coefficient is the change in y for a one unit change in x. Now this picture, for those of you who studied regression, should remind you of analysis of covariance, where we have a post-test as our y variable, a pre-test as our continuous x variable, and our binary x variable is treatment or control. So this is similar to analysis of covariance. Now, that's all we're going to say about linear regression, uh, in, except in the next topic, which we're going to, which is path analysis. And we'll be talking about there more than one linear regression estimated at, at a time. So we can shift to slide um, 27. Well, actually, 28. Let me do 28 over here. OK, so now we'll talk about linear regression in the uh, context of path analysis. 
And path analysis usually refers to a set of regression equations using observed variables. So in path analysis, usually all the variables are observed in contrast to an SEM model where there are some latent variables that we're interested in looking at the relationships among. So we want, so path analysis studies the relationship among a set of observed variables. And it allows us to estimate and test direct and indirect effects in a system of equations. So we, and we'll take a look at a model and, and talk a little bit more about what that means. And we can estimate and test theories about the absence of relationships. So if you have a set of regression equations and all paths are included, you have what's called a saturated model, well then you, you can't really test anything. But you can leave certain paths out based on theory and see if you can still fit the, that model to the data and it fits, fits well. So that's what we use path analysis for. And the example we're going to look at takes data from the Maternal Health Project. And these samples were mothers who drank at least three drinks a week during their first trimester, plus a random sample of mothers who used alcohol less often. We're going to look at mothers' alcohol and cigarette use in the third trimester and the child's gender, ethnicity, and head circumference at birth in 36 months. So here's the path model. Now in a path model, rectangles or squares represent observed variables. Now in this, in this model, <clears throat> we have four predictors or covariates mom's alcohol use in the third trimester, mom's cigarette use in the third trimester, gender of the baby and ethnicity, the baby's head circumference at birth, and the head circumference at 36 months or three years of age. And um, let's just say a few words about this. So we said we can, we can test different theories in a path model. And there's two theories we could consider regarding mother's cigarette and alcohol use. We could consider a theory, which we're going to call theory one, where the mother's alcohol and cigarette use only affects the child's head circumference at birth. Once the child is born, that effect is not there. So that's what we see in this model. So you can see we have mother's alcohol and cigarette use is pointing directly to head circumference at birth. And then head circumference at birth is a predictor of head circumference at 36 months. We are not putting in paths saying that mother's alcohol and cigarette use has a direct effect. So it points directly to head circumference. So those two paths are less left out. And so we're testing the theory that the alcohol and cigarette use only affects head circumference at birth. We could also have the theory that it also has a direct effect at 36 months. But that's not the theory we're testing. We've left out two paths to reflect that we're uh, testing the first theory. Now, just to point something else out, here we show that the covariates are correlated. Now, in regression analysis, means, variances, and covariances of covariates are not parameters in the model. So we show that because the model is estimated conditioned on the covariates, but they're allowed to have correlations. They aren't set to zero. We don't estimate them, but we don't set them to zero. They are whatever their sample statistics are. And I see this a lot in M plus model commands that people bring, they mention covariances among the covariates and means of the covariates or variances of the covariates. And when you do that, they're treated as a dependent variable. And the model isn't estimated conditioned on them. And distributional assumptions are made about them. So when you do that, you're really not specifying a regression you're specifying something else. You're treating the covariates differently than they're treated in regression. So although we show that they correlate, these, value, these parameters are not parameters in the model. 
Now, um, we have an arrow with mom alcohol use point at third trimester pointing to head circumference at birth. This arrow represents the regression of head circumference at birth on the covariate. So regressed, the dependent variable is regressed on the independent variable. So head circumference at birth is regressed on all four covariates. We have four arrows here. And head circumference at 36 months is regressed on only two covariates, gender and ethnicity. And gender and ethnicity really aren't what we're interested in. They're just control variables. We know, for example, that male babies have larger head circumference at birth than female babies. So we want to control for that. We don't want to get that confused with the real effect we're interested in, which is the relationship between head circumference and alcohol and cigarette use. OK. So let's take a look at the M plus input. Actually, I'm going to have a drink of water first. <laughs> OK, so now this is the first time we're looking at an M plus input. So I'll go over the basic idea behind the language. We don't usually go over this in a lot of detail since it's pretty straightforward and there are more important things to talk about. But the basic idea in the M plus language is there are several commands followed by a colon, like title, data, variable. And we'll see more on the next page. And all these commands have a variety of options. So, and the options have certain defaults. In the data command, the title just gives the title. The data command tells where the file is located and the name of the file. So file is, and then we give the name. Then you can give a format statement if the data is in fixed format. If you don't give a format statement, we assume it's in free format. The variable command is an important command. It gives the names of the variables and therefore their position in the data set. We have a missing option where we can specify which values represent missing value flags in the data. And then we have two useful options, a use variables option where you can take a subset of the variables from the full data set and use them in the analysis, and use observations where you can use a conditional statement to select a subset of the observations in the data set in order to um, use only those for the analysis. And then we have a define command. And define is used to transform variables or to create new variables. In this situation, we're dividing variables by 10 to get them on a better scale. And here, for mom alk 3, we're taking the log of mom alk 3 plus 1 to make the relationship between it and head circumference more linear. So that's the define command. The most important command is the model command. And it has several options that we'll be seeing as the day goes by, but we'll just talk about on for now. On is short for regressed on. So we just translate the picture on the right. So head circumference 36 is regressed on gender and ethnicity and head circumference at birth. So we just say H36 on H0 gender eth. And that's, that defines those three relationships. Then head circumference at birth is regressed on all four of the covariates. Mother's alcohol use in the third trimester, mother's cigarette use in the third trimester, gender and ethnicity. We have an output command where you can request extra output other than what's given by the default. And here we're asking for sample statistics, SAMP stat, and, and standardized results. Other, you know, in addition to the raw results that we give. OK, so then the output. First, we, re, we give the um, test of model fit. And first, the chi-square. You can see that we don't reject the first theory. Because the p-value is large, we cannot reject the theory that says head circumference is affected only at birth by mother's alcohol and cigarette use. That effect 
uh, there are no direct effects between the mother's alcohol and cigarette use in the third trimester and head circumference at three years. So there is only an indirect effect. So an indirect effect says that the effect goes through another variable. So we can see that it can go through head circumference at birth, but it doesn't go directly. So here, we cannot reject that theory. We cannot reject the model on the right screen. And we see that also in the value of the RMSCA. So we have several fit statistics, and we'll be talking about them in more detail when we talk about factor analysis. And here are the results. The way the result, this is actually from an old output. Currently, the standardized estimates are not given. It's only the first three columns are given, and the standardized are given in their own section with standard errors. But in the model results, we have three columns. We have the raw parameter estimate, the standard error of that estimate, and then the ratio of the estimate to the standard error, which is the z-value. So this is how we look, test for significance. And if we look at the bottom here, the second equation, head circumference zero at birth on the four covariates, we can see that gender and ethnicity are control variables, so they're significant, but that's not what we're really interested in. What we're interested in is the fact that mother's alcohol and cigarette use in the third trimester, by looking in column three, has a significant effect on the head circumference. And the effect is negative. <coughs> So as their mother's alcohol and cigarette use increase, the head circumference at birth decreases. So there is an effect, a negative effect. And then we see there is a relationship, as expected, between head circumference at three years and head circumference at birth. And that's significant also. And um, to remember that all of these are conditional. They're all controlled for each other, so each regression coefficient is controlled for the other ones that are being looked at, just like in regular regression. So these are just simply two linear regression equations. And everything uh, that applies to linear regression as you've studied it applies to linear regression as estimated in M plus. Okay. So let me go to 36 over here. So as, as I mentioned earlier, we, with path analysis, we can um, study indirect effects. So for example, the effect of mother's alcohol and um, drug use in the third trimester on head circumference at three years as it is mediated by head circumference at birth. So that's an indirect effect. And we can study that. And M plus has a special command to study that called model indirect. And we can use that to request indirect effects. And we also give the standard errors for the indirect effects. They're computed using the delta method. The bootstrap option can also be used to get bootstrap standard errors for indirect effects. <coughs> and the standardized option can be used to obtain standardized indirect effects. So we have quite a lot of options available. In addition, the C interval option. That can give confidence intervals for the indirect effects and also for the standardized indirect effects. And we have three types of 95 and 99% confidence intervals, the normal symmetric kind, bootstrapped, or bias corrected bootstrap. So we, you know, there's quite a few options for looking at indirect effects in M plus. So let's just take a quick look at the model indirect command. So, there are, so here's a path diagram. You can see we have x1 and x2, y1, y2, and y3. So y3 is regressed on y1 and y2. 
y2 on y1, and then you can see the rest of the regression equations here. So this is a path model, and there are many indirect effects. For example, x1 to y3 via y1, that's one indirect effect, or x1 to y2 via y1, x2 to y3 via y2. So you can estimate those effects using model indirect. There are two options. The end option, which is used to request a specific indirect effect. So the end option requests one indirect effect. The via option is used to regress a set of indirect effects that includes specific mediators. So let's first look at the end option. So y3 end y1 x1 is y3 end y1 x1. So it's the path I'm highlighting at the top there. If we go down to a via effect, y3 via y2 and x1, so y3 via y2 to x1, you can go that way or you can go that way. So there's two ways of doing that. So the via option tells M plus, I want to know every indirect way to get between x1 and y3. And you can have more than one variable in the middle, too. So that's basically the model indirect command and how that works. All of our indirect effect work and, um, and our uh, confidence intervals are based on uh, these articles by McKinnon and Lockwood and Hoffman and Williams. And then there's another paper you might be interested in, Shrout and Bolger, Mediation in Experimental and Non-Experimental Studies. So. And then I think it's your turn, Banked. So for those of you who came in a little bit later, um, we are, uh, we're doing most of the talk, I have noticed, right now. But uh, you'll get your say. And we usually have quite lively question and answer sessions. So if you have questions, just scribble down the slide that you um, had a thought about, and we'll bring it up in, uh, just before the breaks. <clears throat> so now we have talked about error-free variables and uh, regression and path analysis typically work with uh, variables that are assumed to have reliability uh, one, that is perfectly reliable variables. But now we're going to talk about measurement errors and gradually move towards and motivate the need for factor analysis. We're going to talk about measurement errors and then talk about multiple indicators of latent variables. And measurement errors are, are quite important to uh, take seriously. Uh, they can cause uh, attenuation in correlations. So you observe lower correlations than you uh, would if the uh, variables had not been measured with error. And measurement error in independent variables in covariates is particularly serious because that tends to most often give an attenuation in regression slopes. <coughs> so it sort of uh, underestimates the strength of relationship between your, your variables, your predictors and the dependent variable. Uh, if you have measurement error in the dependent variable, you uh, increase the standard error of uh, your parameter estimates, uh, which then widens the uh, confidence intervals, which makes your statements more uncertain. So that's not good either. But measurement error in independent variables seems to be uh, worse than in dependent variables. Now, if you have a single indicator of a latent variable, it's very hard to uh, tease out the measurement error and uh, counteract its negative effects. Uh, but there is a special case where you can uh, take the measurement error into account. That is when the, you have a known amount of measurement error. And we'll show how to specify that in, in M+. Typically, though, you would want to have multiple indicators, multiple measures of a latent variable, where measurement error can actually be um, uh, accounted for in the model and can be estimated. And therefore, you will not suffer the uh, attenuation that we're talking about in the second bullet. 
and that most of the day we're going to talk about the multiple indicator case. So we're going to take a look at formulas again a little bit. We are, the formulas that we show are going to be very uh, uh, simplistic, very uh, basic, and whenever we spend time on formulas, we only do that uh, on, for the important formulas. We're in, this is not a technical uh, training session, but it behooves you to uh, be able to read some of these formulas. So Linda talked about regressing uh, uh, with a dependent continuous variable y with an intercept, that's say alpha and slope beta and a residual epsilon, and this is for individual i. Now what we really are interested in often is regressing on a true variable. We had x here before, but now we're going to use the, the letter eta, E-T-A, the Greek letter eta, which we will see as the notation for factors uh, borrowing on the, uh, the uh, Carl Jorskog Lisserl notation. So we, we really are interested in, um, if we could measure x without error, we would call it eta, and we're interested in beta, that beta that is uh, relevant for the true uh, variable here, the variable measured without error. x measures eta only with an error. So x is equal to eta plus a, an error, a delta. This is what it is, delta. So it's a residual uh, that represents measurement error. And we're going to talk about reliability of x as it measures eta. And we're going to express that as a variance ratio. And that's the variance uh, due to the true variable divided by the total variance. So that in the denominator here, we add the measurement error. And you recognize this then um, from the linear regression context as the, the r square the R square for X in its relationship to eta. So reliability and R square are sometimes one and the same. So if you look back on Linda's linear regression formulas, you see a formula for R square, which looks very much like this variance ratio, has the same foundation for it. Now, if you regress on X, the variable with measurement error that contains delta on top of eta, that's a different regression than what we have at the top. The right-hand side now has x instead of eta. See how easily you can follow this? Simple. It's not going to get harder than this. But now we have to change the names of the parameter, in particular the slope. Now is called beta star, no longer beta, because we cannot hope that we'll get to beta by regressing on x, because beta hang together, hangs together with eta. Beta is what we want. Beta star is what we get. So beta star, by usual formulas for regression, is the covariance between y and x divided by the variance of x. This, this you see in the ordinary linear regression books quite early on. The covariance between y and x is actually the same as covariance between y and eta. But the variance of x, of course, is the total variance, eta plus the, the residual variance that we had up here. And if you look at that long and hard enough, it will confess to you that that ratio is less than beta. All right, it's less than beta, and therefore you get an attenuated slope. So take a look at that tonight before you go to bed and work that up and see exactly how that comes about. And then as an example, you have beta 0.8 over on the right screen, slide 43. And you have the uh, variance then, uh, we say, say that we have the uh, standardized variance for eta of 1. And the residual variance 0.43. Uh, then reliability is 0.7. So, okay, so we have here a measure x, which has reliability 0.7, a fairly healthy reliability. And not incredibly good, but pretty healthy. True beta is 0.8. But estimated beta, when we use x instead of the true eta, is only 0.56. So we go down from 0.8 to 0.56. So the true regression line looks like that, but the estimated regression line looks like that. So you get an attenuation, and when you have a, that, that smaller point estimate, as we will call it, that smaller point estimate, um, it may be, may happen that it does not significant. You may not have large enough sample to prove that it's significant. Now, measurement error in a single indicator, 
that's when we needed to know the measurement error, right? And um, for instance, you have a, um, a measurement instrument that you've studied for years and you know uh, by various kinds of uh, test, retest procedures and uh, whatnot that the reliability has a certain value. And here comes a, uh, an X that is, say, the sum of the items in that measurement instrument. You know the reliability of it and you just want to apply that knowledge to uh, a new sample of individuals. So you have this equation here. Uh, now we look at it a little bit more carefully and it suddenly it gets to have uh, a nu here and a lambda there. So we're talking Greek all day long here. Nu is n u. And if you look at it, you see that that's the intercept. And lambda, lambda, and the L here, Greek L, is the slope for eta. Whatever multiplies eta is a slope, and whatever does not multiply eta is an intercept. And then we have the residual epsilon, which varies across the individual. Nu and lambda do not vary across individuals, so we recognize them as constants, as parameters to be estimated, right? Okay, we're getting used to this. So for, for simplicity here, with only one indicator, we can set lambda to one, and the variance of y, can, we can call that psi plus theta, introducing the notation that we'll stick to for eight topics, folks. So psi is the factor variance. Psi is the variance of eta, factor variance. Theta uh, is the variance for the residual. The uh, measurement error variance is theta. V here stands for variance. And reliability then by the previous formula is the uh, factor variance <coughs> divided by the total variance, right? The same reliability equation that we talked about one or two slides earlier. Now, um, typically then in uh, at least maximum likelihood estimation, maximum likelihood estimation that we're going to talk about today, V of Y is estimated as a sample variance, <coughs> which means that the reliability times sample variance is psi. Now, this is the reliability up here. If you multiply that by variance of Y, you get psi. Reliability times sample variance is psi. And so if you know the reliability and you know the sample variance, you know psi. And theta would then be 1 minus the reliability, so that's the unreliability, so to speak, times the sample variance. You get that from up here, if you look at these formulas. So bottom line, if you don't want to uh, work through the algebra there, you say in M plus that F is measured by, and here's the second keyword that Linda talked about. First one was on, now it's by. F is measured by. F here now is our uh, generic notation for a factor. F is then therefore eta. So when we talk formulas, we're going to talk eta in the uh, standard SEM tradition. Factor is eta. But when we talk M plus, we put aside the Greek letters and use uh, regular Roman letters. So F is the same as eta up here. And we're going to say that F is measured by Y at one with loading fixed at one. That's so at one down here, where I'm pointing, corresponds to the lambda equals one up here. Lambda is fixed at one. We don't need that parameter. And we also fix y at a. And y at a says y, first of all, is in this case the residual variance of y. So y here is epsilon. So when we refer to y by itself like that, we're talking about um, we're talking about the um, you know what this should say x up here that could be quite confusing, shouldn't it? Yeah. So x here. Why don't you replace x up here with y, and everything will come together much nicer. <laughs> x was on the previous page, but now it's actually an m plus is y here. Okay. So f is measured by y. Uh, at one, that says that eta is measured by this dependent variable uh, with lambda at one, and residual variance at a. So f y at a says that the variance of epsilon, which is theta, is equal to a. So a is equal to theta. So by that, you will only estimate, you may make a note here, you only estimate um, one parameter here, namely uh, 
f, the variance of f, and you will get the reliability that you desired. That's an old SEM trick to um, get the fixed reliability. And if you do that, you will see that you're, whenever you do then the regression of your dependent variable onto this variable, this covariate, you will find that um, you get a, a bigger regression slope than you would have otherwise. And I think we have an example of that. Uh, do you have an example of that in the users guide? Well, Linda disappeared, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, now, slide 45 then is where we want to be heading. <clears throat> Typically, we have access to more than one indicator. So think that you have, uh, think of a measurement instrument where you have, say, um, 15 different items. And here are two of the items. X1 and X2, and they measure a, uh, the same factor, eta. And now we have two equations, and therefore we are able to uh, uh, tease out uh, an intercept and a slope that's different for the two uh, items. So you have on the x-axis here, eta, and on the y-axis you have x. So uh, the indicator x is related to eta by these conditional expectation lines, these linear regression lines uh, with the intercepts nu and slope lambda. And that's saying that you have two, say, two questions that, or, or two types of ratings, say, by a teacher of a, of a student in a classroom, uh, say, uh, regarding the student's aggressive disruptive behavior, an example that we'll look at many times. Uh, it may be that for as the uh, aggressiveness the true uh, aggressiveness level increases of the child, uh, the score on a item one tends to increase faster than the score on item two. So as the true aggressiveness level increases, the score increases at different rates. Uh, just because this, this item is more sensitive to changes in aggressive behavior than the other one. So that's captured by the loading, the slope here being different for item one than for item two. And the intercepts are different, too. Now, the intercepts are typically uh, of less interest, uh, at first glance at least, than the slopes. But we'll see that the intercepts are, are quite important as well as we go forward, talking about multiple group analysis in particular. Now, here's a tricky uh, slide, but a good, good one for... Um, Appreciating the uh, strengths and the weaknesses of uh, latent variable modeling, you can look at either screen. It doesn't matter that much. So you have a uh, dependent variable y, and you want to regress it on a, a true variable eta. So eta is in a circle, and what you're really interested in is beta. What's the sign of beta, the slope in the regression, and what's the uh, significance of it? This is a linear regression here. Y is continuous, eta, the factor is continuous. Linear regression with the residual, uh, and we're not going to be afraid of that residual actually being called Z, the Greek, Greek Z or Z. Uh, in parentheses, you have the uh, corresponding variance parameter notation, psi 22. So we're interested in this, and the um, example could be um, alcohol consumption during pregnancy, influencing uh, uh, so this could be uh, the true alcohol consumption during pregnancy influencing head circumference at birth. And the mothers may not have reported that true con alcohol consumption correctly, so we have measurement error in it. Or it could uh, be a situation where you have dietary fat intake. So this is the true dietary fat intake and why it could be some uh, health outcome down the road. Or blood pressure. Eta could be uh, the true blood pressure, uh, which we measure with error, influencing some later he health outcome. And even in terms of blood pressure, we know that uh, it's not measured very reliably. Uh, there's day-to-day -day fluctuation, and um, uh, there's also fluctuation during the day, and fluctuation between taking it at home and taking it in the presence of a doctor with a white coat and all of that. So. Um, when you have that situation, it could be useful to have more than one indicator. So here we have two indicators, x1 and x2. And uh, x1 and x2 are 
influenced by eta. So once again, we say that, um, say for instance, your true dietary fat intake will uh, influence how you respond to a uh, questionnaire question regarding your dietary intake. Uh, it may also influence a second uh, indicator, perhaps um, uh, a dietary diary, a diary that you keep uh, on what you eat. So you have two different indicators, and your responses on them, the observed responses, are influenced by your true uh, dietary fat intake. So beta gives the correct picture, as it says, free of measurement error, and uh, uh, free also of the influence of collinearity. Uh, what by that, in parenthetical statement, I mean that you could regress y on to the x1 and x2 variables themselves directly. So you have two predictors. <coughs> and uh, very often those uh, predictors can be so highly correlated that you get into the problem of multicollinearity of regression. And actually latent variable modeling is a way out of that because even though these are highly correlated, that does not hurt the regression of y on eta, which is the true regression that you want to get to. Now, that looks very promising, right? Uh, you can get to the true beta. It's actually a, a model that you can estimate. In uh, statistical terms, we're going to talk about this model as being identifiable. You can identify the parameters of this model from the data. And when the parameter is identified, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon a little bit more, when a parameter is identified, it can be estimated and it can be uh, meaningfully interpreted. Now let's complicate this a little bit <clears throat> and set up a uh, set up a a piece of motivation for uh, exploratory factor analysis. So what you have on your right screen there on slide 47 is a situation where um, a standard assumption of measurement error modeling is perhaps not fulfilled. You have a correlation between the measurement errors here. Potentially. It's broken arrow, so that means it could be there in this case. Double-headed arrow means that you have a covariance between the residual, the measurement error for x1, and for uh, x2, the residual for x2. For instance, in the dietary fat intake, if you're going to lie and underestimate your dietary fat intake in your diary of dietary fat intake, and say that quickly if you can, uh, you might also underestimate it in the questionnaire uh, item answer that you give. So it may be a uh, positive correlation here. Now that, that sounds innocuous. You know, standard, standard measurement error modeling of this kind assumes that the epsilons are uncorrelated. And we will see that assumption being uh, kept in, uh, in the uh, factor analytic situations, factor analytic models that we're going to take a look at uh, at for the remainder of the day. But what about when it's violated? Well, what I go through here at the bottom of the slide, and you can go through um, in peace at home or in your hotel room, uh, if you have an example here, hypothetical example, where the true beta is 0.5 and the reliability of x is 0.5, um, here you have a set of parameter values. And given these parameter values, the, uh, the slope that you estimate y on eta turns out to be only 0.41. It, the true value is 0.5. The, the estimated value will be 0.41. And I'm talking about y on eta here. y on eta is underestimated. Why we get this value? Well, that will be revealed by the end of the day. But the lesson is here that an innocuous correlation between the residuals among your measurement items here, measuring eta, this little, the presence of this little covariance between the errors will lead to a misestimate, misestimation of that key parameter beta. And how does that work? Well, it is, say, assume that that exists, and you, but you model it like on the left. That's your standard model. If you model it like on the left, the standard model with un uncorrelated errors, but the, the errors are actually correlated, you will underestimate the true beta 
a bit and a little bit less if the reliability is higher for the axis. So I'm saying that uh, misspecification in the measurement part of the model, if you specify it like on the left, whereas the truth is on the right, will have consequences for what we will call the structural parameter, in this case beta. This is a structural parameter. So therefore, this is a motivation for doing your measurement, uh, measurement model at work well. And what you want to do is to have many indicators, um, more than two is what we recommend, many indicators such that m most of them don't have this error correlation. Most of them don't. Some of them can be allowed to have that error correlation when you have many, but um, not all of them. And uh, that is the approach of factor analysis, which gets you out of this dilemma. So uh, if you do your factor analysis well, you will be able to tell uh, if you have certain items that have correlated residuals like this and counteracted by actually including that correlation in the model, which is possible. It gives an identifiable and estimated, estimable model with multiple indicators. But in this case, it's not possible to include this parameter. And that parameter is not identified because you have only two indicators. So that's a fairly high level um, exercise. And uh, you may uh, want to um, get back to it after we've gone through today. Uh, but it, the lesson is that do a careful measurement error modeling job. And EFA and CFA are good tools for doing that. So then we take a deep breath and talk about factor analysis in general. So um, we have factor analysis uh, as a um, tool for us to uh, help study dimensionality of a set of variables. By dim dimensionality, I mean uh, figuring out how many underlying factors there are. Dietary fat intake, is that the unidimensional construct, or does it have different dimensions? And in factor analysis, latent variables represent unobserved constructs, referred to as factors and dimensions. We know that now. We have EFA uh, on the left screen here, and we have CFA on the right screen. And EFA uh, is used to explore the dimensionality by finding the smallest number of interpretable factors needed to explain the correlations among a set of variables. And by exploratory, we mean that we only, we, we place no structure on the relationships between the observed variables, uh, on the linear relationship between the observed variables and on the linear relationships between the observed variables and the factors, but only specifies the number of latent variables. So we only specify the number of latent variables. We do not say, for instance, which latent variables influence which items, which observed variables. And that's in contrast with CFA where we have a, um, a restrictions on the parameters of the model, particularly restrictions on which factors influence which variables. And we'll see examples of that now. So EFA only talks about how many factors there are. CFA talks about how many factors there are and which factors influence which items. And we see many applications of factor analysis, of course, in psychology, child behavior checklist, uh, the MMPI and sociology, political science, achievement in education, diagnostic criteria and mental health, and the like. And we will study some of these examples. But let's take a look at the model uh, a little bit more. And just to remind you then that as Linda mentioned, uh, every building block here, every model has a building block of uh, linear regression today. And that goes for factor analysis as well. So on this slide 51, you have the factor analysis model. And you have the dependent variables y1 down to yp. So if you have a 15-item measurement instrument, 
uh, p would be 15 here. Uh, so you have 15 dependent variables. And in this case, you have m factors, eta 1, 2, up to m. Again, in uh, literal style notation. So you have then, for each dependent variable, for each item in your measurement instrument, do you have an intercept, nu, and you have a slope, lambda, for each of the predictors. So these adas, these m adas, take the role of m covariates in standard linear regression. And then you have the residuals, epsilon, sitting out here. And they are uh, assumed to be uncorrelated as a basic assumption. We can uh, relax that assumption, but the basic assumption is that they are the baseline assumption is that they are uncorrelated. And also, as Linda mentioned, the residuals are uncorrelated with the predictors, in this case, the factors, just like in linear regression. So you have a series of 15 linear regressions here. The only problem is you don't observe the covariates. You don't observe the ADAs here, the factors. So how on earth can you do regression when you only have the dependent variable, not the independent or covariate variables? Well, that's where the magic of uh, statistics come in, uh, magic of um, multivariate statistics. Given that we have more than one dependent variable, it is actually possible under a specific model to identify uh, the parameters, identify these lambdas, these regression slopes, even though we don't observe the adas, the factors. So here is the notation, intercepts, loadings, factors residuals. And in matrix form, just for those of you who read the methods journals, uh, when you look at the whole set of Ys, the, the, all the PYs uh, in one long co column here, uh, you can boldface it and call it a vector to um, impress your friends. <laughs> and lambda is a matrix. So a lambda then has elements in the first row, lambda 11, lambda 12, etc., and down to the last row, lambda P1 to lambda PM. So those lambdas are pulled out and placed in a P by M table, we may call it. Let's, so let's call it a table instead of a matrix. And then eta is, a, uh, again, a vector, M ve elements in the vector, and epsilon is a P vector. Anyway, and then you have the new notation, psi is the, uh, so that's a cap psi. Capital psi is the matrix of factor variances, covariances. And we saw that in the single factor case, which turns it into a lowercase uh, quantity. And then this is the cap theta that we saw the lowercase uh, one dimensional version of. Here it is a P by P matrix. And then you see the uh, Famous expression sigma, which is the population covariance matrix for the y's, the covariance matrix for the y's. Uh, so if you have 15 variables, it will have 15 rows and 15 columns. And on a diagonal, you will have the variances. And in the off diagonal, you will have the covariances. And you have that that turns out to be lambda psi lambda transpose plus theta. So that's the standard factor analytic expression. And we will see examples of that now um, here uh, as we move forward. But first, factor pattern is a term that we use for lambda. Uh, psychometrics has its own terminology. Uh, when you talk about pattern, you talk about that loading matrix. When you talk about factor structure, you talk about lambda times psi, which then uh, turns out to be the covariances or correlations, depending on how you scale the variables, between items and factors. We're going to talk about Haywood cases, which implies that the uh, residual variance uh, for an item is negative. The residual variance negative, which is uh, inadmissible. It's a no-no, in other words. So we have a problem when that happens, but it happens quite a lot in factor analysis, uh, either for, for several reasons that we'll get to. Factor scores is a term used for the estimated, that little hat there. It means that we have tried to estimate individual i's true factor value. You know, it's not absurd to be estimated. 
And when we estimate factor scores for an individual, we want to know how well we estimate them. So we have a concept of factor determinacy. How well determined is the factor score? Well, that's the quality of the factor score. And it's uh, measured as a correlation between the true factor value and the estimated factor value, which makes sense. And we're going to take a look at the counterpart of that for categorical items tomorrow where um, in IRT language, uh, we're going to use some other notations for it, <coughs> for the factor determinancy. So here we have an example, a two-factor model. <coughs> so if you look at this, um, you will see then that um, comparing with the left screen, we're going to often do this left screen, right screen. Uh, so if you right, have a right screen brain, you're interested in pictures. <laughs> left screen brain, you're sort of mathematically oriented. You probably play the piano and all of that. <laughs> but here on the left, um, what you see there are factors. And we are now well trained from notation to the other. F1 corresponds to eta 1. F2 corresponds to eta 2. So we have only two of these. Uh, so M must be 2 here in this example on the right. And we have six y's, so p must be six. And so we're looking at six variables here, and we're looking at only at this part of the uh, layout, this part going up to a.2. And we notice some things here. We notice that, um, for instance, f2, look at f2, bottom right there, it does not influence F2 does not influence, has no arrow from it to Y1, 2, or 3. There's zero arrows here, Y1, Y2, Y3, which implies that this lambda here for Y1 is zero. You only have that lambda, right? We only have this lambda, which sits up here, whereas that lambda would be represented by this one, and is, it's empty. So we see here that we have um, not, we, here we're actually saying that we not only have two factors, but we're saying that the second factor does not influence the first three items. And likewise, we're saying that the first factor does not influence the last three items. So the model on the right now, you can right away say that that is not an EFA model. It's a CFA model. It's a CFA model because we're saying not only that we have two factors, but we're also saying something very specific about which factors influence which items, and which factors do not influence uh, some of the items. There we go. And here is the um, explication on slide 57, 56 rather. You have these zeros put in here. You can see the zeros uh, for the absent arrows put in. And we can even exercise our knowledge of the elements of the covariance matrix. We'll do that very lightly, but these three lines can be of importance. Variance of y1. What's the variance of y1? Well, y1 is influenced by f1 alone and the epsilon. And then it is the variance of this part, which is the square of the co coefficient times the variance of the factor. The variance of the factor is psi 11, element of the psi matrix. And the variance for the residual, variance for epsilon, which is theta 11. So that's what we're looking at. If you look at top right, variance of y, y is y1 is equal to the square of the loading, lambda 11, which you can write out here. You can write lambda 11. And uh, times the factor variance plus the residual variance. Covariance between two items, y1 and y2. If they uh, measure the same factor, that covariance is the lambda, the loading of one times the factor variance times the loading of the other. So it includes the loading sizes and the factor variance. Covariance between two items that measure different factors, y1 and y4, is the la lambda times the factor covariance times lambda. And this is factor covariance here is, that's psi 21 here. You, you can write psi 21 over there, psi 21. 
This is just uh, connecting the formulas with the picture. Now, some of you will probably pay very little attention to these kinds of formulas and instead focus on the picture and go from the picture uh, to the program input directly. So the idea is that once you have understood what these models represent statistically, you could just write them like this, uh, scribble on a piece of paper, and from that picture on the right, you should be able to go directly to the M plus input. I'm not saying that is necessary to uh, master. So I think we'll, not to um, push you too uh, far along this morning without coffee, maybe we should um, stop here and uh, get to our question and answer session, the first one of the day, and then take a coffee break and get back into EFA. So gentlemen in the back there, yes. Uh, in path analysis, can you get a, a so-called decomposed effect size for each independent variable, something akin to a squared semi-partial correlation coefficient for regression? So the question is about path analysis and a decomposed effect. Uh, you don't get that directly out from the output, uh, but uh, as in regression, you can, you can calculate it from the estimated parameters. And there is a feature in M plus which is quite useful uh, for expressing uh, new kinds of quantities. Uh, so for instance, if you, if you have, if the parameter estimates uh, is not what you're, uh, well, let me put it this differently. If you're interested in a quantity that depends on the parameter estimates, but is not the parameter uh, itself, then you can use the so-called model constraint feature, model constraint feature, and define a new parameter, a new parameter, N-E-W, as the uh, quantity that you're interested in. And then you will get from M plus the uh, parameter estimates for that, parameter estimates for that, and it's standard error. Yes, lady in black in the back. Slide 32. Slide 32. And we want you to ask really basic questions at this point, so you're on board here with our uh, notation and terminology. The question, I'll just repeat the question since this is being videotaped as well. So explain the need for the uh, scaling there in the defined statement. Do you want to have a go at that? Well, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it has to do with the, the uh, uh, quirky European habit of measuring things in millimeters. So you get an awfully high scale on head circumference. And here we're dividing it down to centimeters. So we don't work in the thousands, but maybe only in the hundreds. It's just a more comfortable scale to be in. The computer programs uh, are geared towards not working with huge numbers uh, in terms of uh, efficient algorithms and the like. So we have sort of a, if you want to be really strict, you have a rule of thumb that you want to keep variances of variables between 1 and 10. And you can do that not by standardizing them, I just divide or multiply by 10, say, or 100, that's not always, typically that's not really uh, needed, but it could be good to do that. So that's all that that's doing. Whereas the third statement here uh, has to do with the model assumptions, you know, taking the log of a variable to make the relationship more linear. If you, once you drink a lot, uh, mother drinks a lot, further drinking doesn't have that much further harm. It's already bad enough. Yes? Slide 54. Slide 54. The concept is factor determinacy. Is there a relationship between factor determinacy and goodness of fit as we understand it in regression? <coughs> so the question is on slide 54 is the relationship between factor determinacy and goodness of fit? Uh, no, there's no such relationship, I would say. Um, factor determinacy has only to do with the quality of the f estimated factor scores. And you really should think about your analysis as consisting of two uh, key uh, different 
two different main steps. One is estimating the model parameters and the other is estimating scores on the latent variables. You do the second once you've done the first. The second is not part of the first activity and it's the first activity, the parameter estimation is where you also try to assess whether your model fits the data. So they are two separate things. Yes? So I have two questions for slide 34. Slide 34? So you, uh, you can talk about uh, significant effect. How can you define it? It's from estimate uh, uh, effect size. So the question on slide 34 has to do with significance. How so do you define it? So we, the way we assess significance is by the third column, which is a z-score. Right. So, so it's a z-test. Okay. So the, uh, just to, for those of you who have forgotten about your z-test, uh, the critical value uh, at the 5% level would be 1.96, right? Plus or minus. So plus minus, you want to get a value greater than plus minus 1.96, and these two values are greater than that. This one just barely, I guess. And, and that one, ethnicity, is not on the top. Okay, my second question, what does it mean for standard Yx? Okay, these are the standardized uh, regression coefficients, and they're standardized in different ways. For example, and this is an old output. Currently, the out, if you ask for STDY or STDYx or STD, you would get a whole set of output with three columns because we now give standard errors. Those two columns are just standardized raw coefficients. And STD is standardized using the um, standard deviations of the latent variables. And you can see it's the same, 4.15, because it's all observed variables. There are no latent. And STDYX is standardized using the standard deviations of Y and X. And STDY is using only the standard deviation of Y. So this is the, the regular standardized value that you're familiar with from, uh, from the regression analysis. Uh, but we give different kinds of standardization because, for instance, you would not want to uh, use this value here, 0.270 for gender, because it doesn't make sense to talk about um, a standard deviation of gender. So here, here uh, for gender, you may only want to standardize with respect to Y, not with respect to X. And we give that. It's called STDY, but it's not shown on here. So that, again, that's referring to regular uh, regression. And, th and this is all written out under the standardized option in the user's guide. So if you want to refer to that. And by the way, some of you may not know that the user's guide, you, you can actually purchase it to hold it in your hand, but it also um, it exists on the web, so you can just print it out yourself for free. Yes, lady in red. Okay, I just have slide 30 and 31, basic question 2. For showing the the yeah, correlation between the covariates, do, is that default, by default we get those correlations, or is where in the code? Yeah, so the question has to do with these correlations shown here on slide 30. And uh, if I interpret Linda correctly, she says that uh, like in regression, these are not parameters that are part of the model. But on the other hand, they are not assumed to be zero. So they are, in effect, allowed to correlate freely the way we estimate them. Uh, and you can, say, you can think of that as by default, I guess. So they are included, just like in regression, uh, in the uh, analysis. They are allowed to correlate, but the model doesn't estimate those parameters. The parameters of the regression are just the slopes and the intercept and residual variance. You know. But you will, find, you will find the values of them uh, in your sample statistics output. So that's why the path analysis had on the output command uh, SAM stat. Yes? Are you, you do slide could 56. You, okay, could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to. Um, so 
So, so you're asking uh, Y1 and Y4, for instance, they, they correlate. Yes. Uh, yes, Y1 and Y4 correlate, and we will see in the sample correlations that they, that could be pretty high. But the way the model expresses that correlation is like you have on slide 56 bottom. It's the correlation or covariance between those two variables is expressed by the product of this loading, lambda 11, times this loading, lambda 42, times this factor covariance, psi 21. So it is expressed through this. So we're saying that the, the uh, correlation between y1 and y4 is uh, accounted for by the factors being correlated. Was that your question? No, I was you, you, you by correlation, you know, you by estimates. Oh, well, if, you so est if, you, if you estimate the, cor the uh, uh, residual. Yeah, okay, the residual correlation here? Yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, you, if you allow a residual covariance between this and this residual, these short arrows represent the residual, uh, then allowing for that correlation, you will change the correlation between those. Because you, some, of this, some of the correlation between Y1 and Y4 will go this direction, but some goes that direction. So uh, typically, uh, you will uh, make that correlation lower. So you have to see if that correlation needs to be in the model by model test of fit exercises, which we're going to talk about shortly. Right. Yes, lady in the back there, yeah. Yes, you. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, uh, slide 34. Slide 34. So I imagine others have probably broached this. But, um, Could you speak up a little bit? I imagine others have probably brought this up, but I'm a little unclear about something. Um, you talk about having all of the predictor variables in, in the sense that you're controlling for the influence of variables. But um, how do you uh, write the code so that, for instance, the first variable that you enter would be assigned all of its unique variance, and then the variance left over would be um, assigned accordingly to the next variables that are entered in order. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, so you're talking about uh, uh, apportioning the variance contributed by each variable. <clears throat> I think that is a topic for uh, stepwise regression, uh, and that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're having a hypothesis of four predictors, and we're assessing their influence on the two dependent variables uh, jointly. So these are partial regression coefficients, partial re regression coefficients that you see <coughs> over on the right. We're not attempting to do any um, stepwise. Step no. 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 And actually, there's no such feature in M plus right now. Yes, later. On. So I just had a question on slide 47. 47? Yes. So you mentioned that it is possible to relax the assumption um, that the errors are correlated in a, in a uh, latent variable model. Can, is this um, translatable to the path and analytic framework too? Can you also relax assumptions that the errors are correlated between observed variables? <coughs> uh, good question. Let's see, where were we on the 34 maybe? So are you asking, could we correlate these two? Um, well, maybe more so can we correlate uh, the error variances between mom's alcohol intake and cigarette smoking? I think that's what's represented there, but I, I'm not, I just wanted to be clear that that was um, yeah. appropriate use. Uh, here, uh, in this case, these variables are treated just like covariates in regular regression. So there is no uh, accounting for measurement error here. The measurement error is ignored. We're assuming that these are perfectly measured. So there is, there is no such thing as an epsilon sitting for these, so, which is, you know, it can't be done. It can't, you, if, if you try to include a measurement error here, <clears throat> it could not be uh, identified or estimated unless you knew exactly how big it is. Right, I guess I'm thinking, I'm trying to translate what I've learned in Amos to Specify the error term for even the observed variables, which are fixed at a, at a constrained value. 
but right. you can correlate those error variances. Yes. Now you, you, get, you, can, you can correlate these variables. You can correlate them and include them in the model. And you can do that in M plus, but they will be estimated at the sample statistics value. So you're just wasting the computer's time by estimating them when the computer already knows what they are. So M plus um, allows you to uh, draw on that efficiency. Yes? I have uh, the side number 31. 31? Yes. Yeah. Is it the use of the ratio that I can use also if I want to subset of population in the land and I think the question here on slide 31 is can you uh, subset uh, the sample? Do you want to talk about that? What do you mean with use observations? Yeah. yeah. You, so, if, for example, in this situation, we're only using people that have ID that's not equal to 1121 and not equal to mom alcohol 999. And so that's what the use observations option is used to subset on, on the sample. So, male or female. Yeah, so you would just say use obs equals gender equal one, semicolon. You could use group. You can use any any variable that you can. You can use any conditional statement you want after use observations. So you can condition on gender, group, ethnicity. Any variable that anything. could be included in the names R list. Yeah. I hope that was your question. <laughs> Let's see. Anybody else? How about here? Oh. I had two questions about the model indirect command on okay. slide 38. 38? Um, if I want to include a path that goes through the curved arrow, such as, um, so Y3, uh, IND X1, can I go from X1 to X2 to Y2 to Y3? If you used Y3, IND X1, you would just get the direct effect because end is for specific effects. If you wanted to get every possible path from x1 to y3, you would use the via command. So you would say y3 via x1, and then you would put any mediator, all the mediators that you wanted it to go through in there. Is that your question? Yes. Great. So my next question is, is there a way to specify that I want to get all the indirect effects between this variable and this variable except those that go through a certain mediator? Well, you just leave that mediator out. Okay. So I think, you know, you, you have to, you can't say everything but this. So you might have to say more than one statement to get everything you want, or get everything and ignore what you don't want. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in the back. I'm 35. 35? Um, uh, p values greater than or less than 1.96 negative 1.96. But given that r squared is 0.08, do you think the theory was supported? Right. So the question on slide 35 is, uh, with this low r square, how uh, confident should we be about the, uh, the meaningfulness or the significance of uh, mothers drinking and smoking? That's a good question. Uh, we know that um, we know that the model fits the data well. You know, the two left out paths gives us two degrees of freedom, and the uh, chi-square test of model fits, we will talk about after the break, uh, says that we cannot reject the model. Uh, the R-square says that we haven't explained much variance in the dependent variable. There's a lot left out, uh, but we uh, can't reject the model, so the model fits the data well. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't alternative models. There certainly could be model misspecifications here that cannot be captured. And uh, I, I would agree with you that you would probably try to push for explaining more variance, it's particularly, uh, of course, in the uh, birth uh, head circumference. And the circumference at 36 months is influenced by the one at birth, and then you get a higher R square there. So. Uh, yeah, if it were me, I would probably try to include more meaningful covariates in that model before I'm satisfied. I think we have one question way in the back. Slide 47. Slide 47. Uh, you mentioned it is possible to cut 
Is it possible to correlate? Correlate the error terms beta two one in E of A. Theta 2, 1 is the covariance here. It's not a variable, it's the covariance. And you want to correlate what? Oh, is it possible to estimate this in EFA? Yeah, in fact, you mentioned that. Yes, and the ans short answer is yes, and the uh, long answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and let me explain why. So in standard EFA, it's not, uh, that, that correlation is not included in standard EFA. But when you come to M plus EFA, uh, within, which we can do within the so-called ESEM, ESEM framework that we've been mentioning, you can allow for that kind of correlation. And that's the strength of that. All right, and we'll talk about that at the end of the day, toward the end of the day. Yes. Maybe, OK, go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, on slide uh, 38, it has an example of uh, my question. Um, typically, in um, SEM programs, you're uh, setting the Path of the residual there is also known as the disturbance. If you're setting them equal to one or the variance equal to one, does M plus do that automatically? I mean, I've never, I've just started using M plus. Yeah, so the question is about slide 38, and if you look at Y3 here, we have a residual arrow, and uh, different kinds of notational frameworks uh, act differently, but in M plus, you estimate the path is one. That is, the multiplier of epsilon is the invisible one, but you estimate its variance. So you estimate the residual variance, just like you would in regular regression. And it's automatically set. You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to do anything about it. It's automatically set. But if you want the alternative, that can be accommodated. Is there a part of the manual? I've just started. I should have read more of the manual. Well, that's right. Um, is there a part of the manual which explains the, the um, default? Um, yes. Um, it's a very rich default section, right? <laughs> in chapter 13. Chapter 13. But, and it's long, confusing. <laughs> it's hard to, the default, we have so many models. That's a place to start if you're interested in the defaults. But I almost think a better thing is to just look at the results. Yeah. And if you haven't specified something and it's there, then that's the default. And if you don't like it, then you can just get rid of it by putting that factor at zero or whatever you want to do to, or that parameter rather. But the de defaults are, are, are given not to annoy you, but to, <laughs> to help you in the sense that they correspond to the most common ways of setting up the models and corresponds to uh, model setups that will work well, that will converge, it's identified, etc. But they, uh, they can be modified quite easily. So uh, I don't think there's anything that's done by default that can't be changed unless it re would make the mod model not identified. So yeah. we should probably let you have coffee. So let's try to get back in 15 minutes. And um, we'll have other question sessions. But since I told them we had to have coffee at 10, and now it's 10.15, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> All right, so let's move into the topic exploratory factor analysis. And Banked already talked a little bit about it. We're going to do an example. And he mentioned that it's used to explore the dimensionality of a measurement instrument by finding the smallest number of interpretable factors. And it's exploratory in that we don't place any structure on the factor loadings or anything else. We just specify how many factors we want. So we look for one factor, two factors, three factors, but that's the only specification we make. And we do this to determine the quality. One of the reasons we do this is to determine the quality of the measurement instrument. If you've developed a measurement instrument and you know you thought it through and you firmly believe that you have written these items so that they really measure what you want them to measure, and they do it in a perfect way. They're perfectly valid measures of what they're supposed to be. And when you give them to people, they're also reliable measures. Well, you can take a look at these via EFA and see if they're really behaving the way that you think they should. So we can find variables that are poor factor indicators. 
And then we can also, in EFA, identify factors that are poorly measured. Let's say that you um, developed seven items for a factor. And in EFA, you find that they just aren't really working the way that you had thought. And hopefully, this is still a pilot study, so you can take what you're learning and, and make some sort of adjustments. Well, maybe we're going to find out that there's just not enough good measures for a particular factor, and we can see that in EFA. The danger of starting out with CFA and specifying a simple structure CFA model where you do specify that certain factor loadings are zero and others are free is that if that's really not the case, and then you start trying to fix that model by adding a residual covariance here or a cross-loading there or something else, you can end up with just a big mess. So it's better to kind of start out with an EFA just to see if you even have the number of factors you think you have. So a little bit about EFA. Now, we're, the example that we're going to look at, the data are taken from a classic study way back in 1939, Halsinger and Swineford. And they had 26 tests measuring a general factor and five specific factors. And very small samples. One school, Grant White, had 145. Pasteur School, 156. We're going to be looking at 19 tests intended to measure four domains. Spatial ability, verbal ability, speed, and memory. And we're looking at the 145 students from Grant White. So we have to get ourselves a little bit hepped up here to make it to lunch. So let me just show you what, briefly what the tests are. OK, so like I said, there's spatial. And they had things like um, a visual perception test, verbal tests asking general information, paragraph comprehension, speed tests adding quickly counting groups of dots, things like that, memory, word recognition, number recognition, figure recognition. So they had all of these various tests. Now, for example, here's an example of test one, the visual perception test. People were given a series of items, like we show four here, where they had to select what would be in the last box. So that, general information, in each sentence below, you have four choices. For the last word, only one is right. And then you're supposed to select the right one. Pumpkins grow on bushes, trees, vines, shrubs, et cetera. So we're not going to take a lot of time on this. Test 17 of the 19 we're looking at, object number. They're supposed to look at a set of objects, for example, apple, brush, candy, which has a number. And then they're supposed, they're given other objects, and they have to remember the number. So this is an object number, an example of that item. So we had 19 items that we're looking at. Now, on this, if you just, I'm just going to go by the next three screens, because what this shows you is the sample correlations for the 19 items. So you know, if, if, let's say you have that on a single piece of paper, and you look at that. You know, visually, it's not possible. You know, basically, statistics is taking a lot of data and putting it in some form that it helps interpret what it means. So in EFA, we take all those correlations and we try to understand how they hang together and what dimensions that they measure. So that's what we're doing. We're taking the correlations in EFA and trying to understand the structure of the correlation matrix. How many factors are represented there? How many constructs? How many dimensions? However you want to refer to them. And once we see how many, we want to figure out, well, does it support the theory we had when we developed the items? Or for the theory that was the items were developed under, if they're developed under somebody else? So this is what we're using EFA for. Sometimes people criticize EFA but I think they are not using it correctly. For example, EFA can be used incorrectly if you just, somebody gives you 100 items. You know, you, you get some data from somebody and you know really nothing about it. You say, oh, let's do an EFA and see what you see. Well, 
what EFA really isn't meant for that purpose. It's meant to be used on a well-developed set of items that were developed to measure particular constructs and to look at how, how well those constructs were measured. Now, just some background, in EFA, typically a correlation matrix is analyzed, whereas in other structural equation modeling, one looks at a covariance matrix. This is really for historical purposes. You could do a covariance matrix, <clears throat> but it just so happens most programs stick to the past there and analyze the correlation matrix. And we have the unweighted least squares estimator. We have a, actually a lot more estimators in M plus now than we did when we started out. And if you're use, analyzing a lot of categorical variables, ULS can be a good estimator to use because it's really fast. It's not as efficient as maximum likelihood, but it is a lot faster and can be a, a good first step in looking at a very large data set. Like let's say you have 150 binary items or something like that. And maximum likelihood estimation we, of course, also cover. So we're just going to make a couple of, we're not going to spend a lot of time on all this, the mathematics behind um, EFA, we're just going to say a couple of brief things so that we understand. Because a lot of times people say, well, an EFA model can't be identified. Well, that, we need to, so we need to understand how it is identified. And what do we mean by identified? What do we mean when we say a model is identified? It has only one set of parameter values. So you can actually calculate for each parameter value a unique solution. So there's nothing ambiguous. Each parameter has a unique solution. And to be identified, an EFA model has to have m squared, where m is the number of factors, restrictions. So we have to have m squared restrictions on the factor loadings, variances, and covariance. And there are like an infinite number of ways to do those. And how the restrictions are placed don't affect the ultimate results. There's two steps in doing EFA. In the first step, the restrictions are placed. M times M plus 1 divided by 2 restrictions come from fixing the factor variances to 1 and the factor covariances to 0. So in EFA, the factor variances are 1, factor covariances are 0, and the other part, the m times m minus 1 divided by 2, so those together are m squared, they come from fixing factor loadings, basically, or functions of factor loadings to 0. And so that's the first step. That's to identify the model. And the second step is a rotation. And we can do two types of rotations in EFA, oblique or orthogonal. In an orthogonal rotation, the factor covariances are zero. In an oblique, the factors are allowed to covary. And we, we want the, to maximize in the rotation the number of factor loadings that are close to one and zero. So the rotation, just like linear regression, when you want to fit a line that minimizes the differences between the observed data and the line, here with EFA, we want to rotate to maximize the ones and the zeros in the factor loadings. So that's, if you want to know a lot more about this estimation, then you, we could probably suggest references. But for most of us, that's sufficient to know. Now some new EFA features in M plus that came out in version five, so that was a while ago, are that we have many new rotations, including quartamin and geomin. In Prior to version 5, we just had Veramax and Promax. And we now have Quartamin and Geomin and a lot of other rotations. And one of the more exciting things is that we've added standard errors for our factor loadings in EFA. Prior to version 5, we estimated the factor loadings, but we did not estimate standard errors. So although it was possible to see which were large and small relative to, to each other, we weren't able to 
assess statistical significance unless we did what we call an EFA and a CFA framework. So that came with version five, and we also brought in a new estimator, MLR, which is a non-normality robust estimator as far as standard errors and chi-square test of model fit go. So we had that new uh, estimator. And then we added to EFA the ability to get modification indices for residual correlations to see if that might be an issue. We still couldn't have residual correlations as part of EFA like we can now with the new ESIM, but we could assess that. And we added exploratory factor analysis for type equals complex, as we call it in M+. It can have complex survey data features like stratification, clustering, and weights, type equals mixture EFA for mixture modeling EFA, and then type equals two-level EFA, so multi-level exploratory factor analysis. So that was all new in version five. In version five. Now, when we're um, doing an EFA, besides looking at test of, uh, test of model fit, which we'll talk about in a second, we also look at descriptive values to decide on the number of factors. So we usually try, when we're deciding on the number of factors, to use statistics to help us by fit measures using descriptive measures like eigenvalues and residual variances. For example, Bank mentioned a negative residual variable variance constitutes a Haywood case, and that implies the solution is inadmissible. So when we're looking at our EFA results, besides looking at the eigenvalues, we want to look at the residual variances. And we also want to look at tests of model fit. One test we can look at is the RMSR, which is the average residual. So you look at the model estimated correlation matrix minus the sample correlation matrix and average all those differences, and you get the RMSR. And we recommend that to be less than 0.05. And then we have our normal chi-square tests, and we want to test that the model does not fit significantly worse than a model where the variables correlate freely. So basically, we want p-values greater than 0.05 to indicate good fit. In this chi-square test, the null hypothesis is our factor model. The H1 hypothesis is a model of unrestricted correlations. And if P is less than 0.05, we reject our model, H0, we reject. So we want a large P value, so we will not reject the factor model of H0. The RMSEA is a function of, that's another fit measure, and it's a function of chi-square. Instead of a test of absolute fit, which chi-square is, it's a test of close fit and a value of less than 0.05 is recommended for this also. Can I sure. Could somebody left uh, their laptop and cell phone outside and uh, may loot if it, was there anybody in this group? And then tell them how the piece of paper over there. Okay, I think we, we spotted the person. Okay, so. Okay, great. Back to the story. All right. <laughs> so, well that was much more exciting. <laughs> so, and just to show you that RMSEA is a function of chi-square, I just have the formula here where you can see chi-square. And um, so that you realize that it's, it, it's in the same family. It's just that instead of a test of absolute fit, it's a test of close fit. So let's see where we are. So I think I'll put that one over here. So it, it feels funny for us to be starting to starting this uh, eight course sequence again. It's been, I think, two years since I've, act, I've taught this and thought about this information. And I realize that one of the things we emphasize is when you're doing your analysis, do it stepwise. You know, take things a step at a time and really understand your data and really think through what you're doing. Don't just 
throw everything, you know, the factors, the covariates, the whole kit and caboodle, and throw in a distal outcome and then say, run, because probably you're going to run into a problem. <laughs> I think it was Will Dixon, who I worked for at BMDP many, many years, who used to say 95% of the work in data analysis is descriptive. It's understanding your data. By the time you do statistics, you should do, know your data so well that it, statistics will just confirm what you already knew was, you were going to see. So I think that's pretty good advice. But anyway, so in EFA, First of all, carefully develop or use a carefully developed set of variables that measure specific domains. So you, you, know, you want to bring good data into the EFA so that it can do what it's supposed to do. And then we want to, the goal is to determine the number of factors. And I mentioned we're going to look at descriptive values. We're going to look at tests of model fit and something almost more important is that we're going to interpret the factors. A lot of times, you know, people get frustrated when statistics doesn't answer the question for them. But in EFA and in latent class analysis and gross mixture modeling and things like that, which also have an exploratory component to them, ultimately, after you look at what the statistics has to say, you want to look at the interpretation. What do you expect? I mean, when you came into the, this analysis, how many factors did you expect? That's the real question. And did you find them, and do they look the way they're supposed to look? Can they be interpreted? I mean, you, maybe you got three factors, but maybe the things didn't load at all as like you expected, and those factors don't represent the, con represent the constructs you think. So never underestimate the importance of interpretation. It's very important and substantive background in theory. So, and then we can also, in EFA, look at the quality of the variables by looking at their factor loadings and, the, and any cross loadings. And you may have developed an item and not expected it to cross load, and it may have a cross loading. And that may be a, an okay thing. If it's explainable, if you can say, oh yeah, okay, I see why that loaded on both of those then having a cross-loading is not necessarily bad. But if it's something that you don't want, then you might consider that a, a cross-loading says some, that you might not want to use that item, or you may want to develop it further, refine it in a way that, that it even better measures what you thought it was measuring. And then we can determine the quality of the factors. How many variables load on that factor? Keeping in mind that even though you can have a factor in a model with two factor indicators, that factor isn't identified on its own. It, it can only be identified with other factors by borrowing something from the other factors. So that maybe you want to aim to have at least three or four uh, factor indicators. And a factor with three indicators is just identified. So you can't test the fit of that factor. So we want to see how many variables load on the factor. We want to look at the factor determinacy, which is the correlation is between the estimated factor score and the factor, as Bank mentioned earlier. And you may want to eliminate poor variables and factors and repeat your EFA to see how stable your results are when you do that. You know, there sh it, if you take out a couple of variables or a factor, and everything falls totally to pieces, you know, that wouldn't really be a sign of stability. So now I, we have our EFA on 19 variables, and we, we've already talked about the basic commands in M+. So what's important here on the screen, your, to your right, is a new command that we haven't talked about, the analysis command. So in the analysis command, you can say the type of analysis you want to perform in various other technical details about the analysis. You can specify what estimator you want to use. M plus has a default estimator for every analysis, but there are also alternative estimators available. And if you want to change that, you could do that with the analysis command. And here we're saying that we want to do type equals EFA and that the one specifies that we want a minimum of one factor 
and up to a maximum for eight factors. So we want the one factor, two factor, three factor, up to the eight factor solution. And we're saying that we want estimator equals ML. And let's remember that these are continuous variables that we're analyzing. Now here on the screen now, now we're going to start going through some of the things that we would look at. And we said eigenvalues. Now the eigenvalues, off, people often say, select the number of factors that have eigenvalues greater than one. I don't think, I think we would not necessarily recommend that. I think we would rather look at what's also recommended to look at a scree plot and go to the number down here where there's a break and draw a line, and how many are above the line? One, two, three, four. So that would be an indication that four factors represent the data. Now, what we did here, and I might actually move this to the other screen so that is not in the way if it is. So I talked about the fact that in our input, we specified that we wanted to <coughs> extract one through eight factor solutions. So, and we talked earlier about that we would look at eigenvalues and negative residual variances and fit statistics to decide on the number of factors. So this table represents a summary of the one through eight factor solutions. So factors one through eight in the first column. The second column contains chi-square degrees of freedom and the p-value, RMSEA in the third column, RMSR in the fourth column, and whether we have negative residual variances in the fifth column. So if you go down the chi-square, we're looking for a p greater than 0.05, and we find that the first time for four factors. So that supports the scree plot. For RMSEA, we want less than 0.05, and that happens with four factors. And RMSR, same thing, happens with four factors, and we have no negative residual variances. So in this situation, which is real data, everything points to four factors. I've not often seen a data set that is actually this clear cut. So it may be, <laughs> it may be that in, in fact, in latent class analysis, which you know, we teach also in later topics, it's often the case that none of the statistics can help you, and you have to de depend on your theory. So, but this is an unusual case, but this is the idea behind what you would do. So, and, and now what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the solutions. So first of all, let's look at the three-factor solution. The first column contains the variable names. The second column, or, and then we have the three factors in the next three columns. Factor one, two, three. I've named them up here just to help us have a little mnemonic. So spatial and memory seem to load on factor one. Speed seems to be factor two and verbal factor three. Now the way that we uh, determine the highlighting here, and this is not set in stone anywhere, it's just what Banked and I sort of decided to do when we look at fact EFAs. We, we just highlight a factor loading that is at least twice as big as any other factor loading. So here, for example, for visual, that was 0.74, cubes, 0.522, paper, 0.508, lozenges, 0.650. Same for the speed factor, we had clear cut. Same for verbal, general paragraph sentence. So the items are very clearly loading on the factors as expected, except we have two factors on one factor here, so probably want to go to the four-factor solution. The last variable straight, nothing fit our criteria. It seems to load on two factors, speed and also spatial memory. So we just bolded that to point that out to ourselves. Now on the next screen, we have, whoops, well, and here's the rest of that screen. <laughs> 
And you can see the factor correlations at the bottom here. So Promax is an oblique rotation because we have factor correlations. Veramax is another we also have to show here, and that is an orthogonal rotation. So now let me get both of the four factors up here. Okay, so here is the Promax four-factor solution, and you can see that by adding the fourth factor, we allow um, spatial and memory to get separated from each other, and then verbal and speed remain as we saw. So we, w we would settle here on this four-factor solution. Now, in the next couple of, um, on slides 85 and 86, we, what we show, and we're not going to spend time on this, but it's the Veramax solution for four factors. And basically what it shows is the same thing. So there's not a big, you're not going to find a big difference when you do an orthogonal or an oblique rotation in most cases. So that isn't an issue. I then go on to show the five-factor solution, which simply has one factor where nothing loads heavily on anything. So... We won't spend a lot of time on that. Then slides 89 and 90 show the quartiman rotation. Now, what's new about this, um, 89, let me get 90 over here. So this is something new that was added in version 5. And with the quartiman rotation, we get standard errors. So we don't have to just look at which loading is larger relative to the other loadings. We can actually see which loadings are significant you know, in, by taking the ratio of the parameter estimate to the standard error, that z-test. We can do a z-test for each of these factor loadings. And, um, and, remember, and let's remember something else. See, we're calling them factor loadings. They're linear regression coefficients. So keep it, remember, this is just linear regression, everything we're doing today. And so we see that for the spatial factor, four of the factor loadings are significant, the ones that we had highlighted before. In addition, there's another one. Addition is significant. It's small, but it is significant. So it's something to keep in mind. You know, something can be statistically significant, but still may not hit a threshold for as far as practical significance goes for you. But basically, just to say a few words about that and to say that this is a new feature that we now have in EFA, which I think makes us pretty unique to have the standard errors for EFA. Now, then we had certain variables that I had bolded that didn't seem to load on any particular factor more than any other factor. And so I have gone through in the next several slides, which we're not going to go through in detail. I'll just go through this one. I've looked at the four variables that have cross loadings. This one is called code, and it was a speed factor, but it loads on memory and speed. And so this is, and I go through the next three and you can read them over, I think they're pretty clear. But so, what does this item do? And this is what you would do if you're developing an instrument. You can say, okay, I developed it to load on speed, but it's loading on memory and speed. Let me think about why. So then you think, okay, it requires matching letters to a set of figures. So you have to remember that this figure is Z, and this figure is K, and this figure is A, and then you have to go through this and fill in the right letters. Well, it's pretty clear that that loads on memory. I mean, you've got to have a pretty good memory to do that. So you could say, well, that's a legitimate cross-loading. Or you could say, no, I don't want it to rely on memory. I want to measure only speed. I don't want to measure memory. I want to, I want to think about developing my speed items in a different way. So now I'm just giving you the logic of how you would use EFA to help in measurement development. And now I have to see 
to where I'm going for the next page. <laughs> So anyway, so on the next pages, then, you can take a look at the other factors and think about them. Now, on slide 96 and on, there are two sections, which we're not going to go over, but I'm going to give you the background for. Basically, we delete four items that have cross-loadings. And as I said before, cross-loadings aren't always a bad thing. You can have cross-loadings if they make sense to you. But we're doing this as an exercise to see how stable the model is. So when I delete those four items, the model remains stable, the factors remain the same, the fit remains good. Then I delete a factor that only has two items that load well on it. And once again, I'm doing that to see stability of the other three factors. And once again, they're very stable. And um, then I think we're, we're going to, I think we're going to you. <laughs> oh, I think I've talked about pretty much the, let's see, one, let's go to 103. So there are some practical issues. So we want several observations per estimated parameter. Wait, let me get back up one page. Let's go back to 102. I think I've, I've talked about a lot of the practical issues, but we can just briefly go over them. First of all, choice of variables. We've said that. Very important to have de items developed to measure the constructs you're interested in. And um, the number of factors can be influenced by the number of variables per, per factor. So just because it's easy to write items for one construct and hard for the other, make yourself, make them fairly even. Um, you want to have a similar number of variables per factor, and at least four or five. And so if you're worried about the items, go for more than four or five. So if you don't keep them all, you have enough. Sample size, there are advantages of having a large sample size. Sampling correlations are smaller, and it reduces Haywood cases. But um, as we see, there is also advantages of small sample size. You can avoid having heterogeneity in your data, although that you could use with our new mixture EFA, you could look at that. And small sample size can also avoid problems of sensitivity for chi-square. As far as rules of thumb for what constitutes a large enough factor loading, we really don't ha have any and don't think the ones that are floating around are probably too useful. But what you can do now is you can see whether it's statistically significant, and then you can see which factor it loads more highly on. So you have two things to look at. And I think that pretty much takes us to 107, confirmatory factor analysis. So one reason I think this um, uh, analysis came uh, out with a good fit is that Holzing and Swineford really did a thorough job, as Linda suggested you should, in uh, their theory development and in their development of items that capture their theoretical concepts well. So they did an outstanding job uh, in putting together items that measure these various hypothesized dimensions. And they were rewarded then with a, quite a good fit and a very stable solution, even though um, the sample size wasn't huge. Uh, we have many more things to say about sample size. Uh, some of that will perhaps come up in the discussion and questions and answers. But let's uh, now continue with confirmatory factor analysis and get our, um, our, our um, 
bearings in that area before we get into lunch. So again, it goes beyond the EFA setting by um, uh, allowing restrictions on factor loadings, variances and covariances and residual variances, particularly restrictions on factor loadings, and particularly factor loadings restricted to be zero. And as we know now, a zero factor loading corresponds to your hypothesis that that factor does not influence that item. So that loading, that regression slope is zero, saying that that factor does not influence that item. And you probably have ideas about which items should be influenced by what, which uh, factors. As Linda said, there could be cross-loadings. Cross-loading meaning that an item loads on more than one factor, loads on another factor than you intended to load on for various reasons that are of marginal interest to you, that is a nuisance to you perhaps. Although, as Linda said, cross-loadings are substantively meaningful in many situations where there could be more than one, in this case, more than one ability that influences how well you perform. Now CFA is also um, used for uh, seeing if a factor model then um, fits a new sample from the same population. That is, say that you have a confirmatory, fa exploratory factor analysis, job done well, you have explored uh, a set of items that you've developed, you've modified items, you've written new items, you've thrown out some items to capture these hypothesized factors well. You do that through a series of uh, exploratory step, uh, at least you should, and only then are you ready to have a uh, uh, hypothesis, I think, of CFA, and you draw a new sample from the same population to see if that model that you have generated, your hypothesized model, is confirmed. That is, if it fits the data well. The problem, I think, in factor analysis is often that people have a theory and they develop measures and then they throw it into a CFA, and it's advocated by many that you should go straight to a CFA if you have a hypothesis about uh, number of factors and how they are measured. But I think it's a very, uh, too large of a step to take uh, all at once. Because even if you have a theory for how many factors you should have, it's not necessarily so that those particular items that you developed capture those factors in the way you intended them to. Most likely the uh, respondents may perceive them somewhat differently. And then the factor analysis will be uh, immediately, uh, your model will be immediately rejected and you're thrown back into the exploratory stage. It's better to take the exploratory stage first, we, we think. Uh, then the CFA model, once you confirmed it, can also be used to uh, look at fits of uh, models from, uh, uh, fit of this model from sa for samples from different populations. If you developed it for males, how well does it fit for females? If you developed it for older people, for younger people, how well does it work for younger people? And you can study the properties of individuals by examining the factor uh, distribution uh, more in detail. There are variances and covariances. Factor variances showing the heterogeneity, the degree of heterogeneity or differences in the population, and factor correlation showing the strength of association between the factors. So you get down to looking at what you're actually trying to measure. So continuing that on your right screen, you have uh, also the possibility of studying the behavior of, a new of new sets of measurement items embedded in a previously studied measurement instrument to see uh, how well they work. Do they actually seem to uh, work better than some of the older items? And ultimately then, once you've done your estimation, you can get to the uh, factor score estimation stage if you want to. It's not necessary. And um, I'll stop there. Now what do we have on slide 110. Well, if not the picture that we saw before, the CFA model that we saw before. <clears throat> and how do we know it's CFA? Well, what's the rule? EFA should have at least M square restrictions, right, for it to be identified. CFA model then is anything beyond the M square restriction. So what is M squared here? M is two, two factors. So M squared is four. How many restrictions do you see here in this picture? which is an interesting question because you don't see them. Uh, well, you see the absence of them. So you see that F1 does not influence these three. So 
So there are three zero paths here, namely three zero factor loading, and F2 does not influence the first three. So you have six restrictions, right? Six restrictions on the factor analysis model, and six is greater than m squared 4 by 2. So um, it is definitely a CFA model in that sense. You uh, want to, um, I'm going to put it like this instead, 111 over here. Now we're going to start making distinction between two types of parameters. On slide 111, we have measurement parameters. Slide 112, we have structural parameters. Measurement parameters have to do with characteristics of the uh, variables, of the observed variables, your items in your instrument. Whereas structural parameters have to do with characteristics of the people, pop the people that populate on. So uh, variable parameters, measurement parameters, and people parameters, and we're going to keep that very distinct. So the parameters then uh, have names like intercepts. You remember that Greek new factor loadings, the lambda, residual variances, the thetas, to use the Greek lingo. Whereas the structural parameters have to do with the distribution of the factors. So a factor variable has a mean, a variance, and can co-vary with other factors. Factor means we're going to call them alpha. Factor variances, covariances are called psi, PSI, you know, that upside down um, pitchfork. Anyway, metric of factors, uh, there is a indeterminacy, a potential non-identification matter. Uh, a factor is not an observed variable, therefore you need to determine the scale of it. And you can do what you do in EFA. In EFA, we fix the factor variance to 1. We standardize the factor variance to 1. It's um, harmless. But in CFA, it's, always, it's often advantageous to instead fix one factor loading to 1 and estimate the variance. And we're going to see examples of, of what that, when that is advantageous shortly. But that is the, the uh, default of M plus is fix one factor loading to 1. Uh, just necessary condition for identification. We look at the number of parameters in, in our hypothesis, our factor model, say that that's A, and then the number of parameters in the alternative hypothesis, H1. H1, Linda said, was the uh, model saying that we have no restrictions on the variance covariance matrix, and we need to have no more parameters in H0 than parameters in H1. B being the same as the number of sample statistics that we analyze. Uh, I'll say that much at that point, but then go on to um, identification is a difficult topic. Uh, we'll touch on it a little bit this afternoon, but there's a very practical way to check identifiability on slide 114, and that is that the program will complain if a parameter is most likely not identified. And that happens, um, that's almost foolproof, not totally foolproof, but almost foolproof. Uh, that is, uh, when you do maximum likelihood estimation, maximum likelihood being one or many estimators, uh, in, its, in its computation, in maximum likelihood estimation computation of standard errors, uh, there is a numerical uh, analysis operation going on called inverting the uh, Fisher information matrix. If you have a non-identified model, which is a problem, that matrix cannot be inverted. And that and program will tell you uh, that it failed to invert, and it will point to which parameter makes the model not identified. And give a parameter number that points you to where that non-identification arises. And that parameter number is then shown uh, in the, the so-called tech one, technical output number one which gives uh, a number for each distinct parameter to be estimated. Uh, so that's one way of checking. Another way is to say that if a fixed or constrained parameter, like a fixed factor loading of zero, if it has a so-called modification index, which we'll talk about in a second, that is zero, it will not be identified if it's freed. So if you have a loading fixed at zero, and the modification index is zero for that, 
you cannot free it up, make it non-zero. It will not be identified. Uh, but when you do these kinds of analysis often, you learn some rules of thumb for models that are known to be identified and have that as building blocks for more complex models to reason uh, fairly well about what is most likely uh, uh, an identified model. So for instance, the one factor model with three indicators, I think Linda mentioned that that is just identified, implying that it is identified. And you have as many parameters in H0 as in H1, which implies, as we'll see shortly, that it cannot be refuted. Uh, this model cannot be rejected because you don't get any degrees of freedom in your chi-square testing. It's trivially true. And that's not an advantage, although it seems like it. If you can't reject your model, it should be good. But you should give yourself the opportunity to reject your um, models. And therefore, you should have more than three indicator for a factor. A model with two correlated factors each, a model with two correlated factors each with two indicators, I should say, is identified uh, even though any one of the factors has only two indicators and not three, and should therefore be under-identified or not identified. It becomes identified by borrowing information from the indicators on the other factor. By the covariance between, you have two indicators here, two indicators there, the covariance across the indicators gives you information uh, on the uh, loadings of a particular indicator set. And you often see in the literature uh, latent variable models with only two indicators. And we recommend against that for the very reason that to be identified, you have to borrow information from other parts of the model. That part of the model with the two indicators is not self-sufficient as this model is or when you have three or when you have four or more indicators. And therefore, it becomes very sensitive. And we saw a uh, result of that before the break where we had two indicators. We had a residual correlation, which was so harmful that it hurt our estimation of our structural parameter, the beta. Now. Um, let me do 115 over here. Here are some general notions. We're going to talk a little bit about theory, which will uh, serve us well for uh, the remainder of potentially eight days together, folks, spread over one and a half years. So we're going to talk about model estimation and testing. And um, CFA, a covariance matrix, is analyzed. So the sample quantities are not correlations, typically, but the covariances and variances, because that carries a little bit more information. And like Linda alluded to, you could do that for EFA as well, and it would be more, it would be more homogeneously uh, handled if everything was analyzed by a covariance matrix, but historically, EFA has worked with the correlation matrix. As we go to ESIM tomorrow afternoon, you will see that we do use the sample covariance matrix also for EFA. Anyway, ML minimizes the difference between, uh, uh, minimizes essential differences between the sample and the estimated variances and covariances. And the difference here is not A minus B type of difference, as we do in U, uh, unweighted least squares, but it's a more sophisticated difference bringing in topics in matrix algebra of determinant and trace. And the robust ML, I think Linda mentioned this, you can get the same parameter estimates as ML, but you get standard errors and chi-square robust and non-normality. So that's the MLR or MLM estimators of M+. Chi-square test of model fit. Linda went through what's on the bottom here. And again, we note that we do not want low p-values as we do in ANCOA, for instance. We want large p-values. We do not want to reject H0. On the right, you have several um, uh, additional ways to judge model fit beyond chi-square. Chi-square has its strengths and its weaknesses. And given its weaknesses, uh, particularly that it's a little oversensitive, uh, that is, it rejects models that are not that bad, uh, there has been a, there's now a, a cottage industry of developing fit indices with all these funny names here. Uh, where CFI, Comparative Fit Index, uh, seems to be one of the more popular ones. Uh, 
it is actually comparing your model to a model where you have the variables uncorrelated and then judging how much better your model is than that model of uncorrelated variables. There's a lot of writing on this topic in these uh, articles, a lot of criticism of these fit indices. Uh, for instance, a cutoff that C5 should be greater than 0.95 and 0.96 is uh, a very rough cut. Sometimes that is too, perhaps too um, strict of a uh, cutoff. Sometimes it's not strict enough. It depends on so many factors, uh, number of variables, strengths of correlations between the uh, uh, variables, etc. So there's a whole literature of pros and cons of fit indices that you will see in journals like I will show you several times, structural equation modeling. And yet this is the latest issue from uh, July, September that I mentioned in my email. You can come up and take a look at that if you want. But TLI is um, the Tucker Lewis index, similar to CFI. RMSEA was that uh, test of close fit that Linda mentioned. And there is a good uh, literature on that. It's, a little, it's more rigorous, uh, than, statistically speaking, than CFI and TLI. Uh, it's a function of chi-square. We want it to be less than or equal to 0.05. Again, the cutoff point is very arbitrary, or, although I think a little bit less arbitrary than this one. Here's average correlation residual. Well, that's just a descriptive. And uh, we can ignore WRMR. Uh, we had great hopes for this to work well. But um, it doesn't seem to work well in all cases. Now, let's one more theory page, folks. You can do it. You can do it. It's um, necessary. And actually, two more. <laughs> Squeeze that in. We have to understand what chi-square testing does. We're not going to abandon chi-square testing. We're going to do a lot of it uh, over these eight topics. The p-value of the chi-square test gives the probability of obtaining a chi-square value this large or larger if the H0 model is correct. So p-value is pretty much the probability that your model is correct, to put it in simple fashion. Degrees of freedom, chi-square tests have degrees of freedom, right? It's very easy to compute, much easier than ANCOVA and the like. It's simply the number of parameters in H1 minus the number of parameters in H0. That's always the case. And the number of parameters in H1 with an unrestricted population covariance matrix, which is the standard H1 model. You can have other H1 models, but that's the standard. Is P times P plus 1 divided by 2. The number, P being the number of Y variables, number of items we analyze. And this is the number of distinct elements of variances and covariances. So you think about the P by P matrix is the diagonal and what's, say, what's below it. What's below it's the same as above it, so we don't count. We don't have p squared, but we have this number. Number of H1 parameters with unrestricted mu and sigma. If you have mu, mu being the, the means of the variables, which we're going to bring in this afternoon. We bring in the marines, uh, means. And then we have p more. p plus p plus 1 divided by 2 is the um, total number of H1 parameters when we have a, a model for the means as well as the covariance matrix. Degrees of freedom example down there, you can go through it on your own, taking into account that there are m squared restrictions that we uh, impose on the model. The right screen is very important. Uh, it says that the uh, counter hypothesis does not need to be the unrestricted H1, but it could be any model that's less restricted than H0. So you have when a model HA imposes restriction on parameters of model HB, HA is said to be nested within HB. So in the screen on the left, HA would be H0, right? And HB would be H1. But this is the idea of nested models, HA being nested within HB. And to test if the nested model HA fixed significantly worse than HB, a chi-square test can be obtained as a difference in chi-square values using a degrees of freedom the difference in number of parameters for the two models. So you can have a much more pinpointed alternative hypothesis. That is, say that H0 has a lot of factor loadings fixed at zero. Uh, HB may have many of those factor loadings free. 
to test if they should be fixed or free, you look at the difference. You get a, get a chi-square difference test, chi-square difference testing. And a chi-square difference uh, is also, you can compute it two ways, by taking the difference between the chi-square values or taking two times the difference in the log likelihood values for the two models. Gets the same thing. It's the same thing. This chi-square, there are many kinds of chi-square in statistics, or at least two that I know of. No, there are many, actually. Uh, this chi-square is called the likelihood ratio chi-square, LRT. Li well, likelihood ratio chi-square, or LRT being likelihood ratio test. This is a very general approach to testing that we will use also when we don't deal with continuous variables, when we deal with categorical variables, when we work with ca latent class models. Two times the log likelihood difference between two models is chi-square distributed with degrees of freedom, just like we're saying up here. So that's very important, very, very useful model. Uh, nested models, or we're going to call them neighboring models. And that's very useful general uh, testing strategy, uh, saying again that the counter hypothesis H1 doesn't have to be the totally unrestricted model for the covariance matrix. Note this, though, which will come into play uh, when we talk about latent class models quite a bit. Chi-square theory does not hold if H0 has restricted any of the HP parameters to be on the border of their admissible parameter space. So fixing a variance to zero, for instance, in HA, variances should not be zero. And chi-square, uh, that then the two times the log likelihood difference or the chi-square difference is not chi-square distributed. So you don't get the right p-values in your testing. Now you know almost everything, folks. But we'll go to 119 and 120, and you'll know everything plus. Now, on 119, we talk about model modification. And they are estimated for all parameters that are fixed or constrained to be equal. Called modification indices, if you want to be more statistically versatile in your cocktail conversations, you, those are also called Lagrangian multipliers. Lagrangian multipliers. Try to spell that. What they are is, it's the expected drop Drop meaning improvement in chi-square. Low chi-square is good, right? It means that the model fits better. Expect a drop in chi-square if that parameter is relaxed. You know, is instead of fixed, it's estimated. Instead of zero, you can estimate it to be 0.3 or something. So you, you, have a, you have estimated your H0 model. For any restricted parameter, you get a modification index, which gives you hints on where you should relax the model assumptions to get a better fit. So you can tell, you can imagine that that is very popular. It's too popular. And it's abused uh, very often. That is, uh, people just rely on modification in this to, to uh, find their models instead of relying enough on their theory and, and knowledge about their topic. So you get an expected drop in chi-square without having to rerun the model. You get it in the same run of your H0 model you get all the modification instances instead of having to rerun it for each parameter that you free up. You also get expected parameter change uh, when it's estimated and standardized. And um, yeah, we'll say only that. And then finally on slide 120, again, first step is estimating the model parameters and testing the model fit. And the second step is, if you want to, not necessary, estimating factor scores. Uh, that was used a lot in the olden days, because in the olden days you did EFA, then you estimated factor scores, and then you did path analysis on the factor scores. So three steps. That, those three steps are replaced by structural equation modeling. That is, you can do it in one step. To study relationships between factors, you don't have to estimate each, each individual's factor score. You estimate those structural coefficients in one fell swoop. Uh, but we should know about factor scores nevertheless. They are often used. We'll see them uh, mentioned a lot in the item response theory context tomorrow, for instance, the so-called theta hat ability values in IRT language. So what is a factor score? It's the estimating the factor value for an individual based on the model, the estimated parameters, 
and based also on the individual's observed scores. So the model and the observed scores for the individual gives estimated factor scores. And there are many methods to estimate factor scores <coughs> with our own advantages and disadvantages. One very common method in psychometrics, it's called the regression method. And in statistics, it's called empirical, empirical base. And in um, other psychometrics, it's called the expected a posteriori method. And um, you should note, most importantly, that the estimated factor scores do not behave like true scores. Estimated factor scores won't, will not have the same variance as the psi, the factor variance estimate that you get. Typically, will have uh, smaller variances. You should not be surprised. They have that problem. Estimated factor scores do not correlate with other variables the way true scores correlate. Uh, those are also misestimated a bit. Uh, the misestimation is uh, smaller the more items you have to measure a factor, because the more good items you have, the higher the factor determinancy, the higher the estimated factor scores would approximate the true scores. So we talk about factor determinancy here in that context. And here are at the bottom are some uses of factor scores. We're not going to go through the technical aspects of uh, ML, but you have all of the formulas here, starting with the likelihood. But instead, we're going to go to slide number 131. 131. Okay. And it's time for some practicalities after all that theory. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's talk. Now we're going to look at an, an example of a simple structure. Uh, CFA, and so as a first step, we want to look at the model command. So M plus has the model command, and that's where you specify the model that you want to estimate. And um, the by, and we're coming to a statement that we mentioned earlier, the by statement, and that's used to define the latent variables or factors. By is short for measured by. So for example, in the model command, we say F1 is measured by Y1, Y2, Y3. Well, now we know that the Y1 is actually regressed on the factor. We know that from the factor model we looked at this morning. So you could say Y1, Y2, Y3 on F1. That's the same thing. But you can't say that because F1 has never been given a name. So we use the by option not only to specify the factor indicators, but to name the factor. So F1 is giving a name to the factor, F1, and it's measured by these three indicators. F2 is measured by Y4, Y5, Y6. Now, there's defaults, as somebody asked about earlier. So in M+, the defaults are that the factor loading of the first variable after by is fixed to 1 to set the metric of the factor, as Banks said. So y1 factor loading is fixed at 1, and the y4 factor loading is fixed at 1. The factor loadings of all the other variables are estimated. So that's y2, y3, y5, and y6. They'll have factor loadings estimated for them. The residual variances of each of the uh, factor indicators are estimated. The residual covariances are fixed at zero, <clears throat> and the variances of the factors are estimated. The covariance between exogenous factors is estimated. So in this model, both factors are exogenous, so their covariance will be estimated as the default. And as I mentioned, any of these can be changed other than something that would not identify the model. Now, there's an alternative way you can set the metric of the factor, and that's by fixing, freeing the factor loadings and fixing factor variances to one. So I show you how to do that here. So to free the first factor loading of Y1, you just put an asterisk as, as, after Y1, and that means free that parameter. And Y4 asterisk means free the factor loading of Y4. So now all six factor loadings will be estimated, and we fix the factor variance, and a variance or a residual variance is referred to, is just uh, specified by referring to the name of the variable. 
So F1 at 1, F2 at 1 says fix the factor variances at 1. At is, means fix, so fix and the number following it means the number to which it should be fixed. You can also use the list function. So F1 dash F2, if you had 10 factors, that might be more helpful. And then at 1. Uh, now, we want to talk for a minute about the EFA and a CFA framework. We're not going to go through the full example, but just to uh, let you know that it exists. So before we had ESIM, which Bank is going to talk about a lot this afternoon, if you wanted to understand more about EFA, like well, what's, which um, factor loadings were significant or some, you, know, you wanted to know that, then you would do EFA and a CFA framework. And you could also obtain modification indices to see if residual covariances are needed to represent minor factors. So then you had to move into EFA and a CFA framework. EFA and a CFA framework is also a useful way to get a good understanding of the EFA model because you have to actually specify it. And that helps you. So what you do to specify it is you use the same number of restrictions as EFA has. So M squared, the number of factors squared. You fix the factor variances to one for M restrictions and you fix the factor loadings to zero for the remaining number of restrictions. You find an anchor item for each item. That's an item that has a large loading for the factor and small loadings for others. And, that's, and then you fix the loading of the anchor item to zero for all of the other factors. So if it's big on factor one, you fix it to zero on factors two, three, and four, if you have four factors, for example. And then um, you allow all the other factor loadings to be free. If you correctly specify these m squared restrictions, you will know it because you'll get the same chi-square as you get in EFA. So that's a good way to understand that. Now we have eSIM, which replaces EFA in a CFA framework. It gives you standard errors for the rotated loadings, and it gives you modification indices for the residual correlations. So, and eSIM also makes EFA possible for multiple time points, so for growth, multiple groups. As a measurement model in SEM, it can be combined with a simple structure CFA, and you can also use target rotation to say where you want zero loadings to be specifically. So, um, do you, should I do the example? Okay, so let's move then to um, slide 147. And we'll just brief go over a quick example of simple structure CFA. Okay, so on the left screen here, we have a path diagram of the example that we're going to look at, <clears throat> we have three factors, spatial, memory, and verbal. And you know, this is taken from our um, EFA example that we looked at earlier, the Halsinger-Swine for data. So, and you can see we have four factor indicators for spatial, four for memory, and five for verbal. And you can see that the exogenous factors are correlated by the curved arrows. The arrows pointing into the boxes are the residuals. And the, um, you can see that the factor indicators are regressed on the factors. And that there are zero loadings for spatial on word, number, et cetera, and for memory on visual. So we have a simple structure CFA. Now, we specify that in M plus by the model command here on the right. Spatial by, and we can use a, a list function, visual dash lozenges, if these are in the proper order in the names or use variable statements. Memory by word R to figure W and verbal by general to word M. So <clears throat> you can see we're asking for standardized solution, modification indices, and the number in parentheses means we want modification indices greater than that value. 
that value being the chi-square value that's significant for one degree of freedom. We're asking for SAMPS data and factor score determinacies. The results, we get our test of model fit, and our p-value is large, so we can't reject the model on the left. CFI, TLI, all the other fit measures look good. We won't spend a lot of time looking at those. We have a note here, a note that model fit is better than EFA in a CFA framework, which normally wouldn't be the case, but that's because the parameters that we fixed to zero were not significant, and thus the gain in degrees of freedom resulted in a higher p-value. We also did a chi-square difference test, as Bank discussed with you, between EFA and a CFA framework and simple structure CFA, and, the, and it was not significant. So it didn't worsen model fit to go from the EFA uh, in a CFA framework to this simple structure CFA. And you see we have our factor determinacies here. They range from zero to one, with one being optimal. And you can see they're all quite high, 0 0.867, 0 0.835, 0 0.954. Model results, we have the three columns we talked about, raw estimate, standard error, and a Z value in the third column used to test for statistical significance, looking for a value plus or larger than plus or minus 1.96. And here in the estimates, these are our factor loadings. You can see the first one's fixed to one as expected, and the other ones are um, estimated. And what they are is regress linear regression coefficients because they're continuous variables and the factor indicators are regressed on the factors. So nothing unusual there. And then on the last screen here, we show the covariance between the covariances among the factors, verbal with spatial, memory with spatial and verbal, and we show the factor variances, which are estimated. On the last slide here, slide 154, we show R square. So in the regression of the factor indicators on the factors, we obtain an R square. And you can see that they vary. Some are larger than, than others. And that's that. <laughs> I think we can take questions. Oh, finally, modification indices. So this is how we show them. We show in the model output for model modification indices, we show the modification oh. index, which Banks said is the drop in chi-square if you add the parameter. So let's say that we added paragraph with general. So that would be over here. Here's general and paragraphs next to it. So if we added a curved arrow here, and we added that residual covariance to the model, chi-square would drop 4.170. And then the other columns are the expected parameter change. And the parameter would cha change to minus 3.108, standardized STD value is the same, and then STDYX standardization. But in most cases, I would say people are most interested in the drop of chi in chi-square. And this is described more fully in the user's guide also. OK. We can, can take questions. Oh, you? Well, it's already 12. Oh, that's all right. So just uh, to add to that. Uh, Slide 154 again here. <clears throat> so these R squares now, uh, this, this uh, talks about how much variation in the items is explained by factors. So uh, visual here, 0.434. It, it is an R square, but it's also the reliability, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we define the reliability. And the reliability is changed over these because we have to remind ourselves, if you look at, uh, as I'm sure all of you have read, the Holtzing and Swyden Ford's 1937 monograph. 39. Each variable uh, consists of a set of items that have been summed up. And some of, the, uh, some of these variables consist of fewer items than others. The more items you sum up, typically the higher reliability you have by the so-called Spearman-Brown rules if you have unidimensionality. So reliability R-square hanging together just 
pointing that out to them. So All now, right, so questions. Who, who has energy for questions? Oh boy, you have a lot of energy. Lady over there. Yeah, on slide 74, when you're talking about some of the business of this, I understand what the Kaiser is doing in terms of aspects, but I wasn't sure what the what you meant by the closeness of fit of the art and the SEA, and I wondered also what the G was in that expression. Okay, so the question is about RMSEA, root mean square error of approximation, and what is G? Well, we'll start with a simple thing. G is the number of groups. <coughs> so Excuse if me. you had multiple group analysis, so, so it's we're one about in the single group case. This afternoon. This is a very intricate theory uh, for this um, it, that's been developed by uh, Kudek and Brown and Steiger and others. And uh, a good book uh, is uh, Bolin and Long. In, if you look at the reference list, you have a, uh, first of all, Bolin's structural equation modeling book. And I think Bolin and Long's testing of structural equation models, uh, an edited book, is also mentioned there somewhere. And essentially, it, it acknowledges that chi-square can be very sensitive to small deviations from the model, true model, just by having a large enough sample size, you're able to reject that. Uh, model that's only slightly off. And this is an effort to allow for a little wiggle room, to allow for a little bit wiggle room, and the wiggle room size is this much, 0.05 in a certain metric, to see are you significantly uh, greater than 0.05. So, 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 so it, it's an attempt to solve this problem. It's quite an intricate way. I, I don't, won't even try to, to uh, represent it well here in, in a minute, but Essentially, uh, it's a way to al allow for uh, wiggle room when you have large sample sizes. Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, I have the same question. So in this case, when we have a large sample size, say I use a list of that, uh, when there's probably 3,000 cases. Only 43,000? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, the, I understand that the guy is very sensitive for the large sample size. So in this case, that you, also that I see the RMSC is a function of aspect. So how do I use the RMSE and not using the chi-square? Well, it, you would report the chi-square. So the question is, this gentleman uses the NISARC data from NIAAA and that's 43,000 uh, general population survey. And uh, what, what do you do? How do you report? Well, you report chi-square and you report RMSEA. And then you refer to the fact that in uh, the uh, SEM literature, 0.05 seems to be an accepted level of uh, misfit. So if you fall below that, you're fine. Now I would say that to this we could add a possibility of what we call a sensitivity analysis. That is, um, if you have your model, HA as we called it, you can come up with a model HB which is a little bit less restrictive. We add a few more parameters that may uh, drop uh, that may improve both chi-square and RMSEA. Uh, but in doing so, you may add parameters that you're not interested in. Now you can see uh, wastebasket parameters, as Michael Brown would call them. Now you can see in your more relaxed HB model, have your key parameters changed values? You know, the, the parameters that represent what you're really interested in, have they changed? If they have not changed, but the model fit has improved, now, there is an empirical way of determining that you have too, too large of a power. But you have to be sure that you're close enough to the right model to be able to enter into that exercise. So um, uh, it's not uh, free of being uh, criticized by some. Yeah, we have a question here in the front. Um, on the slide right before that. Slide right before it, 73. Okay, so um, eigenvalues, can you find the plot, Linda, of um, eigenvalues? Yeah. So eigenvalues is a beautiful matrix algebra term, and eigenvalues uh, is, is a way to characterize a, in this case, a correlation matrix. You characterize a correlation matrix in terms of major components of variation behind the variables. It's hard to be more precise than that. But it is a way to see how many 
it's essentially a, a, an approximate way to see how many factors there are. So if for, for every major side they're on, tell me. Which one? 78. OK. <laughs> I'm having a heck of a time. So uh, you have uh, eigenvalues here on the x-axis, the, uh, the, the biggest uh, eigenvalue uh, down to smaller ones. And as Linda said, uh, in EFA, when you have uh, a fairly flat line here for the uh, uh, higher number eigenvalues, you draw a line like I'm drawing here now. You can see how many drawing that. Whatever sticks up above it, which is that one, tells you how many uh, factors that would be in terms of eigenvalues. Eigenvalues have more to do with principal component analysis, which is often confused with factor analysis. Uh, but it's an approximate estimator for factor analysis models. So it has to do with um, principal components, which are the major components or factors explaining variation in the data. If you want to read about factor analysis, particularly exploratory factor analysis, somewhere around here after this, there is a further readings section. And there is an article by Fabregar. I don't know if you can find Fabregar further readings or if I can. But um, Fabregar and others in psychological methods have written a very good overview article of um, things like how to use eigenvalues, the difference between principal com com component analysis, which is not factor analysis, and factor analysis. Essentially, principal component analysis does not allow for residual variances that are zero. But with that said, let's go to the other end of the room. Yes? The appropriate method of using covariance versus correlation matrices for EFA versus CFA. The whole thing in terms of data comes as a correlation matrix, but we apply covariance based analysis to it. Yeah, so the question is about what's this all about um, analyzing correlation matrices? Uh, when uh, really maximum likelihood estimation, if you look at the likelihood which was in the technical part, it really talks about sample covariance matrices. And, and it just happens to be that some models, such as the EFA model, are independent, are not uh, hurt by getting rid of the scale. That is, going from a sample covariance matrix to correlation matrix you don't know essentially what variances the variables have, right? You're losing the scale. And some models are scale-free. That is, if you analyze the sample covariance matrix and you, if you analyze the sample correlation matrix, you would get the same chi-square value. And you would get the same parameter estimates in the standardized form. So that's one empirical way of checking that your model is scale-free. And it so happens that the EFA model is scale-free. A model that's not scale-free would be a model say, holds loadings equal across variables. <coughs> variables having different scale would be affected by that kind of model. And in that case, analyzing a covariance matrix is the right thing to do. So uh, when you get to eSIM tomorrow afternoon, you will actually see that uh, estimating a, doing EFA can be done on a sample covariance matrix. But it is OK to do it on the correlation matrix. More questions, yes. 85 as well as others, but how, how do you... Slide 85 and others. <laughs> Should I do 89? Yeah. Uh, factor loading, and in particular, how do you interpret the negative statistically significant factor loading? So I think the question is about how do you interpret the negative factor loading which you have on slide 89 for addition in a spatial and how do you interpret it specifically when it's significant? Yes, the other factor loading for additional is also large, positive, and significant. Right. So starting with this then, I don't know if you want to do it, Lena. Well, you probably are more wordy than I am on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I would just say the regression coefficients and one is negative because it has a negative relationship to the factor and the other is positive because it has a positive and it's significant because there's a power to detect that it's different from zero and that's all I would say. 
And uh, now let me do my wordy version. <laughs> and now he can, he can you, give you the, and here's the cushy where the, part. <laughs> here's, and the bickering starts early in this show. Usually it's, uh, <laughs> you know, that really hurts. <laughs> Not. <laughs> so the wordy version is, if you are, have a high speed ability, uh, you do well on addition, right? That's what the positive slope says. But if you have a high spatial ability, you do worse. So if somehow your great spatial ability hurts you when it comes to addition. I don't know. There's something that trips you up. There's something about the construction of that item that says that you should be uh, fairly doffed when it comes to spatial ability, and then you do well. So, wasn't that many more words. <laughs> you pick the next one. Oh, I can't even see out there. Okay, in, red, in the red. Uh, I just have a question on the, with the CFI and TLI. Um, if you, what would you say if your TLI was greater than the threshold 0.95, but your CFI is not? Should they be the same, or do you just report the one that is? Okay, so I think the question is, I think the question is, what happens when fit measures don't agree? And well, that happens a lot of times because for different types of models, maybe, for example, if you have a model, so the CFI and the t tests against very low, cor zero correlations, right? So if you have a model that has very low correlations, then you're not very far from that. Whereas if you have a model with very high, whereas in other fit measures may behave differently. So often you, in most cases, I would say you're going to have fit measures that don't agree, and RMSEA is a good measure. You might not be happy if that one looked bad and something else looked good. I think Banks, one of Banks' uh, dissertation students found that CFI was a pretty reliable measure. It worked well. She did a lot of Monte Carlo simulations. So ultimately, you have to sort of just make a series of decisions and try to understand why that fit measure is behaving, how it's behaving for your data. Look at your own data and see, do you have high correlations, low correlations? What could be causing this? Well, I couldn't possibly add to that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me try. <laughs> so uh, I, I think one, one uh, lesson that, that folks who work with fit indices try to teach is that uh, you want to pick uh, one measure from each family. Like Linda said, CFI is from one family comparing to zero correlation models. TLI is in the same family. And so I would go, if TLI and CFI uh, differ, I would go to pick from another family. RMSEA is a very good other family to, to sample from. So uh, if CFI agrees with RMSEA, I would trust CFI, uh, not the TLI. But uh, other than that, um, fit indices are not uh, foolproof and certainly can disagree. Yes, yes, I have one question on RMSEA. Um, if we can see uh, 139. 139? Yes. Have you already gotten that far? Yes. Oh, oh but. here is the probability that RMSEA is less than that 0.05, the, uh, the wiggle room, as I call it, that Brown and Kudik and Steiger have talked about. And you want that probability to be high. So it, it's really this, this value that you want to take a look at. Uh, you want this not to be rejected, that it's less than 0.05. Here's the point estimate, which happens to be zero in this case. So uh, you want, uh, we want small values like 0.05, but really it, it's a more precise statement is using uh, the, the confidence interval and talking about the probability being less than 0.05. So uh, this, should, this should be greater than 0.05. The, the 0.05 then being the 5% significance value. I guess that's what I was saying. Yeah. 
Do you have a question down here? You? Yeah. yeah uh, hold on. Actually, you probably skipped the uh, whole section of the uh, EFA in the uh, CFA. For example, uh, this is, uh, could you go over a little bit of with me about the example, uh, especially how do you select the anchor, uh, anchor icon and then how do you... Uh, well, they, what you do is you look at the factor loadings and you... Can I just repeat oh, the question? Yeah. So the question is about how to do the EFA in the CFA that we skipped uh, because it's replaced by ESM. Uh, but this gentleman wants to know how would you go about it? Well, but, and basically everything is in the handout about how we go about it. So if you go through the pages, I didn't go over, it's there. But the basic idea is that you um, choose, you look at each factor. Let's say you have two factors. Find a factor loading that's really big on this factor. Fix that to zero on this factor. Find a factor loading that's really big on this factor. Fix it to zero on this factor. That's it. And here, actually, on your screen here on the left, the steps are outlined here in the comments section. Yeah, so you can go over that. And then if you have questions after you've gone over that, we could, you can ask us. Katie in the front. To EFA. Yeah, all, all, all CFA does it doesn't include any kind of a rotation. Right, but we now have EFA factor loadings with standard errors. So starting in version five, we give standard errors for exploratory factor analysis factor loadings. And all of the rotations that we have, starting in version 5, refer to the EFA, exploratory factor analysis. Okay, so then why would you need to do the EFA? You do that because you want to have more control, and you want to do it in the uh, ESOM framework. And you're right, you're doing that tomorrow afternoon, right? So tomorrow afternoon, Bank is going to go over ESEM in detail. But the, um, when you do EFA in the model command in ESEM, you do a rotation. But it's not a CFA model. It's an EFA model. Does that explain that a yeah, little? Yeah, so since it's important to know uh, the distinctions, let me repeat what Linda said. So rotations only have to do with EFA or ESEM. CFA doesn't have any rotations. In terms of rotations, there are the, uh, the ones that allow the factors to correlate, the oblique, and those that don't, the orthogonal. Among the oblique, we used to have pro, pro max, but now we have the better rotation schemes of quartimine and our default geomin. Now, uh, wh why ESIM is important is that it can do what EFA within the CFA framework does, namely give you uh, modification indices for residual correlation, give you standard errors for the loadings, but it does it automatically, so you don't have to go through this anchor item uh, approach that's described here. It's done automatically in ESIM. And ESIM can do so much more. You can do uh, multiple group analysis of two males and females simultaneously. You can have an ESIM EFA measurement structure in an SEM model, which we'll talk about this afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. So um, ESEM provides you with just so much more opportunities. So yes, gentleman in the back. Uh, slide, one slide what? One, one, two. One, one, two. Um, ways to fix the scale of the item. We've got two of them, and you recommended the first one. I've seen recommendations for the other one, so we know why. Yeah. Uh, very often you can do either one of these two to uh, remove the indeterminacy about the scale of the latent variable. Uh, but if you, uh, if you, there's certain analysis where it's more convenient, I think, to fix the factor load into one. And th those are the analysis of, say, multiple group analysis that we're talking about in the afternoon. But where you would want to not fix the variance because you want the variances to allow them to be different in different groups, the factor variances. But even in the multiple group setting, you can actually uh, go with, uh, with, the, uh, with some modification, go with this choice. But this is a safe one that we have as a default. More questions? Yes. 138. 
Oh, that's a popular page. It has an asterisk on it, which means skip it, but I guess it's popular. <laughs> yeah, this, I think the question is, uh, although this is an EFA model, it looks like CFA. And that's the... Well, that's because both of them are fact part of the factor analysis model. So as the bank showed you earlier today, the factor analysis model, it's a whole set of Ys regressed on a set of factors. And you can specify it in using the by statement, because what you're specifying is all the factor loadings except M squared restrictions. So you can specify it in a CFA framework, but it's still an EFA. And the how well you choose your anchor items it, however you choose your anchor items, you're going to get the same chi-square. But how well you choose your anchor items is related to how well you're going to recover the factor loading estimates from the EFA. Because implicit in how you choose those anchor items is the choice of a rotation. We don't rotate in CFA, but the choice of anchor items chooses a rotation. Does that yeah. make sense? So you, yes, you're right. This is a CFA. But a CFA with only M squared restrictions is the same as an EFA. And that's what we want to sort of train you to think of uh, what is an EFA that is not a totally different animal than a, than a CFA. It and is actually a special case of a <coughs> CFA. And that's why we said it's good to look at this. And I would really, we don't have time to go through everything. And th I really recommend going through those slides. Because if you go through those slides, there's enough information there that you can understand. And it helps you understand what an EFA is. It is a special CFA with M squared restrictions. So that's why it's good. So I do recommend you go through the pages that we go through this. And then, if it's not clear to you, ask us tomorrow. And you know, uh, you have these data on our website. So you can actually play around with it and practice and see if you get the same results as we do. It's a good exercise. You pick the next one. Is there, there, is there anybody else? Here. Okay. How about here? <laughs> 89. Okay, so the question is, what's the usefulness of, of standard errors when you see that these loadings are, are high? Well, for instance, when you talk about the bottom line here, straight, uh, in this case, uh, you wonder then, are these meaningful loadings or not? Uh, they are, none, none is that much bigger than the other, but they are both significant, and given that they are significant, we need to pay attention to them. You wouldn't know if these were significant otherwise. And same thing for uh, a loading that sits up here, like 178 here. And a, a very old uh, rule of thumb is that anything less than 0.3 can be ignored. But that's nonsense. It depends on the number of variables, sample size, etc. Here you get a distinct statement. That is a significant loading, even at the sample size of 145. So there must be some verbal skill that increases your, prob increases your score on the flags item. And you should take it seriously and try to figure it out. And actually, there's a very good article on this um, somewhere here at the end. Um, but the, all the references are at the very end of this handout, Bing? OK. Yeah, well, actually here on slide 106, oh. uh, here is a very good article that makes the argument for why you should take an interest in standard errors of unrestricted factor analysis. Very good article that I recommend. And here is the Fabregard article that we referred to earlier. So there's a lot to, of good uses for the standard errors. <coughs> yes, gentleman behind. Page 79. <coughs> so what's the question? 
The question is, uh, statistics says, let's focus on model four, but is, what about model five? Is that not useful at all? Well, we, we have, I mentioned model five very briefly, and the model five results are there. And if you look at the model five results, you'll see that the extra factor, nothing, the four factors are identical to the model four, and the fifth extra factor doesn't have any loading that is bigger than any of the other factors. So it has no highlighted loadings, and it has no interpretability. So you would then go back to the four factor solution based on substantive interpretation. Okay. Based, based on the fit indices, both models are good, so you should look at both. Yeah, but I would right. add that you, you would uh, see at the lowest number, you, factor analysis talks about the lowest number of factors that makes the model fit well. You want a parsimonious model, but yes, you, it's legitimate to consider both. If this had much better interpretability, you could go with that, right. but in this case it doesn't. I think a last question, then we have to go to lunch, yes. This question is prefaced this by, you probably don't want to answer this. So. Well, I, we've never had a question we don't want to answer yet, so. Okay, no convergence, um, what do you do? Probably trying to tr extract so the, too many Let me just repeat. Oh, okay. so, so what leads to no, no convergence here? And I guess I would say you're probably trying to extract too many factors. And we know that four factors is what we expected. So by going up to six, seven, eight factors, you're probably getting no convergence because you're getting a Haywood case that leads you not to have convergence. Well, sometimes I, when I get no convergence, I increase the duration and I increase the convergence. Usually when you get no convergence, if it's a factor analysis model, for example, it could be that the first factor loading shouldn't be fixed to one, it should be another one. So a, if it's a factor analysis model like we're talking about today and you get no convergence, the first thing I've learned to do is free the first factor loading on every factor, fix the factor variances to one, and run it. If you get convergence, you may then find that the first factor loading was going to be negative something, and we were fixing it to positive one, and that was the problem. So then you just look at all the factor loadings, and choose one that's closest to one and fix it to one. So for factor analysis models, that almost is always the no convergence case. In other situations, it can be a Haywood case. You could be, if you look at your partial results, you might see a negative residual variance down there. And other reasons could be the scale of your, fac your variables, like Banked mentioned. You may have variances of like 10,000 or something like that. So like we said, you should rescale your variables by dividing them, but not, not standardizing them, but dividing them by a constant so that the variances come down to between 1 and 10. So those are three convergence things I regularly see in M plus support. And that, I, that pretty much solves all the problems. And, we'll and you can also send it to support, and I'll try to help you solve the problem. And I think we should let Linda have the last word so you get to go to lunch. And we should be back at 1.30. 1.30, please. 1.30 sharp. Welcome back, folks. I hope you had time to um, have a quick lunch. I hope you didn't go outside, so you're wilting now coming in here. This is unusually hot. I don't remember this from past Augusts. I think last August we were here, it was exceptionally cool. And last March it was exceptionally warm, so it was about the same, you know? <laughs> Average is good, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll continue. Um, and as the day goes on and goes into tomorrow, you will uh, realize that many of these uh, topics and issues modeling pieces come back in new shapes and forms. So uh, if you didn't catch it the first time around, then you have a second chance. And if you don't catch it the second time, you probably get a third chance too. <laughs> Otherwise, there are remedial courses. <laughs> and I'm saying that only facetiously, facetiously because uh, you should know that um, 
But there are many courses uh, on uh, latent variable modeling and structural equation modeling in particular taught using M plus across the US now at this point. Several courses. We know of, of a few. You may know of more of them. And uh, one, one, for instance, is at the Ann Arbor summer course. What is it called? I, ICPSR or something like that? Where they use M plus uh, along with other programs. Another is by um, Abbott, Bob Abbott at uh, University of Washington, Seattle, I think. Maybe we should uh, post these, these places. Because some of them are probably um, more introductory and uh, at a slower pace than what we uh, offer here. As I was saying uh, in this morning, that um, this re is really an overview of uh, what you can do in the latent variable modeling framework. It's a roadmap for uh, your further study. And if you're totally new to these topics, I really do encourage you to take other courses. You know, you could, you could spend a, even a, the, a one, one week course at the, at the Ann Arbor summer course on structural equation modeling. You could benefit, you could learn a lot. That uh, probably went by too fast here uh, during today. So uh, this shouldn't be the end station, but just the beginning if you're new to this. So now, there are a couple of models that we want to, of the CFA kind that we want to uh, show you, again, in line with the overview idea without going into details, but just for you to be aware of their existence and also for some of them at least you see how they can be specified in M plus. And the first is this um, bifactor model which often is called hierarchical factor model. Bifactor meaning that there are two factors that influence an item which is just a special case really of the uh, general hierarchical factor model. And the idea is this. So here are the, um, actually the items from the Holzinger and Swineford data, all of them. And this is really the model that Holzinger and Swineford had in mind, I think, for these data. Uh, they actually did an analysis of this kind in an ad hoc fashion, but now we can do it in a more uh, precise, uh, modern fashion. So they had an idea of a general factor, general ability that influences the performance on all of the items. So G is measured by all of the items. And then in addition, you have specific skills like spatial skills uh, to uh, perform well on the spatial items, verbal skills to perform well on these items, verbally oriented items, etc. Where the idea is that G does not uh, explain the correlations between all of the items uh, well enough. There is residual correlation among the items even after we have allowed for G, that is, the, say, the spatial items correlate beyond what can be explained by G, and you, you capture that by a specific factor called spatial here. So uh, these re factors here, spatial, verbal, etc., are factors that are uncorrelated with the G factor. They're sort of residual factors, what the skills that you need beyond the general ability factor to solve those items correctly. So the specification, as you see on slide 159, is that G is uncorrelated with each of these, and that each of these specific factors are uncorrelated among themselves. And the Holzinger and Swineford did this analysis by first pulling out G, and then looking at the residual correlation matrix and pulling out these further factors. They also specified a, a little uh, what they call a doublet factor, which is really a residual covariance there. So that's, uh, and G can then be thought of as um, general ability to solve these kinds of problems or um, the kind of knack for uh, doing these kinds of tasks well. Some may call it general intelligence, but then maybe st stretching it a little bit. So I'm not going to go through the input, but you have it here. A, a related factor analysis model is the um, <coughs> second order factor model. And this is illustrated by a different data set, which is actually uh, the uh, so-called ASVAB data, uh, Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, uh, that tries to measure uh, verbal skills, technical skills like mechanics, but also has speed and quantitative abilities uh, as constructs that they are trying to measure. 
And here, then, the idea is that you have a general factor once again, but the general factor does not influence the items directly, but the general factor influences the, uh, these factors, the four factors, and therefore indirectly influences the observed items. So that's in contrast to the model on the left, the bifactor model where every item is influenced directly by, in this case, two factors. Here, the influence is indirectly. And often, uh, often the model on the right is a, a more restricted version of the model on the left. Because the loading, say, uh, the loading of, of an item onto the G factor is decomposed as the product of this loading times this loading. So the verbal factor is an intermediate uh, mediating indirect effect type of construction. <clears throat> and in this context, these factors are called first order factors because they are related directly to the items. And G is a second order factor. And the rule is that you have to have at least three, at least three first order factors to be able to identify a second order factor. Uh, it's just like having at least three indicators. These, are, these factors are really, really then the indicators of G. And here we have four, so we're doing fine. And G actually then imposes the one factor model behind this four factor, imposes a structure on those four factors on that covariance matrix. Now, um, that's the input. Here's yet another model of interest, a multi-trait, multi-method model. And this picture comes out of uh, a very nice confirmatory factor analysis book by, uh, by Tim Brown. You have it in the reference list. Yeah, we recommend it. It's uh, trying to measure uh, the traits of the factors of paranoid, being paranoid, schizotypal, schizotypal, and schizoid, three different factors. And we measure those factors in three different ways, by an inventory technique, and by a clinical interview method, and by an observer rating method. So for instance, if you look at the paranoid trait, it's measured by paranoid, by the paranoid item of the inventory kind, and by the paranoid item of the clinical interview kind, and by the paranoid item of the observer rating kind. So the idea is that not only do these items measure uh, ref reflect the traits, the, the essential factors down here, but they also have variation in them that's due to the method of observation. And when you have enough uh, methods, uh, you can actually identify all of these parameters. Uh, you have correlations among the methods factors, correlations among the trait factors, and no correlations between the methods and the trait factors, they are zero. And this is very easy. To, you can imagine how to set this up in M+. We don't have the input for it, but it's just paranoid by this one, this one, this one, etc. Inventory by this one, this one, this one, etc. And then correlatedness among these factors, correlated among those factors, whereas you have factor correlations or covariances fixed at zero for the methods with trait. So uh, easy to go from the input to the uh, M+ setup. If you're interested in multi-trait, multi-method uh, approaches, uh, a recent overview article by Michael Eide of Free University of Berlin is in the uh, Journal of Psychological Methods. Michael Eide, E-I-D. <coughs> and again, Michael, uh, Tim Brown's book is useful for uh, basic earlier work. Finally, then, a longitudinal factor analysis model where you have uh, the same set of individuals measured at time one and at time two. Say that these are the same measures, one, two, three, four, five, six, measured at time one and the same six at time two. And you measure two factors, say, at time one and at time two. And you're interested in the stability of the factors across time. So you're interested in the correlation between F1 and F2, I mean, between F2. F1 at the two time points, and between F2 at the two time points, etc. <clears throat> Where you may also have a measurement 
hypothesis of um, the measurement of the factors, <coughs> say the loadings, being equal across time to, to see if you have measurement uh, parameter stability across time. So we call that a longitudinal factor analysis model. And we talk about it a, a little bit more when we get to um, growth models in the uh, topic three and four, growth models with multiple indicators where the growth is for the factor rather than the observed variable. And here again is the book, Confirmatory Factor Analysis you may want to get. And you should definitely get this book, basic SEM book. Here's a classic factor analysis book that's unfortunately out of print. <coughs> But if you can borrow somebody's book, this is a really good one. Uh, Mulek has a CFA book. And uh, Mulek just came out with an SEM book, which probably co covers CFA quite well as well. And when it comes to testing, folks, uh, these controversies and uh, opinions about model tests of fit indices are covered, that those topics are covered quite well in a special issue of personality and individual differences from 1997. Many uh, different camps are writing about it. And this article is a psychometric article discussing the relationship between that higher order by factor model and the hierarchical, uh, no, sorry, higher order factor model and the hierarchical factor model, where the hierarchical was also called by factor. So there you have a quick overview of the different possibilities for different kinds of applications with a guide to further studies. Now, here's an important topic which we're going to spend uh, much of the remainder of today on and which will come back in different shapes and forms uh, throughout the eight topics that we have. Measurement invariance. So on the left screen, 169, it says questions can be asked about the invariance of the measures and the heterogeneity of population. So measurement invariance, first of all, <clears throat> you can ask questions like, does the factor model hold in other populations or at other time points? And we can have different degrees of invariance or non-invariance. We can ask, do we have the same number of factors? Do we have the zero loadings in the same positions? This is, this is sometimes called configural invariance, configural invariance. Do we have equality of the uh, non-zero factor loadings? Do we have equality of the intercepts, those new parameters? And then once we've established a sufficient degree of measurement invariance so that we know that we are talking about the same latent variables in these different populations, we can ask what's at the bottom of 169. Are the factor means, variances, and covariance the same for different populations? So that's the essential idea here. And uh, it's an important concept, this measurement invariance. You want to know that you really are talking about the same type of variable before you start comparing uh, that variable's means, variances, or covariances across populations. The two major approaches to study measurement invariance and population heterogeneity, CFA with covariates and multiple group analysis. And actually, uh, when we start talking about CFA with covariates, you will actually then see your first instance of a structural equation model, which will happen uh, very shortly then. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about pros and cons for these two approaches. And uh, CFA is a parsimonious, CFA with covariates is a parsimonious <laughs> approach. It has a, a small sample advantage. You know, if you have a few parameters, you can get away with having a smaller sample. And it's very advantageous when you have many groups that you want to compare across, like uh, young and old, black and white, males and females, and their cross classifications give rise to a lot of different groups. And when you have many, it can be advantageous to work with CFA with covariates. By the way, this approach is sometimes called mimic analysis. 
mimic multiple indicators, multiple clauses. Multiple group analysis, more parameters uh, can be used to represent the non-invariance, so it's a more flexible, but then again, of course, not as parsimonious. And factor loadings and observed residual variance covariances can be uh, uh, non-invariant in addition to uh, the uh, measurement intercepts. And factor variances and covariances in, in addition to factor means. So we'll see um, detailed examples of that. So let's take a look at this picture and spend some time on that because it's key. <coughs> So now we're going to put together several of the concepts that we talked about this morning, basing it on uh, the uh, building blocks of linear regression. So if you look out here and circle this much, uh, you have a one-factor model, right? With three indicators, y1, 2, 3. And we know that it is uh, just identified it has as many parameters in H0 as in the totally unrestricted H1, zero degrees of freedom. And that factor then now, the new thing is that it's regressed on a set of covariates. So we may say that what we're really interested in probably are these coefficients here, how the factor is related to those X variables. And we just want to use the fact that we have multiple measures of the factor to strengthen uh, that factor concept. And then, of course, we're saying that if there is a factor behind these, if, it, if these measures are unidimensional, then the influence of covariates must go through the factor. So there's an indirect effect that this way uh, only. And here you see an exception to that. There is a, we call this a direct effect. And if you have several direct effects, like if you had one from x1 to y1 and from x3 to y3, then in fact, uh, that, that you would not have unidimensionality here because y1 and y3 would correlate even beyond what can be explained by eta because they're both influenced by x variables that are in turn correlated. So uh, th this is a strong way of testing uh, uh, unidimensionality or that there is uh, one factor in this case. But it also shows then a, a possibility of a direct effect here and the, the, when this direct effect exists, when this slope is significantly different from zero, we're going to say that we have non-invariance. So let's make that absolutely clear t in this beginning part. Say that x3 is gender and say that uh, x3 equals 1 is uh, females and x3 equals 0 is males. Now let's say that we have a direct effect here. What does that mean? Well, it means that the performance of on y3, whatever that is, the performance on y3, the score of y3 is influenced not only by the factor, say the ability to solve that item correctly, but also dependent on the gender. So that, because you see that y3 is regressed on two variables, eta and x3. So we're saying then that even for two people with the same factor value, they still are expected to differ on y3 because y3 has a direct effect from x3. So uh, they differ not only because of how much they know, but because of their gender. So there's a bias, the item bias, measurement bias, measurement, measurement non-invariance. If you don't like this picture, look at it this way. The bottom part, <coughs> y3 is on the y-axis, eta is on the x-axis, and we have the regression lines, just like Linda's Ankova picture this morning. You know, again, we have a the same situation as Linda talked about. That's why she brought up that example. You have one continuous predictor of y3 and one dichotomous predictor of y3. We put the continuous predictor here on the so-called x-axis and the two um, gender lines, the two um, corresponding to the two binary values here, are lines that are only shifted up and down, but they are parallel. Why are they, why are they parallel, first of all? 
because both have the slope of this loading. So if you call that loading lambda 3 here, you get to scribble a little bit, lambda 3 is the common slope for these two lines, right? Y3 increases as a function of eta with the uh, factor, with the multiplier lambda 3. Same for both gender, but the intercept of Y3 shifts as a function of the X3 values, right? As the intercepts shift, the ANCOVA treatment effect, so to speak. So it's a lot of content here. So for instance, again, if you take two people with the same factor value, eta, uh, males are expected to do worse than females. Or maybe even more dramatically put, two individuals with the same Y3 score, you, you would then infer that if it was a female, that they would have this eta value but if they were a male, you would infer that they have this eta value. So the same observed score corresponds to two different latent scores. Clearly a measurement non-invariance problem there, right? So it's a direct effect, the existence of a direct effect that um, shows non-invariance. And it's a measurement non-invariance in the form of different intercepts dummy variable influencing the intercept, or the, therefore the mean, but they have the same slope. So there you see the uh, parsimony or the limitation of CFA with covariates. It allows for different intercept, but it doesn't allow for different slopes, at least not in a uh, straightforward fashion. Uh, moreover, it does not allow for different residual variances for the two gender. It does not allow for different residual variance or disturbances here either. Now, multiple group analysis has the full flexibility. So if you look at this picture, <coughs> you have Y on eta again. And at the top, we have invariance so that the regression lines are the same. Uh, we draw the distribution of the factors here, uh, upside down, where this group has a little bit um, higher mean than that one. And then the non-invariance picture at the bottom again, where uh, we see then that the only difference between the picture on the right and the picture on the left is that we no longer have parallel lines, no longer have parallel lines, which means that the regression of y on eta has different slopes, which means that essentially in the picture top left terms means that, that that loading is different for the two groups, for the two genders. And that lambda difference, loading difference, can be handled in the multiple group setting very easily, but it's not straightforward in the uh, CFA with covariates approach. <coughs> Ultimately, you would want to have, you want to study um, uh, and test for invariance of both the intercepts and the loadings. And we're going to do that uh, this afternoon. And I think I'll hand over to Linda at this point. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to take a deeper look at uh, measurement invariance and population heterogeneity and look at the um, CFA with covariates, which is over on your left screen, the bank just talked about. So we use this CFA with covariates to study the effects of covariates or background variables, so over here, covariates or background variables on the factors and on the outcome variables to understand measurement invariance and population heterogeneity. And as Bank just said, measure, by definition, if you have a significant uh, direct effect, a direct effect being the regression of an outcome on a covariate, then you have measurement non-invariance. That's simply the definition of measurement non-invariance. And um, this is sometimes referred to as differential item functioning, or DIF. Now, population heterogeneity has to do with relationships between the covariates and the factors. 
So that's this part of the model, the covariates and the factors. If they are significant, this indicates that the factor means are different for different levels of the covariates. Now, in this CFA with covariates, you can only look at differences in factor means. You can't look at differences in factor variances and covariances. And you can only look at differences in the measurement parameters of the intercepts, not factor loadings and residual variances. So that's one of the disadvantages of the MIMIC model and one of the advantages of looking at this with multiple group analysis. And, that, and you can think of these as certain assumptions of the MIMIC model, that the fa same factor loadings and residual variances are seen for, let's say that in the MIMIC model, the covariate is gender. So they're the same for males and females. You can't get at differences using the MIMIC model in anything except intercepts of the outcomes. And you, once again, you can't get at factor variance and covariance differences. They're the same for all levels of the covariates. And everything related to model identification, estimation, testing, and modification are the same as we discussed earlier this morning with CFA. So the step in the CFA with covariates or the MIMIC model is first we want to establish a, a CFA model. And then only after we have a well-fitting CFA model do we want to add covariates. And when we do add the covariates to the model, it's important to be sure that the factor structure does not change dramatically. And, you, and we can study modification indices that we talked about this morning for possible direct effects. Because if we added all of the possible direct effects to the model and tried to test that, the model would not be identified. So we use the modification indices to give us an idea of where the important direct effects might be. And then we can add direct effects to the model that are suggested by the modification indices, and once again, making sure the model is still stable. We can interpret the model looking at the factors, the effects of the covariates on the factors, which gets at population heterogeneity, and the direct effects of the covariates on the factor indicators, which gets at measurement non-invariance. So we're interested in, Bank mentioned to you earlier that in the model, there are measurement parameters and structural parameters. Measurement parameters have to do with the items that we're studying. They have intercepts, uh, factor loadings, and residual variances. So these are measurement parameters. They tell us about measurement invariance. Then we have structural parameters. Once we've established that the factors are the same, for example, males and females, then we can compare the structural parameters. If they weren't the same, it wouldn't make any sense to compare the means, variances, and covariances of the factors for males and females, because then the difference would be meaningless, because it would be the difference between apples and oranges. So we have to first, before we do anything, establish measurement invariance of our, of our factors. Now, for this uh, MIMIC example, we're going to be looking at a new data set called the NELS data. It has 16 testlets, and it measures achievement areas of reading, math, science, and other school subjects. Now, we're going to be looking at five testlets that test reading and four math testlets. And so these testlets are considered to be continuous variables, so we're still in the realm of linear regression. And you can see the items are listed here. For reading, we have reading for literature, science, poetry, biography, and history. And for math, we have items that measure algebra, arithmetic, geometry, and probability. On the left screen is a path diagram, so we should be getting pretty familiar with these of our CFA model. We have two factors, reading and math. They're exogenous, so they correlate. And then we have five items for reading, four items for math. The items are regressed on the factors. These are linear regressions. We refer to these coefficients as factor loadings. And then the arrows pointing into the rectangles represent the residuals.
So here's the input that we would use for the first part of this, the first step to establish our model. So we simply translate the path diagram into the M plus language, reading as measured by r lit dash r hist. And you can see in the names paragraph, the order is r lit, r science, r poetry, r biography, and r history. So we can use the list function by just saying the first dash the last. And then math by math algebra dash math probability. So that's very simple to translate. We, this sample has about 4,000, so we, we will, aren't surprised to see that the p-value for the chi-square test is small. We do see, however, that both CFI and TLI indicate good model fit, as do RMSEA with a 0.031 and a probability of 1. And the SRMR value is also good. So this is a situation where, as Banked pointed out earlier, you might report all of these but indicate that all the measures that are not sensitive to a large sample size show good model fit. So this is the first step in the MIMIC analysis of establishing a CFA model. Now here's our model results. And there's really nothing very special about this, just to show that um, we have our fact the metric of our factors set by the first factor loading is being fit, fixed to 1. Here, R lit is fixed to 1. You can see that by the standard errors being 0. And math algebra factor loading is also fixed at 1. We see at the bottom the covariance between the two factors, math with reading. And then in the next part of the output, we see the residual variances for the factor indicators and none of them are negative, that looks good. And we see the variances of the two factors, reading and math. And the R-square values for the items, the nine items. So in the path diagram to the left, we have nine regressions. Each factor indicator is regressed on one of the factors. And these R square uh, describe the variance explained by those factor indicators for the factors. So, and as Banked pointed out earlier, these are reliabilities for these factor indicators. OK, so that's the first step. Now in the second step, let me just put that over here. Whoops, in the second step, we add our covariates to the model. So, and there, so we, here's gender, one covariate, and socioeconomic status. So we've added those. The model was, what I'm circling was the original model, and now we're adding covariates. We're regressing the two factors, math and reading, on both of the covariates. That's indicated by the line with an arrow pointing from gender to reading, gender to math, uh, SES to reading, and SES to math. And we also have a residual covariance that's indicated by this curved arrow. Because now reading and math have become dependent variables. And so instead of a variance, a residual variance will be estimated for them in this model. So when you have an unconditional model, that is a model without covariates, variances are estimated. But when you have a conditional model, a residual, a residual variance is estimated. It's just like the epsilon in the linear regression equation we saw earlier. But now this is a linear regression equation because reading is a continuous factor and math is a continuous factor. These are linear regressions of the factors regressed on covariates. So it's still linear regressions, everything we talk about today. OK, and on this screen, we see the changes in the input by adding the covariates to the model. So you see the used variables list. We've added 
socioeconomic status, SES, and gender. So we've just increased the number of variables in the analysis. And in the model command, we've specified the regression. So we say reading math on SES gender. And in this situation, male is 1 and female is 0. So there, it's very simple to go forward. We're just using the on option, which is short for regressed on, to specify these regressions. We've also asked for modification indices larger than the value 3.84 and for standardized solutions. Continuing on the right screen, we note that model fit is still extremely good, so we, we don't see big changes there. We also see that there aren't changes in the factor loadings. Looks like the factors are stable, even with the addition of covariates. And then on slide 188, which is what's new here, is we see the results of the linear regressions of the factors on the covariates. So these look at changes in the in intercepts of the factors for different SES and different gender. And they are looking at structural parameters. So they're the direct effects between the covariates and the factors that are shown over there. And we, what do we see? If we look at the third column and we're looking for values that are um, higher than 1.96, the absolute value, then we see that SES has a significant positive relationship to the reading factor, saying that as SES increases, then reading does increase, and a negative effect for gender. So that's saying that males do worse on the reading factor than females. In the math on SES and gender, gender is not significant for math. The value of the Z score is 1.457, but SES is positive as it was for reading. So now these are, this is information we're going to want to keep in mind as we go forward and look at our direct effects and seeing testing for measurement invariance. And we have our residual variances, nothing special there, R squared, which we've talked about. <clears throat> and the new thing here is we have R squared for the factors now, so latent variable R squared. And you can see these are very small, which would indicate that even though we have a significant relationships between the covariates and the factors, except for one instance with gender, that there probably are a whole set of important covariates that would explain differences in reading, that would explain reading and math variability better that we might think about adding. Now, in the third situation, we want to look at the modification indices for the direct effects. As I said, if we added all the direct effects, which if you, actually, I think I'll put this over here, so. It might be more visible. OK, if you look at the bottom, what's bolded, that is the regression of all of the outcomes, R lit dash M prob. That refers to all of these variables on SES and gender. Now, if, and we're saying, Fix those all at zero. But if we tried to enter this without fixing them at zero and just had a semicolon where the at is, the model wouldn't be identified. So we can't identify all of those direct effects. So what we do is we fi fix them at zero. We do this in M plus because that matrix isn't opened if we don't mention it in the model command. Just to make is few matrices open during model estimation, we don't open a matrix if it matrix if it's not being used. So this tells M plus open the proper matrix, and, um, but fix everything at 0. And when those parameters are all fixed at 0, then we'll get modification indices for the ones that would be identified if they were freed. And if each were freed one at a time, they would all be identified. 
So that's another thing about modification indices. It tells you what would happen if you fixed, if you freed only that one parameter. So if you take a modification index from one run, you have to rerun with that free to get the proper modification indices for other parameters. So we just say that. And we get our modification indices. So as, I, as we said earlier, the modification index is the drop in chi-square that w you would get if you freed that parameter. And if you look down the modification index column, and I'm not giving you the full output, you would get it for all the, what is it, 9 times 2, 18. You would get 18 direct effects. But here I'm just giving you some selected ones. So for example, if we added our SCI on gender to the model command, the chi-square should drop 31. If we added um, math algebra on gender to the model command, it should drop 26.616. And these are the two largest ones. You can see our poetry on gender has a modification index of 12. And the smallest one is math geometry on SES. But for now, we're going to concentrate on the two largest ones that we have here. And you, we're going to add those. And you can see them here. You can see up here, there's an arrow from gender to RSCI, reading science. And there's also a direct effect from gender to math algebra. And so we're adding these to the model. Those are our direct effects. If they're significant, then that means that these two items, reading science and math algebra, do not behave the same or have differential item functioning for males and females. OK, now we're looking at a summary. Bank talked about difference testing this morning uh, of nested models. Well, so what, what, we're, what I'm presenting here in this slide are the results from three different analyses. And we're going to be doing difference testing and talking about what that means. So the first model is a model with no direct effects. So that's the model we looked at prior to this one that didn't have direct effects. And if we run that, we get a chi-square of 202.935 with 40 degrees of freedom. Then we add a direct effect of reading science on gender. So when we add that to the model with no direct effects, so that's adding one of the direct effects over here, the chi-square is reduced 171.006 with 39 degrees of freedom. So the difference test is looking at one degree of free, at the difference in degrees of freedom, which is 1, 49 minus 40 minus 39, and the difference in the two chi-squares, and if you know, which is 31.929, which I think is very similar to what the modification index said that it would drop. And you can see I have a significance there. So what I'm saying is that that drop, and a low chi-square is a good chi-square, that drop significantly improved the fit of the model. And it also means that reading science on gender is non-invariant. It, it has differential item functioning for males and females. In the third model, we added the second um, direct effect, math algebra on gender, had a reduction of 26.728 chi-square and a difference of one degree of freedom, once again significantly improving the fit of the model and indicating that we also have non-invariance for math algebra. Okay. 
Now, here's how the input looked for doing that. The input matches the path diagram on the right. So I just added reading science on gender, math algebra on gender. And one other thing to mention is it's, pro it's pretty normal to have some problems, to have some items that are not invariant. And if we left these out of the model, that would be a problem. If we actually bring them in and model it, and you don't have too many instances, you know, there's like total non-invariance, total measurement variance, in total invariance, oh, you know what I mean, <laughs> invariance versus not. <laughs> but anyway, there's somewhere in between. So, you know, it can be, everything can be perfect, factor loadings can be the same, intercepts can be the same, everything can be different, intercepts are different, factor loadings are different, but in most cases you're somewhere in the middle. So how much in the middle can you be is a question. I mean, if you're really close to this side, you know, you can, and you can leave these uh, direct effects in the model, then you're probably okay. But if you're really close to that side, you know, you probably shouldn't be comparing those factors. And the biggest people you have to convince of your position are the reviewers of your article. So, you know, you need to make some sort of a plausible case that you have, you're close enough to having measurement invariance to um, make comparisons. So anyway, but that's how you specify the direct effects. And this is what our output looked like when we added those direct effects. And once again, you can see that things look pretty much the same as they did all along. We see stability here in the factor loadings. Um, I think we see one, we see one difference here, and that's uh, that math on gender was not significant before we added the direct effects. And as, as you can see, the math on gender direct effect is negative, so it may be that they, it was sort of canceled out, and by bringing math on gender in, we allow the significance to be seen in that relationship. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go on to interpreting this direct effect. But otherwise, everything looks the same up here, except what I bolded. And then we have our two direct effects down here. Reading science on gender. Uh, females are one, so females tend to do better on this. Math algebra on gender, males are zero. They tend to do better on math algebra. Whoops. Whoops, I didn't like it. OK, so here we have, we have an interpretation of reading science on gender. So, for example, the reading factor has a negative relationship with gender. We see that over here. Reading on gender is negative. So that means males have a lower mean than females on gender. RSCI has a positive loading on the reading factor. And so that would mean we would expect males to have a lower mean on RSCI. However, in the direct effect of gender on RSCI, it's positive. So that for a given reading factor value, males actually do better than expected on reading science. And that the conclusion is reading science is not invariant. So, so we, when somebody for a given value of the factor you know, performs differently, then we have a non-invariant um, item. And as we said, you know, we expected males to have a lower mean on RSCI, but they did better than expected because there was a positive effect. And um, we believe that that's probably why the reading value became significant, the uh, reading on gender and the initial results. Just wanted to point that out to you. Now, here's the same thing for math algebra on gender. 
but you can just read through that on your own. And all the numbers that you need to interpret that are shown on the left screen. Are we doing okay time-wise? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to multiple group analysis. So just in summary, at the beginning, after we came back from lunch, we said we were going to study measurement invariance and population heterogeneity. And Banked went over the fact that there are two ways to do it. You can do it with a mimic model, which we just did. And in the mimic model, you can only look at whether the intercepts vary for the outcomes. You can't look at factor loading variation or residual variance variation. And Banks said that in multiple group analysis, you could look at those other factors also. So now we're going to look at testing measurement invariance using multiple group analysis. And also, we can study more structural parameters. Here, we were only, in the MIMIC model, we were only able to see if the means of the factors differed across the two groups. We weren't able to say anything about factor variances or factor covariances. And in multiple group analysis, you can. So in the advantage of multiple group analysis is that we have these more parameters to represent measurement non-invariance, as I mentioned, and that we have more structural parameters to look at also. It's the disadvantages, it's a less parsimonious model, but I think a, more of a difficulty is that the sample size you would normally need, you're going to need for each group. So, and then if you have many groups in your data, chances are you're not going to have a large enough sample size for each group to do this. So that's one of the um, disadvantages. And we've talked about the, uh, the comparison of factor variances and covariances are meaningful only when factor loadings are invariant. So we have to have factor loading invariance to compare factor variances and covariances. Factor means are meaningful only when factor loadings and the intercepts are invariant. And as I mentioned earlier, partial estimation is possible. And all the issues of identification, testing, everything like that are the same as we talked about earlier. And once again, we always suggest a stepwise analysis, first fitting the model separately in each group. And this would even, this can even go back to starting with an EFA in each group. Because you want to establish, number one, that you have the same number of factors in each group. Let's say you did an EFA in both of your groups, or all of your groups, however many you have, and you found a different number of factors. Well, right away, you would say, I can't make comparisons ag across groups, because at, because at a minimum, you need to have at least the same number of factors. And then you want to fit the model in all groups, allowing all of the parameters to be free in each group. So first you might do an EFA and then separately in each group. And then you do a multiple group analysis where you allow all the parameters to be free across the groups. That would be the next step. And then you would want to fit the model in all groups holding factor loadings equal across all of the groups. And we're going to do this. So this is just an overview. So then we would want to have all the factor loadings equal across groups to test factor loading invariance. And then fit the model in all groups holding factor loadings and intercepts equal to test for the invariance of the intercepts. Now, if you do that, and you've established that you have measurement invariance, then you can go on and add covariates, which you know, could ex explain variability in the factors in addition to the grouping variables. And then you would modify the model and go on. So now, before we actually look at the multiple group example, I want to talk a little bit about how a multiple group modeling specifications work in M plus. 
So there's some general rules. The model, well, first of all, there's the model command, and then for multiple group analysis, there are group-specific model commands. The model command is used to describe the overall analysis for all groups. So the way M plus works is if you give a model command, it reads it, and if you have three groups, as a starting point, it puts that model command for each of the three groups. Then the group-specific model commands are used to specify differences between the overall analysis model and the model for that group. So if you want one of your groups to have something different than the overall model, then you would only make that specification. You, wouldn't, you don't need to specify the full model for each group. You only have to specify it once, and you specify any differences for each group using group-specific model commands. And a couple uh, other rules related to equalities, which we haven't really talked much about, but we will now. If you specify parameter equalities in the model command, they apply across all of the groups. If you uh, specify equalities in group-specific model command, it applies only to that group. And we're going to be seeing this in the inputs. So this is just a summary of the rules for you. And multiple group analysis and all of the rules and things about multiple group analysis are described in chapter um, 13. And let's talk for multiple group analysis defaults. All right, so if you have a multiple group analysis, by default, M plus holds the factor loadings equal across the groups. And it also, and all other free parameters are not held equal across the groups, except when means are included in the model, which actually is now the M plus default. So um, then intercepts, of the observed variables are also held equal across groups. Factor means are fixed to zero in the first group, and they're free in the other groups. So just to repeat that, and what are de the reason we have the defaults is because you shouldn't be doing multiple group analysis and comparing things across the groups if you don't have measurement invariance. So we, our, assumption, or our defaults specify measurement invariance. They say the intercepts are equal across groups. That's a measurement parameter. The factor loadings are equal across group. That's another measurement parameter. We don't hold the third measurement parameter, residual variances across groups, equal as the default. Some people require that. In some disciplines, they require that for um, measurement invariance. But we don't, in, in our own work, you know, it's really a personal preference, I guess, whether you do that. But so, and then. When the, for factor means, they can't be free in all groups, so they have to be fixed in one group and free in the others. We choose to fix them to zero in the first group and be free in the others. That can be changed. So that's multiple group analysis defaults. And let's take a look at factor loading invariance across groups, which I just discussed. That's the default in M+. Plus. You would just have a model command, f1 by y1, y2, y3, f2 by y4, y5, y6. By default, the factor loadings for y2 and y5 are held equal, or rather y2 are held equal across groups, y3 across groups, y5 across groups, and y6 across groups. y1 and y4 are fixed at 1 as the default. Now, if we want to free those equalities, we use the group specific model command and its model followed by a label some type of a label that you've given in your input to uh, specify which group you're talking about the grouping option allows you to give labels and we'll talk about that when we look at a full input so i'm saying that the model for g2 the label g2 is f by y2 y3 and f2 by y5 y6 so note that I don't mention Y1. If you mention Y1, it will free the parameter, so it will no longer be fixed at 1, and you'll get a message saying your model's not identified. So you don't want to mention the first factor loading. 
And so likewise with F2, you don't want to mention F4. So that's how you relax the equality across the two groups. So now this, this is what we're going to be looking at. We have a model for males and a model for females. It's the same model, the same model we've been looking at, reading and math and the same outcomes. And let's take a look at the input. So this is when we run the analysis. The first step we talked about, run the analysis separately for each group. So here's single group analysis. And you can see we're using our used observations. We're saying used observations are gender equal one. And then we'll rerun this analysis, gender equals zero. So one is males and zero females. So we'll run this twice, once for males and once for females. That's the first step. Now here's running it for males and females together, but with no measurement invariance. And so we're doing the groups together. So when you have a data set, when you do this, you can have either two separate data sets or one data set where you have a grouping variable. So that's what we're doing. And we're saying that gender is the grouping variable. And here are the labels, female and male. So we're saying for people who have zero on the gender variable, zero in the data set, we're going to call those female. For people who have one on gender in the data set, they're going to be labeled male. And, the, and here we have our reading by, math by, and Let's go down to model male. We're relaxing all of the factor loadings except the first one. So instead of starting with R lit, we start with R psi. And with math, instead of starting with math algebra, we do math arithmetic. So we're relaxing the factor loadings. And um, we're also relaxing the intercepts, R lit through M prob. And the bracket statements are used in M plus to refer to the means, intercepts, or thresholds of variables. Here we're referring to intercepts. So we're freeing those across groups. Then, because we freed the intercepts, we have to fix the factor means to 0 in all groups. So within the bracket statements, we say reading at 0 and math at 0. So just to recap. This is a model without measurement invariance. So this is not the M plus default model. This is a model with all the parameters free. I talked about the first multiple group model you're going to run is with all parameters free. So we have freed the factor loadings, which were held equal by default. We freed the intercepts, which were held equal by default. And because we freed the intercepts, we have to fix the factor means at 0 for purposes of model identification. So that's the first model. Now let's just take a look at the results of the three inputs that I've shown you so far. So the first I showed you males and females separately. Then I showed you males and females together, but with all of the parameters free. And so you see the chi-square for males, 72.555, females, 86. Actually, if you add these up, you will get the together chi-square. But we ran them separately because we wanted to also get the RMSEA for males and females, which is 0 0.031 together. And that there's not an addition or subtraction that can be used there. So these are our first steps. First, we need to make sure that the factor model even fits for males and females, is that you have the same number of factors and that they fit. Then you put them together with everything free. Then you run this with invariance of factor loadings. So let's see, what's the difference here? 
in model male, I no longer have the by statements. So I remove them. So I'm running this with the factor loadings held equal across groups. So that's the difference. Then I look at the invariance of factor loadings and intercepts. So then what's the difference here? I've removed the group-specific model statement totally. So that means that we have the default M plus model where factor loadings and intercepts are held equal across groups as the default. And once again, we have a summary. So measurement non-invariance, everything unequal across groups. We have a chi-square of 157.829 with 52 degrees of freedom. Now we take the factor loading invariance and look at what the chi-square is. OK, so when we help hold things equal, it's natural that chi-square is going to go up. So when we put those restrictions on the factor loadings, it goes up. But the question is, for the number of degrees of freedom, does it go up significantly? So we've got 52 degrees of freedom in measurement non-invariance, 59 in factor loading invariance, a difference of 7 degrees of freedom, and a difference in chi-square of 11.557. So even though chi-square increased, it did not increase significantly. And that implies that we have factor loading invariance. So establishing those equalities did not worsen model fit. So we have factor loading invariance. Now in the third step, we add intercept invariance. And we look at the chi-square and degrees of freedom difference. And for seven degrees of freedom, we have a chi-square increase of 68.461. And so model fit was significantly worsened. And a comment for those of you who may not be able to do multiple group analysis, in our experience, and I should say mainly in Banks' experience, since I don't do that much data analysis, um, factor loading invariance usually is found. It's more often that the non-invariance is found in the intercepts, which refer to the differential item functioning. So anyway, that's we see here now that we can't say that we have intercept invariance. We have to now go on and try to figure out, using modification indices, what we, we might want to do. Oh, wait, that's not what I want. I guess it is what I want. So this, this next page is just an explanation of the differences in the degrees of freedom here, which basically you have a difference of seven here. And that's because you have seven factor loadings instead of 14. So when you hold them equal, instead of having 14, you have seven. Here you also have seven, but that's because instead of you also add the means to the model. So instead of 18 intercepts when they were free, you have nine intercepts, and then you have two factor means, one for each group for one of the factors. So, that's, so the 18 minus 11 is 7. So that's where the, that difference comes from. So now let's look at the modification indices. And these are for intercepts. So we're looking at the modification indices for the intercepts here. And they're shown in brackets. And we see that we see the same intercepts as we saw in the MIMIC model, reading science and math algebra. And they're both the largest ones. So this is consistent with what we found. And actually, given that we have factor loading invariance, we wouldn't have missed that if we had just did the MIMIC model. And we can go on, and we can add this to the model command. So here I'm showing just the model command. So how do we indicate this non-invariance? We mention the intercepts of reading science and math algebra in the model male, in the group-specific model command for male. So that relaxes the equality across the two groups for those two intercepts. 
And once again, we're modeling the non-invariance. So that's a good thing. Leaving it out is a bad thing. Modeling it is a good thing. So now if we go back to factor loading invariance, over there, and now we have factor loading and partial intercept invariance, then we see that we don't get a detrimental rise in chi-square. It only goes up 9.724 with five degrees of freedom. So we don't worsen model fit. So we seem to be able to establish measurement invariance except for those two intercepts. And that's probably leaving them in the model and modeling them is sufficient to establish measurement invariance because that's not very many parameters compared to the total number of parameters. Now, for the rest of this, we take you through um, looking at residual variances. And we're not going to go over all of these. But this next thing holds residual variances equal across the classes. If that's a measurement parameter, you might want to test that equality. And then we go on and show how you would test the equality of means once you've established measurement invariance. So then you look at the structural parameters. How would you uh, compare means across the groups? How would you compare variances and covariances? And these are just inputs and chi-score difference tests that I think you should be able to, um, to go through. Now I have to look at my little cheat sheet here for a minute. Right, so we just go through there, and then we pick up on after break, and it's time we think we could take questions. I know, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and I think there will be a lot of questions, so we have a little extra question time. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that's a lot of information, and we know that it's a lot of information. So now we have a nice question and answer period, and then when we come back, we'll hit the topic of structural equation modeling. Yes? Um, back at slide, I think it was 176, you had talked about establishing a bulk model first and then looking at covariates. Yes. I'm wondering if not accounting for covariates might lead to a more fitting model in the first place. <coughs> well, I think that you're. I don't think the fit of your factor model should depend on the covariates. The covariates should explain variability in your factors. Okay. You know, they, I, I, you could disagree with me, Bengt. Oh, I wouldn't dare to. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only think of uh, the alternative that, like I talked about earlier, if x1 influences y1, Oh, if right. you only analyze the y's, the one factor model would not fit because y1 and y3 correlate beyond the factor because they're both influenced by correlated x's. So, some, uh, you know, exceptions like that could hurt you. <coughs> but essentially, I would agree with you. Sure. On, on slide 214, where you're looking at the chi square difference, right. what are you using to evaluate that it's significant or not significant? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you need a chi-square table. <laughs> exactly. So in the back of one of your books, you're going to have a chi-square table, and you look up seven degrees of freedom and see if you exceed that or not. And that's what I alluded to before, that we sometimes ask for modification indices greater than 3.84, because that's the chi-square for one degree of freedom. By the way, I have a little comment here. In, in a new addition to the program, um, when oh, yeah. You, you remember that? Model equals. You know, this thing that Linda said, this is very good pedagogical, explicit. But now you can actually open up all matrices by saying mod, mod indices all. Isn't that what you say? I think that you do say mod indices all. Yeah. So, so that's, that's true. I forgot about that. I forgot about it, too. OK. Anyway. But I don't know that I love that new option <laughs> because I think it I think it sometimes opens up more than you want. It can slow down your computations, yeah. yeah. So personally, if I were doing it, I would do it the old way. Traditional. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Way back there? Yeah, on, on, on screen 186. 186? Yes, 186. The chi square here, um, right now it has a p-value of zero. Right. So that's already not significant, right? Because we're looking for lower. Well, we, in this example, I think it's almost, almost 4,500 observations. And it wouldn't be un, uh, known, I mean, chi-square is known to be sensitive to large samples. So in this situation, I would not worry about that so much given that CFI, TLI, RMSCA, and SRMR all indicate good fit. Okay. You're right. Going, but I just, and also, it's not the final model. We add the direct effects on top of that. Well, that's, that's true, too. But although that still didn't put yeah, the p-value at zero. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, on slide 203, can you speak to what is a sufficiently large sample to do the multiple Well, you know, that's a question that it really doesn't have an answer because it, de but I have a suggestion, okay. so it's not hopeless. But because it really, it depends really, the sample size depends on so many things, the model, the reliability of the items, and all sorts of things. But if you really seriously want to know how many observations you need, you can do a Monte Carlo simulation study. And you can use your own data to get population parameter values. You can enter your own sample size, and then see if you have the power to detect what you're looking for. And if you don't, you can then, in the Monte Carlo study, keep increasing the sample size until you see how many people you would need in the event that you can, you know, collect data at another time. It's, uh, yeah, we, we hesitate to give rules of thumb for sample size 200, but uh, it's good to have, <laughs> to, you know, subliminal messages. <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> yes? No, you don't have to have equal, but I think it's not a good idea to have them dramatically different. I mean, like 99, 9,999. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. There has to be a happy place between. Because if you have that unbalanced, then the uh, parameter estimates rely too much on one of the groups. How about back here? Uh, on stage 195. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and you were showing us the uh, two of them, which were the MI indexes were 31.73 and 26 point, and they were similar to the chi-square value. And in that case, wouldn't you even go still further for your, because 12.75 will stand probably at one degree of freedom, they're going to be significant. Right, but it, it may be, okay. First of all, each of these values is only valid for one parameter. Once you've freed that parameter, none of the other val values are valid anymore. You would have to rerun the entire analysis. And given the fact that when we freed these two, we had good fit, or you know everything was OK, I would, my guess would be that this modification index was no longer so large. Because these are, these are done one at a time. It's like, OK, what, what's it going to be when this is free and everyone else is held equal? OK, what's it going to be when this is free and that one's held equal and the rest are held equal? So you can only judge one from this. But also, uh, to add to that, you, know, you, you don't want to just go by significance. Look at this standardized value. It's utterly small. And, uh, Yes, it's almost half the size of this. This is pretty small too, though. So you have to look at the practical importance of that and if that is interpretable. So a reading science was that we imagined that males would sit down and read more science than females. You know, totally biased opinions here. <laughs> but it is item bias. So uh, you I have to, to temper yourself and not go totally wild on these modification uses. You remember, you always have to... Um, to uh, make a plausible story for the reviewers. Right, they're your final word. Go ahead. I have two slides that were this question. The first one is 191, and the second one is 217. 217, okay. So what I noticed in 217 is when you um, add a 
like those two items. Right here. Right. Did you have to do, did you have to get the modification in the piece from this mimic procedure on 191 plus to know which items? Right. That's, we, we had to do modification indices, and we did that here for... Well, this is actually... Well, this, oh, wait. That's the wrong that's one. That's a mimic. Yeah. No, we, we would have had to do modification indices on the, whatever the prior analysis was. Here, to 16, in the multiple group analysis. Right. To get these values. And then once... No, the, these you get just by um, when they're held equal. Because, oh, so we mentioned this earlier, and, we, and that we didn't give a full story. Modification indices are given for any parameter that's fixed at zero or held equal. So when these were held equal across the groups, a modification index is given for them, for what they would be if they were free. Go ahead. model now, um, when you have two groups, does it matter which one you name in that model statement? Sometimes it does. Okay. And, that, and it's important to know it only matters for means of factors. And so it, it matters which group we consider the first group. And there's a discussion of that in chapter 13. But basically, if you're using the grouping option, the variable with the lowest number on the grouping option is considered group 1. And if you need to, if you try to free, you know how it's fixed in group one, if you try to free it in group two, it won't get free. You have to actually use group one. So I tend to, when I'm doing group specific and I only have two, I tend to use group one just because now I know I won't get into trouble. But it does matter for factor means. And we're still not sure why, but <laughs> we've learned to live with it. <laughs> okay, question. Way in the back, not way in the back, but you. <laughs> Thinking on to that question, if you have more than two groups, how, do, how does that work? I mean, do you have the model? Well, that then if you, have, if you had more than two groups, let's say, so model one, you would say this, and then model two, you would say that, and you wouldn't have to say it for model three. So you would have to say it for all but one group, the one group being free just because all the others are. You could ask. Gentleman in the back. Uh, me? Yes, sir. Slides 195 and 193. Should I do 195, I think? Yeah, that'd be good. Um, how are you modeling the error covariances between reading and math? Where is the syntax for that? So the question is, uh, where is the syntax for this residual covariance in the model between the factors? We don't have to give that. That's done by the default. So we could have said uh, reading with math. Or no, yeah. We could have said reading with math here. But we don't have to because that's estimated as the default. Uh, this is probably off topic, but um, it looks like you have observed variables um, going to a latent variable factor. And, um, and when I try to do that with EQS or, or AMOS, I have to go through a lot of gymnastics to, uh, to make that. Is there some default setting in the uh, well, we It's just the way that we set it up. You don't have to do it. You don't have. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You have Are you to talking do, about this? put them in other matrices, put a factor uh, behind them. I have to set the variance to reading uh, to zero. No, we don't. You don't have to do anything like that in M. Plus. So it's just doing it for it, it just, all you have to do is just say what we say here, reading and math on SES and gender. You don't have to do anything else. Well, then is it possible to have the observed variables go to a factor and the factor go to an outcome? You can, but you don't have to in M+. Like, like in the olden days, in like Lizeral and stuff, you sometimes had to put a factor behind an observed variable. I am old, by the way. So okay, <laughs> but you don't have to do that in M+. Plus. If that needs to be done, we do it automatically. And the reason it needs to be done is because there aren't always matrices to suit every combination of variables. For example, 
a beta matrix requires a factor regressed on a factor. And if you regress a factor on an observed variable, it has to turn into a factor before it can go into beta. So we do that automatically. The older programs made you do that. So for example, here, m plus actually puts a factor. Since there is a direct from x to y, m plus actually put a factor behind here. Yeah, behind both of them. Yeah. Because behind the both. two regression matrices in m plus are gamma, which is factor on x, and beta, which is factor on factor. So if something doesn't fall into those two, we just turn it into one of them behind the scenes. Well, that's worth the whole $1,200 right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I felt about use observations and use variables. Yeah. When I used to have to use Banks' LizComp program. And then he would say, I think I want to add another variable. And I'd go, what? I have to create a whole new data set. You know, could you have thought about this like a week ago? So the first thing I thought when we made this program is, I'm having use variables and I'm having use observations. And lots of defaults. So no gymnastic, <laughs> no gymnastics required at all. Right. Right. Thank you. Which reminds me, we, we just had a heart exercise two days ago. We were walking, if you're walking around a little stiff, we have yeah. <laughs> really sore muscles. <laughs> but that's beside the point. So ladies and gentlemen, it hurts. And a little general interest prop. So I have a question about um, a sort of a modeling question. It, in this model, you're presuming that these covariates are affecting these relationships, and so you're trying to account for them in the model. What if, at what point do you make the decision if, from a modeling perspective to include the covariates in the model versus to see whether or not the model itself varies by group? Are those different kinds of questions? Because I sometimes see age and SES, for example, modeled in a, in a uh, uh, modeled in a, uh, a, a case where people are thinking that age may, and SES may drive the relationship between certain variables versus people who may say, I want to see the relationship between stress and depression. And I think that people who have a higher SES will have a different relationship between stress and depression versus those who are in a lower socioeconomic position. So would it be better to just include SES in the model as you have here as a covariate or to see whether or not the overall model varies by SES. Can I have a first stab at that? Sure, I couldn't even hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the I issue is about when do you include covariates in the model in the multiple group analysis, and w w at, what it, at what end do you, do you start your analysis? But so basically, I, I, I think the distinction is between the covariates that are uh, categorical, in this case binary, dichotomous, versus continuous. So uh, you can say that so you would include, um, if you do multiple group analysis, you take care of the uh, dichotomous covariate. And the continuous covariates, however, you would have to include as covariates in the multiple covariates in the multiple group analysis. So you actually have a multiple group mimic analysis. Uh, on the other hand, you could say, well, even if you have H and SES as continuous covariates, you could split them into high and low and do the uh, mimic version with covariates, just because it's an easy way to detect the uh, lack of invariance. True, you only detect one kind of uh, non-invariance, uh, and that is the, in the intercept, but that's typically the one that stands out first. So uh, once you have found that non-invariance, uh, there isn't much further non-invariance in loadings to be detected in my uh, limited experience, at least. So um, <coughs> maybe that'll give you some guideline. More questions? Lady in the back. Um, how, in these examples, I mean, you can kind of see that gender and SES would be sort of logical um, groupings to choose, and age, and all that. Um, but is there any guidance about? what other kinds of groupings one should be looking for? Like, should that be based on theory and some hypotheses about where they're, where that invariance may get introduced? Like, I'm thinking of, like, a disease severity sort of binary thing where maybe a scale measures, measures something differently at a higher level of disease severity. So it, it, I guess it's just all the examples you see about measuring invariance are always gender and age and a lot of those sorts of things. So the question has to do with uh, how, how do you go about uh, looking for uh, non-invariance? What kind of groupings should you consider? 
It could be, for instance, for instance, if you talk about age, it could be that the non-invariance happens <coughs> at a certain age range. It's not like uh, below or above 50, but maybe it's a particular age group like between uh, 60 and uh, 75. Where, so you, and, and if you don't look carefully, uh, you won't find the, uh, the lack of invariance. And it's important. Uh, for instance, if you study depression, uh, uh, there are individuals in this building in, uh, in mental health. Joe Gallo has written papers on depression item bias, where older people are, uh, essentially are uh, less likely to complain, even if they are depressed and, and get their, uh, their um, depression underestimated. So you certainly have to rely on theory and your understanding of the topic to, to formulate good, good groupings or look at the right kinds of covariates for the um, for these analysis, yeah. Yes. Okay. Suppose you have a link from reading to math. Can I use gender and the modern effect? In other words, can I use the uh, uh, covariate and modern the modern effect? It's not common. So the question I think is if you have reading pointing to math and you want the effect of reading to math to be moderated by gender, how do you do that? So moderated or mediated? I think moderated. Who wants to come up to the board? <laughs> <laughs> so you want an interaction between gender and, and... And reading and their influence on math. Well, you can use X with yeah. to create a latent variable interaction between reading and math. And re reading and gender. Gender, I mean. X with is one option, and the other is to do this multiple group. Oh, that's true too. Two, two groups, where uh, the reading on math slope is different for the two genders. <coughs> but a more general approach is X with, which is a uh, you know interaction. You can create products between variables, even if they're latent and even if they're dependent. Yes. So this is sort of a follow-up to that. Cause that's what I was wondering this whole time: is 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 the multiple groups a way of testing interactions? Because we had talked about the indirect effects being a way of looking yeah. at mediation. Yes, exactly. So multiple groups is really a way to look at interaction effects. Exactly. And you know, we have in chapter 13, we have a, I think, it, yeah, we have a section where we talk about different ways of testing interactions and we show multiple group and it shows for different variable types how we would recommend testing for interactions. So you might want to look at that. Okay. We took some well, time to put that table together. It's a good, it's, like I'm glad you're stressing that because that's a good point. And many people who come at this from other disciplines will, will think in terms of those kinds of interactions and moderations. So you could uh, have t done a difference testing of reading on math or whichever way it goes yeah. in the multiple group analysis that we looked at. Hold the uh, coefficient equal in one analysis, unequal in the other, and then test to see if that equality worsens model fit or not. Yeah, many times you have referred to chapter 13. Uh, which book is that? Yeah, chapter <laughs> well, chapter 13. Ch just say, chapter 13, you know, it, it's like le a level 13 in a hotel. No. <laughs> it chapter doesn't exist. <laughs> chapter 13 is a hodgepodge chapter. It's when I've had somebody ask me a question so many times on support that I finally <coughs> write about it. Then I stick it in chapter 13. So that's basically how you get in chapter 13 if you're a popular enough topic to warrant being written about and you're not just language or examples. So. A user's guide. Well, maybe everybody wants to have a break. Oh, do, okay. And anyway, you know we'll be around later. So why don't we take a 15, 20 minute break? Let's get started with the, the essence of SEM. And again, I want to say that uh, we have actually uh, talked about structural equation modeling already <coughs> uh, in terms of the uh, CFA with covariates mimic model. We've already uh, gotten into SEM type of thinking and modeling. So here on slide 229, you have the story laid out in general terms. You want to study relationships among several outcomes and often uh, involving latent variables. 
And like path analysis, we want to estimate and test direct and indirect effect, uh, systems of regression equations, uh, but with latent variables without the influence of measurement error. We want to estimate and test theories about the absence of relationships among latent variables, like left out direct effects, for instance. So uh, in SEM, we want to take careful steps, as we do in all of the modeling efforts. We want to establish a CFA model when latent variables are involved. And at this point, um, we want to modify that statement on, in the first bullet I, and just say we want to establish a, a measurement model or a factor analytic measurement model, but it doesn't have to be CFA. Now we can actually have EFA measurement models in the uh, structural equation modeling context using the uh, ESEM approach that we'll talk about starting, uh, well, pretty much between uh, 3 and 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then we want to establish a model of the relationships among the observed or latent variables. Uh, typically, we uh, formulate the measurement factor and latent measurement model for latent variables and then look at relationships between latent variables. But we may also have uh, observed variables like covariates in the model and then finally modify the model. And we have one example of that, the classic Wheaton et al. model, which uh, if you study uh, user's guides for, uh, for uh, common structural equation modeling programs, you will see as the most prominent example, uh, became a classic some years ago, and it's uh, still the most common example in the literature. That's the Wheaton et al. paper, and um, I'm et al. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have people get together and, um, or not, and um, <laughs> whenever there is uh, more than two authors, uh, everybody but the first author gets to be et al. <coughs> so there's a lesson there for a young scientist, you know, who wants to be have their name prominently shown, don't work with more than uh, one other person. <laughs> so this went on to become a classic, and uh, I became at all, and <laughs> at least I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> but um, so that now I can then uh, turn this situation on its head and uh, be critical about this model as a learning device, of course. So um, we're going to go through a couple of different aspects of it. First of all, what does it say? Well, it has to do with Blair Wheaton is a sociologist, still active up in Canada somewhere. And he talked about anomia and powerlessness feelings in 67 and again for the same people in 71. So this is actually longitudinal data. <coughs> so he tried to measure alienation. And he was interested in the stability of alienation across that time period. <coughs> Excuse me. How strongly alienation in 67 could predict alienation in 71. And he made two contributions, as far as I understand. One was to say that, uh, well, that stability depends on the socioeconomic status. And influencing both uh, alienation at both time points. So instead of looking at a single regression coefficient, <coughs> We're now evaluating that regression as a partial regression coefficient when SES is also allowed to influence alienation in 71. The other innovation was that he was interested in uh, multiple indicators. So we have uh, several indicators, in this case two of the, uh, of the factors at the two time points. So that was kind of new. This was in 1974 and uh, I was a uh, visiting uh, graduate student. I was a graduate student in this program in uh, Uppsala Statistics Department with Joris Kog, but went to the US to um, get ideas for my dissertation. So I was there in the social science building in Madison, Wisconsin, in the green pastures from 1974. Well, actually, that's a Bob Dylan song. But um, <laughs> I got together with Blair and uh, then pointed out, I just learned in a course that you can have multiple indicators and that very often in longitudinal uh, modeling, you have correlated errors like this for the same item across time, uh, that the uh, measurement error tendency to answer in a certain way is correlated for the same item across time. So we brought that into the picture too. 
so it was pretty uh, pretty cool model at at, at its time at the time. Uh, and let's see, how do you set it up? Well, it's very easy now. Given what Linda taught you before, uh, you have the model statements here. You have SCS measured by the educational level and the socioeconomic index of uh, Otis Sterling Duncan, I believe. And then you have alienation in 67 measured by these indicators and alienation in 71 measured by those. So here you have the measurement model up here, the three statements, for one for each of the three factors. Very easy, right? And then you have uh, the uh, regression statements, the on statements. Alienation 71 regressed on its two predictors. Alienation 67 and SES. And alienation 67 regressed on SES. And on top of that, you have correlated residuals where anomia 67 is correlated with anomia 71. Those residuals, those epsilons, as we talked about this morning. And same for powerlessness over time. <coughs> So that looks pretty good, right? Easy to do, good uh, example, and it fits well, uh, very well. Four degrees of freedom, chi-square of four, <coughs> 0.77, high p-value, cannot reject the model, and good RMSEA value as well. Model results, easy to interpret. Here are the measurement equations. First, factor loading fixed at one, as usual. Healthy factor loadings for the other ones, significant as well, and the uh, structural regressions, the on statements, alienation on 67 is, 71 regressed on 67 is 0.607, standardized value is 0.567, quite a big effect, significant. Uh, maybe that's interpreted as a high stability, I don't know what the norms are in that area. And high SES tends to lower your alienation feeling and uh, why did they feel alienated? I think it was uh, a place where a steel, steel, uh, steel mill closed down. Uh, that was the change in atmosphere from uh, 767 to 71. And uh, what do we have? We have these correlated um, errors here across time in the standardized scale. And they are significant, at least for anomia, it is significant across time. So it's a nice little example <coughs> of what you can do. It's easy to do, right? You know all about it. That's how easily you get into structural equation modeling after we tortured you with multiple group modeling, which is the most difficult topic, I think. Uh, here are the R squares uh, for the measures. So it's reliabilities. And then the R squares for the latent variables, which are surprisingly high. Particularly, I'm particularly surprised by this value uh, alienation 67, uh, it's higher for 71, of course, because you predict by the same variable at 67. But this one uh, surprises me. Anyway, it's a neat little example. So now let's tear it apart. <laughs> so what's wrong with this model? Why should you not do this kind of modeling? Well, first of all, we would want to have a way to go about your modeling in steps. You don't want to start with this model. Like Linda said, you don't want to throw in a complex model that draws on your theoretical uh, hypotheses and then expect it to fit well. You're going to get all kinds of problems, misfit, and it's hard to trace back to the root of those sources of misfit. Instead, you want to build up the model from the bottom up in one camp in the structural equation modeling, you want to look at the measurement model versus the structural part. That is, you can look at this model as a CFA model. If you look at it long enough, it will confess to you that it's really a CFA model. What do I mean by that? Well, you have three factors. And you could just as well have let those three factors correlate freely. It's a totally saturated or just identified model on the latent level, three variables, how many correlations are among three variables? Three times two divided by two, that's um, three, right? And that corresponds to the three paths here. So you could t try to test this model by having the, um, uh, a test of the measurement st structure, the measurement structure for a three-factor CFA. 
And that would be perfectly doable, you know. You, you can see if the measurement structure is okay. Uh, then if that's okay, you would go on to see if the structural part fits the data well. In this case, the structural part does not have any content in terms of left out arrows. Uh, it is just identified. So if it would only have a content if, for instance, you say SCS influences alienation 71 only indirectly through alienation 67, that is setting this path to zero, that could be tested in that second step. But at least you could test the measurement model. The problem is you don't know where in the measurement part you will have the misspecification. Is it over here or is it down here? And if it's over here, if, is it at time one or time two? So what you really would want to do is make sure that the measurement model is good for each of the three factors separately, like do an analysis here. But then we have the problem with that we only have two indicators, right? So the model is not identified. You have to have at least three, but three is problematic as well because the model is just identified. You cannot reject it, which is a drawback. Uh, if you go up here, same problem for 67 and same problem for 71. Well, then you can say, well, how about if I look at both of them together? So two factors with four variables, I could do that. Well, yes and no, because what you really want to do is to be able to ha have these residual correlations included, and they're not identified when you only look at this part of the model. And you know, this, this model already is weakly identified by having only two indicators. We say that without the residual correlations, this would be identified, but only thanks to borrowing information for this part from that part and vice versa. So it's a very weak model, and it becomes uh, impossible to do with its residual correlations. Interestingly enough, they are only identified due to the inclusion of this part of the model. So it all hangs together like a um, stack of cards built on sand uh, and mixing many other metaphors too. <laughs> so uh, it's cool, but it's not what you should do. You should have many more indicators here to work with. You should have done a careful EFA building up to a CFA and only then would this really be trustworthy. So number of indicators, we talked about that. I'm looking at the right slide here. Uh, identifiability, we don't have the robustness to miss specification because we only have two indicators. Much in line with that example that, that I went through this morning where you have residual correlations. Now what about believability? <clears throat> it's a non-statistical concept, but um, it's nevertheless important. Well, let's look at the measures. <clears throat> First of all, do we really believe that there is an SES factor that influences the response of education and socioeconomic status? You know, this, is, this factor in the analytic model draws on say the ability testing of Holtzing and Swineford, where you have an ability and your ability influences how well you do on the test. So the direction of the arrow is clear. Now here you would have to think that inside of you, you have a need for a certain socioeconomic status and because of that need, you go out and get an education and you get out, go out and get a job and that will give you these two observed scores. <laughs> now somebody else would argue, no, you have an interest in an education which gives you a job, which builds up an SES status. So the arrows should go in the opposite direction. And that's the uh, direction of the arrows issue. When the arrow, this model, it's called, uh, I call it the factor analytic model. Some call it a reflective indicator model. Reflective indicator model. Uh, others, uh, and if you go in the other direction with the arrows, it's called a formative indicator model, formative indicator model, or in this latest issue of the SEM journal, Ken Boland calls it causal indicators, and he has a very good article on those kinds of indicators when the arrows go into the latent variable. So uh, the believability is um, questionable, at least here. Now, what about other models? Well, you know, you can argue this model is believable because chi-square was good. P-value was big. 
So why not stay with that? Well, you know, even though a model fits well, it may not be the wrong, may not be the right model. Even if the model fits well, it may not be the right model. For instance, this model uh, assumes all kinds of linear relationships, and maybe the correct model is one where you have nonlinear relationships. So in a sense, you are in the wrong ballpark. You find the optimal spot in that ballpark, but the right spot may be in another ballpark. Or it may be that you have a mixture of individuals, uh, some of whom uh, follow this model and some of whom follow a slightly different model. And it's not necessarily the case that those that this model would fit poorly because you are in the wrong ballpark, since you're only looking at means, variances, and covariances. In this case, you're only looking at variances and covariances. You may not have the power to reject that your model is wrong. So you always have to be <coughs> on the lookout for alternative models. Quality of estimates, then, you should look at, finally. Uh, we have talked about the possibility of uh, bias parameters, <coughs> parameter estimates. You also should pay attention to uh, the uh, quality of parameters for different sample sizes and the quality of the standard errors. Standard errors are also estimated quantities. You should really say the estimated standard error for the estimated parameter. Not just say standard error for the estimated parameter, but estimated standard error for the estimated parameter. And you want to know about power. Power to reject that your model is wrong or power to reject that um, a coefficient is zero. And to do that, you may want to do a Monte Carlo study. Even if you are substantively oriented, not methodologically oriented, you may want to do a Monte Carlo study. And we may have time to look at that before we end today. So. Lots of uh, potential critiques that we can raise for this, and you should be aware of it. Quickly about model identification. What is it, and why is it important? Well, here, here you can have, um, I'm not going to go through this in detail because there are more important issues for us, but let me just say a few words. Uh, a non-identified parameter, as you said this morning, gives a non-invertible information matrix. You don't get any standard errors. Uh, and the error message would say that there is an ind indeterminacy involving parameter number this and such. And um, we take an example here. Uh, this is the same, ex actually I'm going to go back one slide and have these two. Uh, here's the uh, identification that you can show for this model. And I'm, I'm going to do it uh, without the correlated residuals here. And to show identification, uh, if you're a substantive researcher, you don't have to do this. If you're a methodological researcher, you have to do it. So here, identification is to really solve the parameter in terms of the elements of the population covariance matrix. So for each of these variables here, you express their variance. Psi is the factor variance, and theta is the residual variance here. And variance of x1, x2, covariance of the x's, covariance of one y and one, the, the y and one x, the y and the other x, and the variance of y. You get one, two, three, four, five, six elements in the population covariance matrix. And now your task is to be able to solve for at least beta, which you're very interested in, in terms of the variances or covariances, because the variance or covariances, you have sample information about them, therefore you will know an estimate of beta. And if you look at this, look at this formula 37 here, lambda 2 times beta times psi of 11, and 35 is lambda 2 times psi 11. Wow, if we take the ratio of 37 divided by 35, beta comes out, right? Look at this. Now you've shown that beta is identified because it can be uh, expressed as the ratio of those two covariances for which you have sample information so you can get a beta hat. And you can go through, if you start there, you can go through and look at these formulas and see that every one of the parameters is identified. It's actually six parameters and they can be solved for. So that gives the feeling for what identification is. 
And you can then think about what the correlated error uh, uh, implies in, that, in those terms. Let's instead talk about formative indicators. Formative indicators, the causal indicator case, and the story that Ken Boland has uh, actually two, two articles on in, in the latest issue. So this is getting talked about more and more for some reason. It used to be popular um, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, and now it's coming back. So here it is. Uh, it's an example from the classic literature uh, where you have, uh, again, uh, sort of a socioeconomic status factor, <coughs> income, occupation, and education influencing your SES. And SES influences how many friends you have. It's a very crass example. So uh, this model then, what's, what's done, classically at least, is to, uh, you need to fix at least one of these slopes to one, uh, say the first one, to see the relative, and where, whereas the other slopes are free, so you see the relative strength of uh, these three uh, predictors. And in the classic way of doing this, you have a residual variance of zero here. You have to assume that they, these three predictors determine the factor uh, perfectly. And then you can estimate the influence of F onto friends. Uh, Ken Boland and Davis uh, go through uh, more uh, elaborate versions of, of doing this, but uh, that is the starting point at least. Model two, you have the same thing. Ex uh, so, so F would be called a formative factor, formative factor, arrows going into it. Model two, you uh, predict not an observed Y, but the latent factor measured by several Ys. Uh, you have this situation. And uh, this is the formative factor with the same uh, scaling, fixing one slope here and residual variance to zero. And then you can estimate this relationship. So these are two formative indicator <laughs> models. Note, however, that um, there's an equivalence here. And we, this gives us a good opportunity to talk about yet another concept, namely that of equivalent models. And it's good to practice your SEM uh, abilities. So uh, I'm claiming that model one and model three are statistically equivalent. Why am I saying that? Yes, uh, and also look at how income in influences friends. Income with slope one th times the slope of friends on F, right? So it's product of beta times one. Well, that you could just estimate that as a beta. And then friends, that beta times this, say gamma two, beta times gamma two becomes this. Beta times gamma two is different than the beta that we had there, so it's yet another coefficient. And same for the last one. <coughs> And there's no residual. The residual comes in here with the residual variance. So this model, which looks quite um, impressive, is just a glorified regression model, to be uh, coy about it. And likewise, if you look at the model to the right, model two, it's equivalent to model four, which is a mimic model for the same reason, where Fy now, now plays the role of that friends played in this model. So you cannot distinguish model two from model four. Uh, I haven't seen this equivalence, model two equals model three, model two equals, model one equals model three, model two equals model four. I haven't seen that equivalence stressed in the literature. I think you should be aware of it as, as you start uh, playing with formative indicator models. But again, I referred to uh, Ken Boland's article there and um, uh, he shows various ways that you want, can test these models. The essence of a formative indicator model, I think, is the following. Namely that the formative indicators have an indirect effect onto the dependent variable, be it observed or latent, in the sense that there are no direct effects. No direct effects, right? It's only indirect. Which implies that you have this multiplicative situation beta times gamma two, beta times gamma three. 
So the, uh, the uh, coefficients are proportional in that sense. All right. There's the hodge Triman social status indicator uh, literature. And this is the example. And you have the setups here. I'm not going to go through it. You have the setups. Except to say that there's one little cute thing here. You can do this, F by. F is a formative factor. <coughs> it doesn't have to have any indicators in the sense, it doesn't have to have any factor analytic or reflective indicators. You can just say F by, and M plus will then know that you have a variable F. You have a latent variable, and uh, it just assumes that you know what you're doing and that this model is actually identified, uh, which model one and model two are. And then you do F on income at one to do that one up there to the left, and the residual variance F at zero here. So those three lines create the formative factor F. So it all becomes very easy at the end of the day, and I'm not going to go through these examples. Instead, um, I want to talk about another nice, unique feature of M+. Plus. And this is uh, uh, the case of interactions among latent variables. As one of the critique of the uh, Wheaton et al. model, I uh, said that we the right model may be a nonlinear model, and a nonlinear model can be, as an example of that, this may be the case. So look at it. You have um, uh, two exogenous factors measured by each by three indicators, two endogenous or dependent variable factors, because they have arrows going into them, measured by three indicators, and actually a hypothesis that F1 and F2 influence F4 only indirectly via F3, right? But on top of that, you're saying that F1 and F2 in interact in their influence on F3. You have the main effects, and you have an interaction effect. And that is handled uh, to create this interaction between latent variables. You use the so-called X with option, X with. So you can look up that option in the uh, user's guide uh, index. And of course, this uh, is maximum likelihood uh, estimation uh, with latent variable interactions that was introduced in Psychometrica, Psychometrica, the uh, Psychometrics Methods journals in, Journal in 2000 by Andreas Klein and his um, advisor, and has been evaluated by Herb Marsh and others in Psychological Methods in 2004. But it is a way to then allow for an interaction as a, pre as a further predictor, in this case, of the dependent variable F3. Well, that was quick, right? We know everything about it now. So here we have Monte Carlo simulations. And um, Linda, you look like you're primed to jump in and do that, or not. All right, I'll continue. <laughs> Linda got into a, a resting mode there. <laughs> the screen went dark. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Monte Carlo simulation studies. Now we can actually take our time and think about this, because I think this is a really useful feature, really useful feature. And it's one that is underutilized, I think. Uh, certainly by substantive researchers, but also by, uh, by uh, uh, methodological researchers. So you know that in the, um, in the user's guide, there are a lot of examples. I think, what, what is it, 225 examples? 125, yeah. Give or take 100. <laughs> Who's counting? And almost all of them have a uh, Monte Carlo simulation counterpart to it which sits on our website and which sits on your uh, M, M plus CD, if and when you get M plus. So you can see how 
the data were generated and analyzed in a Monte Carlo setting uh, corresponding to the, the uh, uh, example that you see in the user's guide. So let's take a look at how you would do that because I don't think we cover simulation studies very well in any of the other days. So here's an example of a Monte Carlo simulation study for a CFA with covariates with continuous factory indicators and patterns of missing data. Wow. So we can actually have missing data aspects added to our analysis. Let's see how we do it and why we do it. So you have first, uh, let me set it up on two screens. Uh, on the left screen is how you generate the data and on the right screen is how you analyze the data. You have, all day long we talked about right screen matters. Now let's talk about left screen matters. So you have uh, a Monte Carlo paragraph, or command rather, <coughs> where you specify which variables you want to work with. We have four y's, two x's, and we want to see um, how well we do our estimation when we have 500 observations. And the idea is that you generate a data set, an artificially generated data set of a certain size. And the idea is that you generate it many, many times, many replications, and do the analysis for each of those replications, and then summarize, average uh, the results over those replications to see how well you do on average. That's the general idea. So now you can fall asleep. So we have 500 replications. <clears throat> we can forget about seed for now. Uh, one of the X's can be made dichotomous by cutting it in this fashion. And we can add missingness, uh, a certain pattern of missingness. There are two patterns here uh, where you have missingness probability of 0.1 for missingness on Y1, 0.2 for Y2, etc. And a second pattern comes after the vertical bar. Uh, with a different probability, more heavy, uh, or a, at least a diff well here it says that you have probability one of having missingness on the first one, so that could be by design that you didn't measure a certain group of individuals at the at the first time, and they have the probabilities of missing is specified for these two patterns specified here. This is all all of this uh, Monte Carlo generation analysis uh, material is covered in chapter, not 13, but 11, <laughs> chapter 11. One of the other very small, short chapters. And then you say, okay, now I'm going to generate data. I'm going to generate it according to a model that I hypothesize. And it, for those of you who are familiar with power studies, you have to come up with tentative parameter values to be able to, to talk about the power with which you can detect a certain effect. So we're going to have a population model uh, that we generate data from, and we're going to say that the means of the two x variables, the means in brackets, this trains our uh, syntax knowledge, they're going to be uh, uh, having mean zero, and the variances are going to be one. And we're going to have a factor that's measured by these uh, uh, four y's, uh, with loadings 1, and the factor variance is going to be 0.5. And we're going to have, actually it's a residual variance because we're going to regress f on x's, and when we regress f on something, it's not the variance but the residual variance that's our parameter. And here are the residual variances, the epsilon variances theta for the factor indicators. Not too complicated, right? Not too complicated. Now we're going to analyze the mo this, these data by the analysis model on the right. And in this case, you note that the analysis model is exactly the same, except for the fact that we don't measure the, we don't mention the x's. Uh, again, in line with regression analysis, the x part is not. Uh, that's not, does, not does not contribute parameters that are estimated in the model. So we drop the X lines, otherwise we just copy and paste the essential model part. And 
The, in this case, as I said, the model uh, that for analysis of the data is the same as the model for generating the data. So we should expect very good results, right? However, you could have a difference between the data generating model and the analysis model to study small, say, small effects of misspecification. So the data generating model could have, say, a residual correlation between two indicators, which you ignore in the analysis model to see how wrong you go. So that's a lazy man's way of doing the algebra that I showed you uh, earlier, uh, doing that numerically and uh, Monte Carlo-wise. Other notable features here is that you have asterisk here. It gives the starting values for these parameters, uh, which happen to be the true values. But uh, they are then values that are used to evaluate the quality of the estimation, uh, an uh, a aspect of the quality called the coverage. And I'll get back to the coverage when we talk about the results. So um, let's take a look at the results. Uh, here you have uh, uh, a summary, uh, chi-squared with 14 degrees of freedom, uh, sorry, free parameters, 14 degrees of freedom, 8. What should you expect? Well, with 8 degrees of freedom, the mean should be 8. And that's the rule of, uh, of um, uh, the uh, chi-square distribution. Standard deviation of chi-square. This is, when I say mean and standard deviation, I, I refer to over the 500 replications, the average over all of those 500 analyses that we do of each of the 500 data sets. Standard deviation should be uh, such that the variance is two times degrees of freedom. Variance of a chi-square two times degrees of freedom, 16. Square root of that is four, so that's pretty close. So that's the start. And then you get this uh, proportion rejects. Um, you focus. You may want to underline what where I'm pointing here. At the five percent reject level of chi-square, you want to see. 5% chi-squares that are bigger than the 5% uh, critical value. And here is 0.052, very close to the true theoretical value, which means that chi-square is very well behaved <coughs> in this case. If you go down to a sample size of, say, 100 instead of 500, there may be a discrepancy there, so the chi-square uh, test of fit doesn't behave as well as it should. Now let's instead focus on the parameter estimates, a little bit more down to earth. So let's look at this. Uh, so you have uh, columns here, the uh, population values that were used for, in this case, the uh, factor loadings for F. Uh, th that's how the data were generated, with factor loadings one. And lo and behold, the average estimate over the 500 replications come out to be very close to one, right? And we get standard errors for these parameter estimates. Uh, for each of the 500 replications, we get a standard error. And the average is 0.0847 for that, 0.0801, et cetera, which can then be compared. So this is, this is how we estimate the standard error, which can be compared to the empirical check, namely the standard deviation the which is the variation in the parameter estimates across the replications, how much they vary across the replications. And those values should be similar, which you see that they are, right? The, uh, the standard deviation, the empirical variation across the replications should be the same as the standard error average, and it's very close for each of the three. We can skip the mean square error column and instead focus on the 95% coverage. So when you, have, when you estimate one parameter, say in the real data analysis, you get a point estimate and you get a standard error, right? And you can actually create the confidence interval then as the point estimate plus minus 1.96 standard error, right? Minus 1.96 standard error down here plus 1.96 standard error up here. And in the middle is the... Uh, parameter estimate. 
and you give that as a confidence interval for where the for where the population value is. So now you're trying to figure out that confidence interval that we get for each replication. How often does that confidence interval cover the correct population value that you used for generating the data? The coverage of that confidence interval. So you count how many times out of 500 that confidence interval covers the correct value. And you, for a 95% length confidence interval, you want to cover it 95% of the time, 95% of the 500 replications. And here are the empirical values pretty close to 95. Uh, that's close enough for, for our government work here. So that is good. Uh, let's save the last uh, column for, for last here. Let's also look at F on X1 and X2. And X2, I believe, was the, um, was the one that we dichotomized, right? And here you have the true values well uh, captured. Standard deviation of the estimates is close to standard error average. Uh, a little bit worse. Well, not too bad. 630659, not too bad at all. Coverage is pretty good. 0.9, can we say 0 0.94? 0 0.95 good. What about this value, 0 0.806? What is that? That is your estimate from the Monte Carlo study of the power to reject that this slope is zero. So I'll say that again. X2 influences F with true value 0.3. What's the power that you, in this sample, by this sample size in this model, can reject that this is zero? You want to reject that it's zero because you believe that there is a, an effect. Well, the power is 0.806. That is, that is the pro probability estimate of rejecting this false hypothesis, rejecting the false hypothesis that the effect is zero. It is computed as the number of times over the 500 replications that the, uh, you, that the, the parameter estimate is significant, significantly different from zero. So in 81% of the replications, that z-score is significant. So that is a very useful uh, Monte Carlo generated power estimate. And there you have an accepted rule of thumb. I don't have to whisper about it. It is actually over 80%. If it's, if it's 0.8 or higher, uh, that's an acceptable power in, by usual statistical considerations. Now, if you had lowered the sample size to, say, 250 instead of 500, that would have fallen down below. Uh, on the other hand, in some cases, maybe you have a larger sample size than you need to have power of 0.8 and can actually reduce the sample size. <clears throat> so all in all, Monte Carlo studies can answer at least four questions. How good are the chi-square test and model fit? How good are the parameter estimates recovered? That has to do with this closeness. How good are the estimated standard errors? Has to do with this closeness. How good is the coverage? And then also power, estimating power for individual uh, parameters like that. And estimating power uh, sometimes can be done analytically. And in, in textbooks, you have these formulas laid out. But that's for very simple models. As you get into these latent variable models, there often are not any uh, explicit power formulas to plug into, but you have this possibility of doing a Monte Carlo study. So in that chapter 11, you'll see several examples uh, ready to be uh, cut and paste into a grant proposal. <laughs> so you don't have to run down to the guy down the corridor who gives you a power estimate on the back of an envelope. Uh, but you actually have, uh, I think it's two growth examples in the user's guide for growth modeling examples for estimating power uh, to reject that certain covariates have an effect on the growth. So there you have it. It's not hard to do. Now, I think this may be our final topic, is it? So here now, we have something uh, very flexible and useful in M+. 
the model constraint command. <coughs> and uh, we referred to that in one of our answers earlier. So I say that you have a model up here. And if you look at it for uh, five seconds, you can tell me what model this is. Yeah, I'm still thinking. <laughs> so we have F1 measured by Y1, Y2, and Y3. It's just spread out on two lines. That doesn't matter, right? We, we, we're governed by where the semicolon comes. So F1 is measured by Y1, Y2, Y3. Uh, what we have in parentheses here is that we give, using the list function, we give labels to these two free parameters. The first parameter is not free because it's fixed at 1, but these two free parameters are given the labels lambda 2 and lambda 3. And then similarly, F2 measured by Y4, 5, and 6 with the labels given there. And then F1 and F2, they are the factor variances, right? So we have two factors, each measured by three indicators. These are the two factor variances, which are free. We give them the labels V of F1, V of F2. And y1 through y6, since they are dependent variables influenced by the factor, they are residual variances. So we call them variance of epsilon 1 to variance of epsilon 6. So those are the thetas that we talked about this morning. That's in the model. So in the model, you give labels to parameters that you want to work with in the following sense. In model constraint, you may be interested in estimating the reliability, uh, say for the second item, Y2, the reliability of Y2 as measuring in measuring F1. You may want to estimate that reliability. That is, get the point estimate, but not only that, get the standard error for that reliability. You know, we got R squares that we saw in the output, but no standard errors for the R squares printed there, although they're printed elsewhere. <clears throat> but you can actually express the reliability and, uh, in, in terms of the parameters. So it's lambda squared times the factor variance. So this is lambda squared times psi that we had early in the morning, divided by lambda squared times psi plus the residual variance theta. So this is the total y variance. And this is the explained part, plot part explained by the factor. That's reliability. It's not, re rel2 is not a parameter in the model, right? So we define it as a new parameter, auxiliary to the model, for which we want a point estimate and a standard error. And we do the same for variable phi. And then we impose, actually in this case, we impose a restriction on the model by saying that we want the reliabilities to be the same. Had we not done that, we would have estimated the model just as if we didn't have model constraints. We would just have gotten these reliability estimates and standard errors. But here we actually say that the reliabilities are the same. That's not the same as saying that the lambdas are the same, or you know, because it involves factor variance and residual variance. So this is a hypothesis that you can impose. And then you can also standardize the factor loadings, as you do in the last two expressions, to get standardized estimates and their standard errors although you also get that automatically in the output. So this shows you two features of the model constraint, defining new parameters to get their point estimates and standard errors, and to also impose constraints on the model, constraints that may involve several of the variables, several of the parameters, rather. And the standard errors, for those Euro techies, the standard errors are computed using the so-called delta method. And here are the kinds of uh, features that you can have in model constraint. You can even have inequality features. And you can have constraints involving absurd variables. That is, a correlation can be uh, said to vary as a function of age. So you can read, have a constraint that says that correlation varies as a function of age. You have an example of that in the, uh, in the M plus users guide in the uh, it's a QTL example, quantitative trait locus example um, from genetics, where the genetic correlation varies as a function of uh, 
uh, number of alleles shared IBD. Boy, that was complex. But anyway, here you have then yet another and final topic, I think. Model test. So this morning we talked about chi-square as uh, one chi-square as being a likelihood ratio test. So chi-square was two times the log likelihood difference between two neighboring models, one nested within the other. And we alluded to the fact that there are other chi-squares. And here is one of those other chi-squares. It's a so-called walled chi-square. Walled chi-square, that guy, walled, got his name in there. And it is a chi-square which is like a z-test, you know, a normal uh, distributed test approximately. If you square a z-test, you have a walled test, a chi-square variable with one degree of freedom. Now, but the wall test can actually concern several parameters, and that's the more typical use. Uh, it's actually very much, the wall testing is very much related to what we're going to talk about tomorrow, for those of you who dare to stay. Uh, when we talk about categorical variables, we talk about uh, weight matrices, and we talk about uh, least squares estimation, and that's very much uh, using the walled uh, idea. Just keep that in mind when we get there. Why do you use model test? Why do you use model test, and how does it differ from model constraints? Well, model constraints can be concern applying constraints on the model, such as reliability is equal for some variables. That's a constraint under which you estimate the model. Model test does not affect the model estimation but it's sort of a post hoc test of certain effects in the model. So restriction is not imposed by the model, unlike model constraints. Uh, so for instance, if you have a model here, testing a quality of loadings, you have a model F, Y, Y1 through Y3, and uh, all of, in this case, all of the three factor loadings are free due to this list function and the asterisk. And instead, we set the metric of the factor by fixing its variance to 1. Model test, then, where wall testing comes in, we're going to say that P2 is equal to P1 and P3 equals P1. We're going to say, therefore, that all three loadings are equal. All three loadings are equal. And that imposes two restrictions, right? These two restrictions. And this is tested by a chi-square test with two degrees of freedom. So you can have all kinds of restrictions. You can say that a whole set of uh, loadings is equal to zero. Say that you have um, uh, uh, F measured by 10 items. And now you want to say uh, three of those or two of those loadings, you want to see if they really are significantly different from zero. Well, that's not the same as testing each one separately by a z-test. Uh, the test of them both being zero jointly should be done by a joint test. Those parameter estimates are correlated, so you have to do by a joint test, and that's where model test comes in. So essentially, model test is used to see, can you simplify the model further? Are there some... Uh, uh, some uh, insignificant differences like in this case, insignificant differences in the loading. And so it doesn't affect the model parameter estimates as model constraint does, but it does a testing after the fact. So in a sense, you can think about model test and wall testing as the antithesis of modification indices. You know, modification indices asks, should you add parameters to the model? Do you need to add parameters to the model? And model test, the wall testing says, can you take away some parameters from the model? So they complement each other nicely. And that slide we skip. So let me just finally then, before questions and answers, take you through some of the literature here. Uh, again, Bolin, uh, Bible here, structural equations for latent variables, still uh, 
the most comprehensive book in that area, unless Mulike has improved on it in his 2009 book that I haven't read. Technical aspects, for those who are techies, are given by Brown, Michael Brown and Garrett Arminger, who contributed a lot of good statistics to this area in a handbook. Uh, Euroskog uh, and Serbom, pioneers in the SEM area, have some of their articles put together in uh, uh, a book. Here is Linda and I uh, going together to write a paper on how to use a Monte Carlo study to decide that sample size and determine power. It appeared in Structural Equation Model in 2002 and it sits on our website. All of the uh, M plus uh, using papers that we get our hands on sits on our website under papers. For those of you techies or statisticians, you can also read the excellent book by Anders Skrondal and Sophia Rabe Hesketch, uh, Chapman Hall book, excellent um, technical Bible. Uh, regression analysis, I don't think we talked through this, but you have several uh, books here. Some of you may have your favorites. Some like Pedersen's book, some like Moore McCabe, some like Lewis Beck. I was brought up on uh, Johnston. And if you go, want to go really advanced, you go to uh, Takeshi Yamamiya. Uh, path analysis, this has to do with the indirect effects. Uh, you have uh, in the EFA area, you have an excellent technical book by David Bartholomew. I really recommend Michael Brown's paper in MBR, Multivariate Behavior Research, where he talks about EFA, EFA rotations. EFA rotations, very uh, knowledgeable writing, where he comes out on the side of the voting for the Geomin rotation. We were greatly inspired by Michael Brown's work in this area. He has his own uh, freeware on uh, EFA called the CEFA program, C-E-F-A. Uh, Cudic and Odell, we talked about that. Why would you want to use standard errors in EFA? Good arguments in the precursor to psychological methods called psychological bulletin. Here is Fabregas' overview of EFA uh, approaches. You should read that, quite readable. Uh, Richard Gorsuch factor analysis book is one possible factor analysis book. Here's a classic one, uh, outdated in many ways, but had many fine pieces of wisdom in it. And here's Holzinger and Swine for his 1931 monograph. Introduction to Factor Analysis in the Green Series. Yuri Skog's technical background paper or chapter. And uh, by the way, one psychometric uh, contribution I didn't talk about the so-called schmidt lehman analysis, development of hierarchical factor solutions. This has to do with uh, second order factor analysis uh, in a C uh, sorry in an EFA setting. There are some interesting um, results there, uh, classic results that are still relevant today for um, developing a hierarchical factor model, a uh, you know second and third order factor model from EFA. It all started with Spearman. He had a paper in 1904, I think, in factor analysis. And um, that's a great factor score paper if you're technically inclined. Let's see, what else do we have? CFA, uh, your school's classic article, if you're a techie. Uh, if you're not a techie, you wanna read um, uh, Tim Brown's EFA, uh, CFA book. Where is he? Maybe he's under. Uh, uh, SEM. Uh, let's see what else we have um, that I haven't mentioned. Here's Mulek's new book. Mimic, uh, Robert Hauser in the Social Science Building in Madison, Wisconsin, and Art Goldberg in the same building. Uh, good paper on Mimic. Here's your school's first multiple, uh, multiple group analysis paper. And the Yorisko and Goldberger on Mimic in, in the JASA statistical flagship. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we have um, <coughs> oh, nothing that I haven't talked about already. 
And uh, here's a good paper, Applications of Structural Equation Modeling in Psychological Research by Bob McCallum, a very good um, psychometrician. Let's see what else we have um, that I haven't mentioned. Statistical theories of mental test scores, if you want to go back to the beginning of time, uh, particularly relevant for uh, true score theories, test theory, and uh, IRT that we'll talk about tomorrow. And then finally, join SEMnet, folks. Get onto SEMnet and uh, improve the quality of questions and answers. Uh, it's a discussion list that sometimes is very active and uh, there's some good advice that you can get on all kinds of uh, problems that you might have. We uh, will answer some questions on M plus discussion that are specifically related to M plus, but you may have more general uh, modeling question that you want to ask uh, a broad audience of people. Uh, here are some websites that <coughs> recommend SEM books. I don't know the quality of it, but um, it is actually, um, uh, qu you, you can actually ask those questions about what's the best introductory SEM book on SEMnet and probably get some updated good answers uh, in that area. So with that, I think we're ready for questions and answers unless uh, Nick has something he wants to interject. Just real quick, um, for those of you coming back tomorrow, make sure you bring your notebook because you have both uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, that's your notes. And you need to bring your um, ID. You have to bring that. Don't forget. That was it? OK. <laughs> All right, so let's see who has energy at 25 minutes to 5 to ask a penetrating question. Yes, lady in black. I keep wanting to say lady with a dog, but let's a check on all. Tomorrow. Yes? What are the times tomorrow? Times tomorrow, we start at the same time, 8.30. 8.30 sharp in the same times, but uh, definitely only a one hour lunch. And we probably end around uh, 4. 4. 15, 4. <laughs> I'm on, I'll be leaving at 4. He'll be leaving at 4.30. <laughs> we'll see who gets we home. <laughs> we have a tight flight schedule, but uh, we'll stay as long as we can. Okay. Lady in white. For the power analysis with the Monte Carlo simulations, what, what can one do if you're in a situation, and I'm thinking of like a longitudinal analysis, but any, really any of the Monte Carlo, if you actually don't have very much data in the sample, I mean, is there any, is there, is there any way to do power estimation except these ones that are really almost more post hoc? Your observed power is what you're really testing, I think, if I understand it correctly. Uh, so the question is about power analysis, and um, typically, uh, Good power estimation comes from having some pilot studies where uh, you get a notion of what, what the parameter values are. If, if you're going to do a Monte Carlo study, you need to have some reasonable, plausible parameter values, which you can modify up and down and see how that affects the power estimate. But you get uh, the notion of those values from previous power, pu sorry, pilot studies. Now, you can also use the power approach for uh, Say that you have a real data analysis and you have a thousand observations. You can take the estimates, although this is a little bit controversial, but you can take the estimates from that real data analysis, plug it into a Monte Carlo study, and estimate the power for a particular parameter and ask yourself or answer the question, how much smaller of a sample could I have gotten away with and still had power of 0.8? So if you want to replicate that study in a future sample, you can perhaps get away with a smaller sample. Other questions? Yes. Um, uh, slide 244. <coughs> slide 244. In multiple, so I think it is uh, actually a named variable. So I think uh, the arrow, I, I'm just was wondering that uh, the arrows from income occupation and education to F. So I'm wondering if um, the other way, uh, if uh, F is a major factor. 
the when you say the other way, do you mean uh, if if the arrows go the other way? Yeah, which I I'm assuming that is like um, F Y. F Y is another latent variable, right? Right. Right. This F is one latent variable too, right? Yes. Yeah. Both of these are latent variables, so they are right. in circles. Yeah. Which I guess the arrow from uh, here from <coughs> occupation and education. Maybe the other way? So one is formative and one is reflective. Oh, I think I that's the question. Oh. Yeah, so one is the formative indica indicators and one is reflective. Yeah, these are yeah, these are the standard reflective factor analytic indicators and like this is the formative. Like we looked at in CFA. Yeah, right. So it, it just shows that you can combine the two. Uh, by the way, a comment oh. on this is uh, this is sort of a, a way of, if you want to talk about SCS, uh, F being SCS, you can, one simple way is just to sum up these items. You know, the sum of them is SES and SES score. This is sort of a more uh, elegant way of doing it because you get the relative weights estimated in that sum by estimating these two. Yes, lady behind you. Okay, slide 262. 262? What was the last sentence? How about P2 equals to P3? You don't, don't need to list here. How about P3 equals P2? Uh -huh. Well, they're both equal to P1, so that, you know, you only need to impose those two. Yeah, they are both equal, but maybe they are not equal. Because there are some, you know, 5% error or something like that. Now this, this actually holds P2 and P3 equal to P1, so there's only one parameter operating here. This says that there's only one parameter instead of three parameters. Oh. So there are two restrictions imposed. So my second question is, uh, uh, actually, after I write the model, after I write the model test, you didn't show us the uh, um, pass diagram again, right? So I cannot make sure maybe my model specific, specifically is not correct. Well, you, 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 I'm not sure I understand, but you, you get the chi-squared test of model fit for this. Uh, really this added to it. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. You get a separate test. <laughs> yeah, you get, sorry, model test. I was on model uh, constraint there. You get a model test of fit for, for the model, and then you get a chi square, a walled chi square test to see if those further restrictions here are uh, applicable. I mean, you have a pair diagram first. Then you write a model, write your test. Right. right. But maybe if I have make any mistake on any place, I don't know. My model exactly reflects the relationship in the diagram. How can I do? So the model diagram corresponds to only the first three lines, yes. not the last three lines. Oh, only the model part. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. So uh, if you had model constraints, if you said model constraint here instead, then the path diagram should somehow reflect that those loadings are equal. I mean, I don't worry about my model part. I write it's not correct. That correctly reflect my past diagram. So model test doesn't affect model estimation. It's done after model estimation. So anything you say in model test does not reflect the estimation of the model in the model command. But with model constraint, what you say in model constraint is part of model estimation. So I don't know if that helps. Right. And plus does not show your path diagram. Yeah, you have to draw it. I have to draw first. But after I draw the path diagram, then I go to write down my model. Yeah. But right. if I wrote, wrote down my model, make any mistake, I don't know how to correct it. Uh. <laughs> If you make a mistake. No, no, you, 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 get a, you, get, you know if you write down the model correctly by looking at which parameter estimates are, are, are coming up in the output. Right. You, it, when you write a model, you look at the results and you see, is this, are these the parameters I expected? You can also look at tech one, which shows you all the free parameters in your model. And then you can, in fact, you should always look at your results to make sure that you specified your model correctly. You and understand where that's all the how you would know. From. Okay, more questions. Yes, Bruce Cooper. On the same slide, uh, could you uh, compensate the same way by doing uh, 
two different models uh, with uh, constraints and one test using a difference, high score difference test, the difference in the two models, is that the same thing? So, yeah, you would basically, if you did a chi-square difference test where in the model command you imposed those equalities, so then what you would do is instead of having P1 through P3, you would just have P1, because P1 then is an equality label saying that all of the factor loadings are held equal, then you could run that model and a model without P1 and then do a chi-square difference test. And that will be a likelihood ratio chi-square, whereas this is the walled chi-square, but in large samples, they should be they approximately should be the, same. the same. I remember reading that the walled chi-square sometimes is as uh, uh, accurate as the uh, likelihood ratio chi-square kind of Yeah, and in, well, in some other setting, it's the other way around. Exactly. So. For example, with uh, MLM, that yeah. can have problems with the difference testing. Yeah. So, do both of them. Yes. <laughs> I hope this question doesn't make you uncomfortable, but I know that this is fast becoming the market leader uh, in, in structural modeling software. So I'm wondering, how does your colleague Peter Bentler feel about the erosion of his market share to you? Because I know you were probably right down the hall from him, right? No, Bank is not at UCLA, so he couldn't be down the hall from him. But I think you saw Peter in uh, Cambridge. He he didn't throw any knives at you, did he? <laughs> no, we had a friendly conversation. I think we're and, all friends. Uh, you know, um, he, there's so many things to be interested in. You don't have to be a market leader all the time. So. Yeah, I, I, could, I, could, I couldn't answer that question, but um, we have a good time talking to each other. Actually, he, he well, I shouldn't say that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be discreet. OK, in the back. <laughs> yes, uh, slide 252. Which one thing? 252. How do you model interaction in M plus? Is that in chapter 13? Or? How do you model the interaction? <laughs> what did you say last? How do you model interactions um, in, M plus? in M plus? You use the X with option. So, for example, you would say in the, um, you, would, you would give a name, it's like let's say INT for interaction, you would give a bar, and then you would say F1 X with F2 semicolon. Yeah, in oh, a yeah. model command. It, it's written in the user's oh, guide. Oh, yeah, it's in the user's and guide. Look up X 13. with <laughs> in the index. <laughs> and, you You'll know, find it. So uh, the M plus then uh, numerically uh, behind the scenes in maximum likelihood estimation using the EM algorithm, algorithm creates the product score, which sits approximately there, and it's used as a predictor along with these two main effects. And, um, and the technicality of that is largely described by Andreas Klein in that article. Yeah, but it's in the user's guide, yes. Explain that. More questions. You can do it, folks. It's not five yet. Oh, they look pretty energetic, don't they, Linda? Well, they look pretty good. We didn't, I guess we didn't beat them down enough. <laughs> <laughs> Try to prepare you for tomorrow. <laughs> no, we'll be more energetic tomorrow. And, yeah, we haven't gotten over some jet lag. So, folks, for those of you who don't come back tomorrow, it was great Thank meeting you. you. Come back other times, and uh, we'll try to entertain you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.